Dear ladies and gentlemen, my name is Renate Brauner. I am a member of the Vienna city government responsible for uh, financial, economic uh, and international um, issues and I am very happy to welcome you here in our city hall in my personal name but also in the name of our mayor, Dr. Michael Heupel. It's good to have you here. Uh, we are a very old and traditional town hall but we always fill it with new ideas and uh, I think today is a very important meeting and the ideas you are going to discuss are very important for our future. Those who arrived already yesterday may have got a very special view on Vienna and the Austrians. Just right here in front of the city hall at the public viewing on the Rathausplatz, you may have followed the Euro game, Austria, Iceland. The tension was very high. We struggled yesterday for our furthest day in this very European competition. Today, we are relaxed, unhappy, but relaxed. We lost, the tension is over, but so we can fully concentrate on the work. I'm still drying my tears. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy that this conference takes place in Vienna and that we prepared this event in strong cooperation with our partners from Southeast Europe. Vienna is the coordinator of the government's priority of the EU Danube strategy. Together with Slovenia, we foster the institution and capacity building of the public sector in the Danube region. We are proud that Vienna is in the core or the heart of the Danube region and therefore we see it as our responsibility to set activities to tie up this region. I'm fully aware saying this in time of intensive discussions of new borders. Here in our region in front of the migration challenge and today the British people are deciding about their future in the European Union. The decision will of course directly affect us all. As executive city councillor, as I mentioned of finance, economic and international affairs of the city of Vienna, I'm very proud and pleased at the same time to have this event organized together with the Regional Cooperation Council, which contributes with the strategy Southeast Europe 2020 intensively and successful to the European integration process of our neighboring countries. The further partners are the Regional School of Public Administration, which is a key driver for public administration reform here and in Southeast Europe. And the network of association of local authorities in Southeast Europe, which is an important partner of the Austrian Association of Cities and Towns. Of course, I want to thank the Austrian Ministry of Europe, Integration and Foreign Affairs and the Austrian Development Corporation for the fruitful, common preparation of this event. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that a strong public sector in a united Europe is the base of high quality public services, legal certainty, stability, welfare and economic prosperity. Well functioning and transparent public services is the basis for economic growth and the improvement of the quality of life for everybody. This is why the focus on public governance as the foundation of European integration is essential for the Danube region and Western Balkan and of all of us. For Vienna, the municipal supply of public services is of highest importance. It is perfectly working, we are proud of this, and we strongly require that these services stay in public responsibility. Last year, you may heard about this, the Vienna declaration by the mayors of the EU capital cities stated the cities should have the freedom to decide individually on how to deliver public rules or sets framework conditions, but the cities must be free to decide how these goals will be attended with own departments, own public companies, public-private partnerships or other forms. We stand for a strong public sector with services provided by the public hand, but we know that we have to ensure the preconditions. This is to offer the best services, high quality and low prices. And the way to do that is to have a good public administration based on the principle of governance. 
This is one of the main reasons why Vienna retains the top as the city with the world's best quality of living according to the Mercer survey since 2012. Ladies and gentlemen, we want to use this conference to launch the Danube Governments Hub. It is an initiative of the priority coordinator of the EU Danube strategy of the city of Vienna and the KDZ, Center for Public Administration Research. The vision of the Danube Governments Hub is to create the basis for a strong public sector based on European standards. Although good governance and public administration reform are on the political agenda, it remains a very complex and long-term process that is far away from being completed. The establishment of a Danube Governance Hub will draw on best practices to assist the public administrations to strengthen their capacity in line with EU standards. Ladies and gentlemen, when talking about modern, modern public administration, I have to draw your attention to the Twitter hole here in the conference. I personally used Twitter yesterday for soccer, hmm? and I'm glad to see this is more frequently in our events. I will follow the conference also not being present all the time. So please use the hashtag BESIT16 to interact during and after the conference. The conference is also live streamed at the conference website and the video documentation will be pro provided on this site after the event. I wish you all a fruitful conference. I want to thank the Austrian Association of Cities and Towns and the KDZ Center for Public Administration Research for the excellent preparation. And now I give the floor to our co-organizer, General Secretary Michael Lindhardt from the Austrian Ministry for Europe, Integration and Foreign Affairs and Secretary General Goran Slivanovic from the Regional Cooperation Council. Thank you for your attention. Welcome in Vienna. Dear City Councillor Renate Brauner, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as Secretary General of the Foreign Ministry, I'm uh, glad to welcome you here in Vienna to the Conference on Public Governance dealing with public administration reform challenges in the Western Balkan countries and the Danube region. Of course, for us as well, it's a somehow a different day or sad day after, after yesterday. We wish all the best to our Hungarian and uh, friends uh, and friends from Iceland uh, in the foreign ministry and I'm still the captain of the foreign ministry team. We try to see it positively. We, see, we, we think that at least the euro is bringing people together, uh, football brings people together, is connecting people and uh, Gordon Svilanovic uh, knows exactly what I'm talking about because we were playing together last year at the Balkan Conference. We were the initiators uh, of the football game at the Balkan Conference. And I think also the most important dimension there was that we connected, that we got uh, people together from an area where they maybe uh, sometimes have uh, uh, not so easy talks and dialogues. So now, almost uh, one year after the Vienna Western Balkan Summit, uh, uh, this conference has now the possibility and gives us the opportunity to assess the progress that has been made since and to discuss the way forward. It goes without saying that the Western Balkans are and remain a key foreign policy priority for Austria. I'm therefore also very glad to see that the dynamic of the, reforms pro of the reform process in the region has improved in the past years uh, clearly. An important initiative in that respect is particularly the Berlin process that has contributed considerably to this new dynamic with, I think, two main aims. First, to foster regional cooperation in key areas such as uh, connectivity, the, econo the economy or youth exchange. And second, to support the countries of the Western Balkans in their reform process and on their path towards the EU. The yearly summits of the Berlin process not only put the Western Balkans on the agenda, but also offer a valuable stage for the Western Balkan six to show their progress. This has led to a new and positive atmosphere and to tangible results. Examples of these results 
of these results are the signing of two border agreements in the margins of the Vienna summit in August 2016, uh, as well as the agreement on establishing the Regional Use Cooperation Office. Well, needless to say also, the countries of the Berlin process remain engaged in the months between the summits. I think good preparation of the summit in Vienna was somehow uh, crucial for uh, the success of this summit. Austria, for example, has organized a series of high-profile conferences in the past months. Among others, these include a conference on the solution of bilateral disputes in April, a conference on dual ed education in May, and today's conference on public administration reform. Our aim is to move the issues forward in each key area and to find solutions which our French partners then can further build on on their summit in Paris on the 4th of July. Let me now focus on today's topic, governance. Good governance matters. It has a significant impact on the performance of public institutions and is therefore essential for building trust in governments. It also allows these governments to function more effectively, helping them implement their agenda and deliver much needed structural reforms. A well-functioning public administration requires a professional civil service and efficient procedures for policymaking and the drafting of good legislation. It is also important to make sure that public institutions remain accountable to the citizens they are meant to serve. The approach from fundamentals first launched by the European Commission in 2014 provides us with a very useful framework for approaching the issue of establishing good government. It covers all key reform areas, offering practical suggestions on how to build capacity and strengthen procedures, and it provides a unique benchmark for reformers when designing and implementing their own public administration reforms. This framework has become instrumental in the policy dialogue between the EU enlargement countries and the European Commission. It can also say without hesitation, I can also say without hesitation that public administration reform has become increasingly important within the European Union itself. For enlargement countries, however, I think it is particularly vital because of its direct relevance for meeting the accession criteria. It is also essential to allowing these countries to cope with the increased res responsibilities linked to accession and greatly contributes to improving the business in environment and investment climate. I am particularly honored to see such strong support from ministers and the top administrative, uh, administrative level. I hope that this event again will encourage you to further make good public governance an essential part of your national policy agenda in your respective countries. We of course all know that the process of translating good ideas into policies, laws and regulations is long and often very complex. This is especially true in a period of prolonged economic and financial difficulties. It is, I think, nevertheless vital to start this process as early as possible Knowing where we want to go and what we want to get out of reforms is, of course, crucial, a crucial first step. Fortunately, we now also have a very concrete tool to help us in this regard, the principles of public administration. Citizens expect governments to deliver on their promises. In order to do that, it is crucial to understand whether an administration is equipped with the right governance tools and whether there is the capacity to design implement and evaluate good policies. The European Union has created very efficient instruments for cooperation between public administrations of EU member states and partner countries. The aim is to improve the capacity of public administrations by establishing direct on the ground cooperation. Thanks to the two instruments of twinning and TIEX, Peer-to-peer -peer learning and cooperation between public administrations has become common practice. Through these instruments, we strive to share good practices developed within the EU member states and foster long-term relationships between the administrations of different regions. 
Let me also mention that accordingly to the feedback I, have re I received, these methods of assistance are appreciated by both sides. And the benefit is also mutual. And it is important that we will continue learning from each other. In this context, I'm very proud that the Austrian public administration and experts are among the top providers of this form of assistance. Over 300 thir thir 370 projects in the Western Balkans and the European neighborhood have been implemented with Austrian input. I would like to encourage you to make more use of these instruments which have proven to be worth it. When talking about drivers for EU accessions, one should also mention the macro-regional strategies of the EU. Austria takes part in the macro-regional strategy for the Danube region, which provides a further platform for us to address common challenges together. As the scope of these challenges uh, often go beyond the borders of the EU, the EU strategy of the Danube region also wisely includes five non-EU countries, namely Serbia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Montenegro, Ukraine and Moldova. The name of the game is to foster closer cooperation and allow for smarter use of existing resources. Vienna takes on a key role in this respect as coordinator of the priority area, stepping up institutional capacity and cooperation of the EU strategy of the Danube region. It is also in this context that the Austrian Association of Towns and Cities, in cooperation with the KDZ Center for Public Administration Research, is responsible for the implementation of the program, capacity building for the countries of the Western Balkans and the Republic of Moldova. The initiative, by the name of BASID, which stands for Building Administrative Capacity in the Danube Region, Western Balkans and Moldova, is also part of this program and is funded by the Austrian Development Agency. It is in that framework that today's event is taking place. I would like to thank all involved parties for organizing this important conference, especially our hosts uh, today, the city of Vienna and the city councillor, Renate Brauner, which uh, is also coordinating the priority area, uh, coordinators 10 of the EU strategy of, for the Danube region. Let me now, closing maybe with uh, famous words of Jean Monnet, who said uh, nothing is possible without individuals, but nothing lasts without institutions. So I wish you uh, all the best for this conference, uh, uh, fruitful discussion, and I would like to hand over now to Goran Svilanovic, the Secretary General of the Regional Cooperation Council. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, this, is, this is the day in which most of our hosts, uh, Austrians, are commenting and reflecting on the soccer play. I will not do it. We are, we are not even qualified. <laughs> Although I'd like to say that since I speak as uh, Secretary General of the Regional Cooperation Council, I'm very proud for the results achieved so far by Croatia and a few other teams from the region doing very well, so they have all our support. I wish Austria had a bit more of a uh, good luck in the last game. But look, I'm sorry to say, but I have to join with Madam, that uh, this is a very important day, much more important than the last day yesterday. It is the day in which uh, citizens of the United Kingdom are deciding on their own future but it will reflect on the future of all of us. I have in mind uh, the EU citizens as well as those who are just aspiring to join the EU. It will be a different European Union in the coming years, whatever is the result, and therefore we need to prepare to really openly, full-heartedly discuss what the citizens of European Union want from their own Union as well as uh, what us who are aspiring to join whatever is going to be tomorrow European Union, uh, hope for it to be. Uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues, it is indeed uh, a great pleasure and honor for me 
to welcome all the participants in this conference. Public governance as the foundation of European integration on behalf of the Regional Cooperation Council as one of the organizing partners. This meeting is uh, another contribution of the ongoing efforts to advance the public administration reform and to draw attention to the importance of coordination between national and subnational level in public administration reform programs in the Danube region and of course very important for us in the Western Balkans as well. I'd like to thank Austrian government, City Hall of Vienna as well, for hosting this conference, our partners for very good cooperation and uh, I'm glad that you have mentioned the figures. It is needed to pay respect to those who are supporting concrete engagement in the wider region and I would like to express the gratitude on behalf of all of us who are in the Regional Cooperation Council. Thank you very much to you and through you to your government. Regional Cooperation Council acknowledges the importance of EU macro-regional strategies whose aim is to promote cooperation, economic growth, prosperity and security of all our citizens. This is the reason why the RC devotes a lot of attention to the cooperation with the EUSDR, but also with another, for us, relevant macro-regional EU strategy, and I have in mind uh, the Adriatic Union. With our new strategic and work program, which only last uh, week was adopted and then endorsed by the heads of a state, uh, we will very much work in the next three years in line with this, what I've referred at as EU macro-regional strategies, and this conference is the result of our joint efforts to show how the reform of public administration is important for all levels of governments. The next three years that I'm referring at of the RC activities will be about interventions pushing toward greater regional economic integration, enabling easier flow of capital, people, goods, and services within the wider Southeast Europe region. The work that is well underway in the RCC is structured in three main thematic areas, or as we call them, flagships, and I'd like briefly to mention them. One is skills and mobility, which would provide for mobility of the labor within the region of the Western Balkans, being very much realistic about the accession procedures. I've been asked by the Mr. Goran, what are you doing? Wasn't it your task? to harmonize us with the EU and all you do, well, all you suggest for the next year is harmonizing us among ourselves, I was blunt and said, look guys, be realistic. In the coming years, it will be very much about harmonizing ourselves as a part of the process of harmonization with you. Therefore, focus, this is why I'm just saying, guided by the notion of single information space, we are focusing on another flagship it is connectivity, so to connect, including, of course, through ICT mobility, interoperability of the logistics, broadband, as well as the roaming services. It is skills and mobility, as I've said, meaning at least an attempt to create a single labor market, guided by a big idea, one region, one economy. This is what we're doing. This is what we're focusing ourselves on. And the third would be competitiveness, referring at single region, single economy, one region, one economy. We'd like to end up a three years period with a regional investment agreement, which would then provide for you guys, because you are all around, now I'm referring to Austrians, Italians, and others from the EU, to rely on, if not same, Slovenes as well, at least similar investment conditions in the region. So this is what is the essence of the SE 2020 strategy and what is going to be the essence of the engagement of the Regional Cooperation Council in the next three years. As the mission of the RCC is to promote European and Euro-Atlantic integration in Southeast Europe, I'd like to share with you some thoughts on how we look at public administration reform as an important tool and precondition for economic development, business-friendly environment and well-being of citizens at the most important final goal. We've taken a good note of the Fundamentals First approach of the European Commission, 
to the EU accession process, meaning the rule of law, economic governance, and public administration reform in the heart of every effort. The quality of institutions and of their services, both governmental and judicial, is a key factor for the well-functioning of our economies and the well-being of our citizens. The RCC is focused on the improvement of functioning of the rule of law and of the public administration in the region. In those areas where regional cooperation can help advance the reforms. Therefore, we are linking our engagement with so-called economic reform programs, national programs, shared with the Commission already. So we try to define regional as a collection of elements which are regional in the national economic reform programs. The key partners in the process from the region, and I'd like to pay respect uh, to them and to mention them, are the two organizations. One is NALAS, another one is RESPA. So they are, for us, the key partners in this field, network of associations of local administration and a regional school of public administration. Therefore, we will continue investing in the meetings like this one and in the concrete projects. Mentioning the European Commission's enlargement strategy based on fundamentals first, I'd like to say it is fully in line with the sentiments of the people in our region. And speaking about the sentiments, well, I have some news that I'd like to share with you. Uh, Erhan Turbidar, colleague of mine from the RCC, will later today present to you in more detail the outcome of this Balkan barometer. Balkan barometer is a tool how we monitor the progress in the implementation of the SC 2020. Besides collecting the hard data, and this is annual report of implementation, this is the hard data, the growth, employment, etc. We are also interviewing citizens of the Balkans, how do they perceive the progress? And it is fully compatible with Eurobarometer, and it covers six succession economies, plus Croatia, because when we started, Croatia was part of the process, so we tried to keep them in, in order to reflect on what is the development, how things change. So he will present this. We have launched it only uh, three days, two days back in Sarajevo. And the information we had to share, there is about one million of data because we've interviewed 7,000 people with 100 questions and then 1,400 CEOs running businesses in the region, again with 100 questions. So if you collect, it's almost one million of information. So it is rich. It is all on our website, rcc.int. But these are the conclusions. And Erhan will present how did we get these conclusions. Cred what do people think? Credibility of public institutions is low. Dissatisfaction with the efficiency and fairness of the public institutions continues to be high. Governance is perceived as the main obstacle to growth and development. Corruption is seen to be quite widespread. Citizens do not see nor recognize efforts of respective governments in fighting corruption. They expect much more to be done. And you will see the data are not too much different from the data related to the EU citizens and EU governments, but they are. So for instance, on the corruption, whether they respect the efforts of the government. On average citizens of the EU, 55% of them would say that they do not respect and do not trust the governments, that they are fighting honestly corruption. In our case, it's 63 plus. So you see that there is a gap of 10 points. And this is what I'm referring at. By the way, mentioning corruption, uh, since we do now consecutively every year, last year, when asked what do you see as a key problem? They would say unemployment, obvious. And the second would be a difficult economic situation. And now the figures are 65 plus percent of people say this is number one and number two. Last year, corruption was somewhere down there. This year, 27 percent. So now it, this is distinctive problem. It is an increase of 15 points compared to the last year. I'm not saying all of a sudden we are more corrupt than we were. But obviously, perhaps the discussion, the debate, the, the media 
campaign, the engagement of the government in fighting corruption perhaps as well, added to this perception that there is a problem and now it is quite visible and distinctive. And the last, the business environment is not sufficiently supportive. There are complaints regarding the accessibility of information, responsiveness of the governments and about the predictability of laws and regulations affecting businesses. So I'm aware I didn't bring much of a good news, but I wanted to honestly say this is what we have received from the people, from the citizens, and therefore this is our task. And as you can see, it is very much linked to what we are going to discuss today and tomorrow, and it is very much linked with the reform of the public administration and the efforts that are to be done by all of us. Therefore, while concluding, I would once again like to express our gratitude for the European Commission for substantial support for the uh, Regional Cooperation Council, but I'd also like to pay respect to our host, the City Hall, but also the government of Austria with whose agency, ADA, we are also cooperating quite intensively. Thank you very much, and I wish all of us a productive discussion, which will somehow help us improve not only the perception that I was discussing today, but also realities on the ground when it comes to the functioning of the public administration in the region. Thank you. So, uh, thank you very much. Um, my name is Michael Ralph. Uh, I'm from the European Commission, uh, where I work in the Director General for Regional and Urban Policy, uh, and I, where I'm advisor to the uh, Deputy Director General dealing with implementation. So, uh, I would first of all like to start by thanking the organizers for the invitation to the uh, Commission to take part in this uh, this event today and tomorrow and, and above all of course for the city of Vienna for uh, hosting the event. Uh, I'm not here alone. Um, in fact, there are three participants from the European Commission here and I'm going to invite first of all uh, my colleague uh, uh, Bernard Brunet from um, DigiNear to come up onto the, uh, the platform uh, with me uh, because Bernard is head of unit uh, and he will explain uh, in his keynote speech in a few minutes uh, the, the strategy from, from the Commission uh, concerning uh, public administration reform uh, in the uh, EU accession process. So he will give a key uh, presentation on this. Uh, I'd like to thank, first of all, all the three speakers who, um, uh, who gave the introductions. Um, to They all mentioned the the relevance of the macro-regional strategies, in particular the Danube strategies. Uh, in a minute, what I will do is I will also try to give some visual support to, to this so we can see a little bit the, uh, the general context of this. Uh, but what was also said also by Mr. Linhart, which was very interesting, is uh, this is not just a question for the accession process, third countries, uh, the issue of good governance inside uh, the EU is something which is taking on um, uh, increasing importance. We'll see this actually also, well, our third colleague is here somewhere I think in the floor, Mr. Hauser from DG Employment. He'll be speaking uh, later today uh, in one of the panel discussions uh, on the, the toolbox uh, on this issue of uh, public administration and governance uh, for, for member states. Uh, the way we're going to organize things between now and the lunch break and also the first part of the afternoon, uh, I'm just going to give a few uh, slides to explain a little bit some of the things we're doing in Rio to start off with. We will have the key uh, note speech from, from Bernard immediately following from that, and we will have some time for uh, discussion, hopefully, uh, immediately after that. We'll then have a coffee break, and then there are going to be two uh, panel sessions, uh, each of an hour and a half, and we have four speakers. We have an excellent lineup of panel, uh, panelists for both of these, one before lunch and then the one after lunch. So this is a little bit the way uh, we have, um, we've planned the event. Uh, it's quite hot in here. Um, I think we will have to take into account uh, this factor in the, in the course of the day, uh, but I think 
the discussions will be intense, interesting, but not heated. Uh, that's, uh, I think, the, uh, uh, the aim. So the first thing I'm going to do uh, is a little bit unorthodox because I'm going to give the floor to myself and I'm going to move over to there so that I can uh, give a few uh, slide presentations. So, um, as was already mentioned, the Danube strategy is a very important uh, element in this, and uh, certainly Austria, uh, the city of Vienna, has been, uh, uh, have been a substantial drivers uh, behind this. Commissioner Hahn, of course, when he was commissioner for regional and urban policy, he was also uh, one of the important um, uh, instigators of, uh, of this strategy. So we've heard about it, and you can see here on the map, um, it's an interesting uh, construction in the sense that it's got nine member states or parts of nine member states which are taking part. And then we also have uh, the, the five third countries. We have uh, the three countries from uh, Serbia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Montenegro. And then we also have uh, two countries which are part of the European neighborhood policy uh, from the Eastern Partnership, Moldova. And we also have some of the regions that are the four oblasts from Ukraine, uh, which, are, which are part of the Danube uh, uh, Basin region. So it's, it's an interesting construction just from the geographical uh, perspective. And it's not the only uh, strategy we have. In fact, it was the second one we started. Uh, altogether, we've got now four macro-regional strategies uh, which we've set up. We started with the Baltic, then the Danube. We have the Adriatic and Ionian Union and also, uh, region and also now the Alpine region. And as I think was already indicated in the introduction, what this does, its objective is to organize cooperation between the countries or the territories. It mobilizes the actors, could be the local actors, the regional actors, and it's aligning policy and funding on identifying common issues, solutions, and actions. And I stress this, common issues, solutions, and actions. So it's really an opportunity to look at common challenges and, and, and work together. It doesn't bring in any extra funding. That's always been a, a principle of this. No new structures, but it brings together, if you like, what is already there in a, um, in a coherent fashion, and it allows basically better use, better coordination of, of, of what is in place. So I said there are four altogether, um, and you can see um, interestingly enough, the, uh, the three countries I mentioned from uh, Serbia, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Montenegro, they're also in the strategy for the uh, Adriatic Ionian region. Also, Albania is also a member of that. I know we have participants from Albania here. So that's also uh, a relevant strategy for uh, the discussions today. Um, it's a transnational approach. As I said, we address the common challenges beyond the national and EU borders partnership and inclusion, so all the participating member states can take part in this if they wish. And you also see this multi-level approach. It's a subsidiarity approach, so we try to get all the relevant authorities, all the relevant stakeholders uh, can take uh, part in this. Um, this slide maybe is a little bit difficult to read, but I put this up. This shows a little bit the importance of having the non-EU countries. You'll see from the Council conclusions on the, on the governance of the strategies, it mentioned that this is particularly can help the strategies overall to assist participating uh, candidate and potential candidate countries in their paths towards the EU. So that's, uh, that's one important point. And also in the report which the Commission itself did on the added value of the strategies, we mentioned that this can also be a useful tool for, for bridging the European neighborhood policy countries and together with territorial uh, development policies, including those of, of the European Union. So there's the important linkage. There was mention earlier of the different topics that, um, uh, that are covered by the strategy, and I think this diagram is very important. You'll see at the end, the fourth one, you see under strengthening the region, you see institutional capacity and, and cooperation. But I think the point is here that this is linked to all the others, and I think this is the message that is coming out. You have other areas which are policy areas. You can see under connecting the region, mobility and multimodality, this was mentioned, uh, protecting the environment, building prosperity, the knowledge uh, society, people and skills. So the, the, uh, the priority dealing with the institutional capacity is a cross-cutting one because this really reflects the need that you need to have the public uh, governance 
uh, capacity really to develop the, the projects uh, and to develop the policies in the other areas. So that's, that's the logic behind it, behind the, uh, behind the different um, uh, pillars. And then each of these priority areas, they have uh, coordinators, will particularly signal uh, the uh, fact that priority 10, uh, as we've already heard, this is uh, being uh, uh, under the responsibility, there are, coup, there are two co-coordinators actually, we have Austria, um, uh, uh, in the, and indeed the city of Vienna, who are particularly uh, important for this, for institutional capacity and cooperation, uh, and they are sharing this with Slovenia. I think what also is interesting on this slide, you can see that some of the non-EU member states are taking some uh, responsibilities for actually coordinating. Austria is working together with Moldova, for example, on people and skills. Uh, recently, we had a had a meeting, we had a conference in uh, Kisinau, which was the first time Moldova organized this together with Austria. So this is a living proof of the, of the, um, of the inclusion of the non-EU member states, and this gives them really the possibility to discuss uh, these, these challenges. And you'll see Serbia is also very active. They are working as part of the coordinators on mobility in inter um, uh, modality, also on the knowledge society. So there's really active participation uh, in, in terms of uh, coordination of the priorities. Priority area 10 itself has got some targets. Uh, one of them is dealing with uh, improving World Bank governance indicators, and I think later in the discussions this morning, on the early this afternoon, we will get into the issues of um, um, uh, global uh, governance indicators. So one of the aims is to, is to improve that. Um, I'll just signal the third and fourth ones here. Uh, there is the urban platform for the, for the Danube region. This is one of the existing uh, instruments under the, under the strategy. So one of the aims there is to basically generate through the exchange of information uh, for 25% for 25 of the stakeholder organizations in this at least one uh, urban Danube project which will further the aim of better spending. Um, and I mentioned that because I've finished this presentation with a few slides which are not on the Danube strategy but are more general of what we are doing in uh, regional policy at the moment. As you know, uh, regional policy together with, for example, the funds from DG Employment in the European Social Fund, they make up what we know European cohesion policy and you're probably aware this is about a third of the whole EU budget. Uh, and we run this on a seven-year programming cycle basis. What's happening at the moment, this is a very interesting trend. Uh, there's a general aim to reinforce the effectiveness of utilization of the funds. And this is, I'm coming back here to the remark that was made earlier that this is not just a question inside the accession process, it's actually a very live issue inside the EU for, for member states. So in fact, one of the things to have this increased effectiveness is to have increased emphasis on the need for sound administrative capacity. Uh, we're asking member states, or we did ask them before they start their programs to make sure, for example, they've got effective administrative arrangements in place so that they can apply public procurement rules. They can apply state aid rules. So in principle, these are there, but it's necessary to make sure that this is there to actually uh, implement the funds. There's a big linkage between, as we saw on the macro-regional level, between the capacity and the policies you're trying to develop. Here there's a big linkage between uh, the, the public governance capacity and uh, the ability to, uh, to manage funds. And these are some of the key factors of that which have been identified by our colleagues. We have a specially dedicated unit which is dealing with this issue, looking at structures, looking at systems and tools and looking at the human resources. This will be very familiar, I think, issues to, uh, to all of you, but this, still, this work still goes on uh, uh, with, um, uh, with the member states. Um, I just put one slide on here. Uh, I don't have the time to go into any detail on this, but this is example, these are examples of the actions that are actually being carried out at the moment uh, in uh, our service to support administrative capacity building. TIEX is working also with member states, very interesting. We have activities there looking at public procurement, financial control, audit issues, this sort of thing. Public procurement action plans. Uh, these, are, these are in place. 
Uh, we have state aid action plans as well, and these are particularly where the member states were unable actually to demonstrate before they started their programs that they really do have all the administrative arrangements in place to, to run the, the programs effectively. So there are action plans there. And there we're working also with the other relevant DGs. We work with the DG for competition, obviously on state aids. We work with the DG growth on dealing with public procurement. So uh, there's a lot going on there. We've just completed actually a study, which is a stock-taking stock study on public procurement as actually works. Uh, for the management of funds in all the member states with some recommendations. Uh, there are workshops going on on anti-fraud, anti-corruption. We've started what we call also pilot integrity packs with, uh, with a number of member states, which is a lot to do with issues about transparency of procedures, particularly in public procurement. And last but not least, we're working now on what we call a competency framework, basically for management implementation of the European Regional Development Fund, the Cohesion Fund, which we run as well. And this is there to allow the member states or the regions or particular administration to do a self-assessment to see where they have competency gaps. So there's a lot going on. So the general message is it doesn't stop with uh, accession to the, to the EU. The world is changing, the requirements for the funds will also change, maybe become uh, more stringent, uh, we have new requirements, so it's, it's an ongoing story. A very last thing, I want to just signal an initiative we have which was launched by Commissioner Kretsu uh, last year, which she's very attached to. It's a thing we call Lagging Regions Initiative. And this is an initiative looking to see why certain regions are lagging behind. It, it covers both what we call low growth regions. Uh, you find these principally in southern Europe. It's looking at what are the, why these regions are not converging or haven't converged over the last 15, 20 years to the EU average. And a second group are the low income regions where GDP is, is very low. So you find this, for example, Eastern Poland, Romania. So what this initiative is covering, it's saying, well, there's a lot of money going in there, there are a lot of investments, these investments are very good, but probably these are not enough. So it's looking to see what are the issues which are possibly causing these regions, nevertheless, despite all the investments, to, to lag behind. So this is looking at macroeconomic imbalances, structural reforms, very important in southern Europe, of course, and also the quality of governments, this is why I put this in here, this is one of the, this is one of the factors. So we're looking to see, among other things, how governance, public administration, uh, where it's weak, how is, that is actually putting a break then on the increasing growth or income uh, in, in some of our regions. So that, I think, is in a nutshell where we are. So I'd like now to invite uh, Bernard to come over and give his presentation. And uh, after that, we will have some time for discussion. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's, it's, a very, it's a pleasure to be here this morning and to see so many familiar faces also. So my name is Bernard Brunet. I work in the European Commission in DG NIR, which stands for uh, Enlargement Negotiations and Neighborhood Policy. I'm a head of unit in which we have uh, one center of thematic expertise on public administration reform, but also one center of thematic expertise on economic governance. And these are two of the three fundamental pillars in the EU accession strategies. And uh, what I would like to do today briefly um, is uh, to explain you why uh, we have uh, put so much focus in the European Commission, but more widely in the European Union on public administration reform in the accession process. And I explain you in, in some detail, but uh, I would not go too much in detail about what exactly we mean by that in the in the in the, our relations with the with the candidate countries. Now, the focus of my presentation will be very much on the candidate countries, because there is a great focus in the on this issue with them. But I would also like to say, and I, I will go a bit in more detail also on this, that we are also uh, engaging very much on this issue with the neighbourhood countries. But I will go. Uh, 
on, the, on that a bit later. So, uh, briefly, I would uh, quickly explain you why we have put public administration reform at the center of our enlargement strategy, together with economic governance and rule of law, and then I will go into uh, some, uh, some uh, detail on the elements of, my, of the approach. So, why, uh, why is it important now uh, in our enlargement strategy. I think there, the previous speakers already mentioned that these three fundamental pillars. I think the fundamental reason why we have put uh, public administ administration reform as one of the three fundamental pillars is, um, is essentially because there has been the recognition of the experience that, that, has, been, uh, that has been going on with the previous enlargement uh, of the European Union. We have learned from uh, the previous enlargements, the ones over the last, over the recent decade, that indeed uh, uh, reforming public administration reform is a key condition for, for success. And we have seen it also because in the context of the economic crisis that hit the European Union from uh, 2008 until 2011, uh, we have learned from the experience of our member states that indeed the lack of um, progress or the lack of the good functioning of public administration was one of the main reasons identified by the European Commission in the lack of good economic performance. This has been very clear in a number of, of some of the hardest hit countries that, uh, that in which we saw that you know, there were basic elements of, of good administration that were lacking and that were hampering uh, economic growth and economic reforms. So that was one of the main reasons why we in the European Union put a, more and more emphasis on, on public administration reform for our own member states. If you look, for example, at the, the country-specific recommendations that are issued every year by the European uh, Union, in the context of the European semester, so the macroeconomic surveillance of our member states, you will see from 2000, uh, let's say 2011, more and more uh, emphasis on recommendations on public administration reform for our member states. And of course, this has had an influence in the way that we have dealt with the, the enlargement countries. What has happened for our member states, we have reflected it also for the candidate countries and the potential candidate countries. The linkages between you know, the three fundamental uh, pillars of the, of the enlargement strategy, rule of law, economic governance, and public administration reforms, it has come from our own experience in our own member states. And this is why we have put, put it at the heart of our enlargement strategy. So, in 2014, in the uh, enlargement uh, strategy paper, we've put this uh, focus on, on public administration reform. Uh, and there was also, um, let's say, two extraordinary factors that uh, also uh, uh, led us to put it uh, here at the center, be beyond the, 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 the factor that I just mentioned, is the, there were also ongoing discussions in the context of the revision of the Millennium Development Goals, and there, there's what the, in the United Nations context, there is this emphasis uh, that is now embedded in the Sustainable de Development Goals that indeed you have to have uh, effective, accountable, and transparent institutions. And this is one of the uh, sustainable, sustainable Development Goals that, are, that all our uh, member states, the EU, but all the, the candidate countries, the potential candidate countries, and the ENP countries have subscribed to in the context of the United Nations. They have committed this goal number 16 uh, of the sustainable development uh, framework in which they, want, they, they need to, um, to promote these effective, accountable, and transparent institutions. And also, uh, as was uh, mentioned a bit earlier also, we have now in the, in the EU have developed this agenda that, uh, on evidence-based policy. We at the, at the Commission, but at the EU level, have made commitments to make sure that we are developing policy proposals, uh, regulatory proposals, only based on the clear, on the better regulation agenda. And this means, you know, doing impact assessments, doing consulta proper public consultations, doing 
ex post evaluation and, and putting in place a monitoring framework for all of our uh, legislation and policy proposals. And this, of course, this better regulation agenda has a, a, very, has a very strong impact also on the, on the way we are uh, approaching uh, public administration reform in the enlargement countries. Now, what are the main elements of, uh, of the new approach to public administration reform in the enlargement countries? Well, the first element is that we want to have a comprehensive approach to public administration reform. So, in the past, there was a lot of focus on uh, civil service reform. Public administration reform was often associated simply with, you know, depolitization of the civil service. Well, in fact, and uh, this has been alluded before, it's much more than this. Uh, a good comprehensive public, uh, public administration reform, we have identified these six pillars uh, of what it really uh, entails. The first, of course, pillar, uh, and this is uh, the one that is at, at the bottom in blue and that straddles all the five others, is that you need to have a strategy for, uh, put in place a strategic framework for public administration reform. It's not only simp simple to, you know, to have the idea that you will you will do public administration reform, but you need to create, you need to have a political willingness to put this in place, so you need to have a political champions uh, in, your, in the government for, for doing this. Uh, you need to, and this political commitment needs to be translated into specific mechanisms by which the reform will be implemented. It's no use to have, uh, you know, uh, a, a good comprehensive public financial management system or to reform your public service uh, uh, and human resource management or to have good public services if there is no overall strategic framework, not a political ownership of this kind of complex and difficult reforms. So the strategic framework is really important. And then we have identified these, these five pillars and I, you, they, they are just on the screen, so I will not go uh, into too much detail because then there is also a next slide. So comprehensive, um, the more we want to have a more evidence approach to power. So the, why we, I mean, as I mentioned, we want to, to, to develop our policy on the base of evidence. So what we've asked countries, um, we, we have embarked with, with the, the enlargement countries on a systematic um, let's say diagnostics of where they stand in their public administration reform. We worked very closely with the OECD Sigma and Peter Wagel here will, will give you more, more detail later on during the seminar on, on the framework that we have developed. But we've developed principles of public administration reform and we've done a baseline assessment of each of the, of the, six, of the seven uh, enlargement countries. So we've defined a number of principles and we've asked countries to give us the data and then we've established a diagnostic of where the countries are in their reform efforts on, on public administration reform. And this has allowed us to, uh, to give a clear picture of where the countries are standing, assessing where they are. And on this basis, we can of course uh, have a clearer, um, let's say clearer evidence on what needs to be done and, it, and what countries need to do to, to really embark on, the, on, on reform. So last year, in 2015, we completed these uh, baseline measurements and uh, that was reflected in the, in the um, country reports that the Commission pro pro produced uh, in November on the enlargement strategy, where we have reported on, um, on, on where the, the countries stand uh, on this issue. In addition to, to, the, um, to this uh, measurement, what we are uh, on this basis, we have uh, uh, encourage countries, all countries, to develop comprehensive public administration reform strategies and public financial management reform programs. And I'll give you more detail, more explanation later on why we are focusing on, on PFM reform programs. We've also committed to strengthen the policy dialogue with the, uh, on par and, um, and, um, and PFM with all of the countries. And we've also, uh, uh, let's say, put a number um, put significant resources, to uh, financial resources, but also human resources, uh, to support the countries in their effort for public administration reform. So uh, I mentioned that uh, last year in November, we, in our enlargement uh, report, we did for the first time report systematically and uh, on each on, on the, the efforts that were made by each of the country on public administration reform. 
um, using, of course, the baseline measurements that had been done uh, through Sigma, uh, using this data, but also other information from, from the Commission and other uh, stakeholders. And we've looked in each of, this, uh, of the, the, seven, uh, the six areas, we've looked at each of these of the sub-criteria that you, you see here. And on, for all of these sub-elements, we, um, we have really used the, the measurements, uh, the, the data, and the evidence collected by, uh, uh, by Sigma and, the, and on the basis of the, of the country information. And we have really assessed where, where each of the country was standing in all of these areas. So you will see that you know, it's, it's quite a, a detailed and complex framework looking at all uh, at very specific uh, uh, sub-criteria in each of these uh, areas. And this allows us to have a very clear and, and, comp and um, let's say, equivalent assessment for each of the, of, the, of, the, of the seven countries. So as, as, as I mentioned, we have also launched a more structured policy dialogue with each of the country. We have uh, set up f uh, what we call public administration reform special groups with each of the countries. So this is a, a regular policy dialogue held normally twice a year with each of the country. Now the thing is uh, we, we have launched w um, the par special groups with all countries in the Western Balkans except yet with Bosnia and Herzegovina, which we will launch in the autumn. But this is a, a, fora, a forum where on a you know, uh, biannual basis we discuss very technic technically with uh, each of the country each of the specific, uh, each of the progress of the specific sub criteria, and uh, also we have a let's say a, a kind of high level policy dialogue with the session with the minister in charge of public administration in this context. We have also launched more specifically uh, a structured dialogue on, on public financial management. And why are we putting the focus on public financial management? Is also because we are committing quite a, a, a increasingly our EU funds toward budget, through budget support. So, you know, providing direct uh, support to the budget of the, of the national governments. So moving away from uh, classical technical assistance programs, but more directly supporting the, the budget of the, of the countries. And of course, this means that for, for uh, having the reassurances that uh, the, our EU funds are well managed, we need to be, to be sure that there is a credible, comprehensive, and relevant public financial management program uh, in each of the countries, and that there are a number of mechanisms for ensuring that uh, public financial management is, is, is sound. So we have indeed, um, uh, in addition to the past special groups, we have launched this, uh, this di specific dialogue on public financial management issues. And there we have, uh, we've also asked countries to, to, to develop a specific PFM reform program, national reform programs. And last point, we have also tried to raise the attention of on PAR and PFM at the really high level uh, uh, dialogue that have been created in the context of the stabilization uh, agreements, uh, in particular raising the issue at the, at the Association Council or the, or the Ministerial Council that have been established under these uh, agreements. Uh, one of the, uh, the new challenges um, that we are now uh, trying to, to confront is to, um, let's say, kind of mainstream public administration reform in the, in the way we are approaching the, uh, our relations and, and the reforms of the countries. It's a, it's a bit of the same that was just mentioned by my colleague. It's not only looking at public administration reform in isolation, but looking at a public administration reform as something that straddles all the areas of intervention of, of the government and, uh, and, in, and for, the commission, for the commission activities. In the past, if you, if you, if you want, we, had, uh, we were looking at PAR as a separate sector of intervention. We, the commission or uh, in its intervention, for example, we would support, we are supporting PAR or we are supporting education or, or health or transport or whatever. The idea now is, is really now to put PAR 
as really at the center of, of, of the interventions, not, not, to make, not to make it as a, let's say, as a condition for everything, but to make sure that when countries and, when, and, com and the Commission intervene in one particular area, for example, in, in transport or in environment, we and the government need to look at you know, the par angle as they intervene in this sector. If you want to have a sustainable and credible and uh, efficient environment policy, you need to have evidence-based approach. You need to have an impact assessment. You need to collect the evidence, uh, do the impact assessment, do the public consultations, uh, and, and, and then do regular evaluations. So the better regulation, let's say, agenda that we promote in public administration reform is relevant for all the interventions of government in all sectors. And this is a kind of approach that we do in the EU. It's called, we have this better regulation agenda and that we are promoting in each of the, of the enlargement countries. And this is really, you know, uh, it involves a, mind, a change of mindset and culture because it really, um, it really implies that the way uh, governments will look at the public policy is not something that is dictated from the top and done in isolation just for, for the sake of harmonizing with the EU uh, acquis, but really changing the way they are uh, interacting with, their, with the various stakeholders, um, collecting the evidence, doing proper regulatory uh, and um, impact assessment, and this kind of systematic evaluation and monitoring of, of the policies. So this is one of the things that we are, that is now very prominent in the EU internal agenda, but also increasingly that we're promoting in the, in the candidate countries. So this is again uh, uh, what I was just saying now. So the focus is really not on the acquis, but really on having a, um, a more holistic approach. Now to conclude, I want to maybe stress that there is indeed the same approach we are promoting in the ENP countries, in Moldova, in Ukraine, uh, in the Eastern Partnership, but also in the southern uh, neighborhood, we are promoting the same approach to putting uh, public administration reform and good governance at the center of intervention. And for example, in the, in the context of Moldova, uh, Moldova used the, the, the principles of public administration reform that were developed for the candidate countries and did the same assessment uh, as the candidate countries and developed its own public administration reform. And you will hear, of course, tomorrow, uh, Commissioner Han uh, state, stating more the political importance and the, of, of public administration reform, but just to quote him in, this, uh, in, in the last um, enlargement strategy, um, of, of, I mean, in the previous year enlargement strategy, where he stressed very much the interlinkages between the public administration reform and the economic development and the progress on rule of law. And this is something that I, I maybe would like to, to leave as a conclusion is public administration reform is not, I mean, we, it's part of a wider political agenda. And there, the linkages between progress on the political reform and the progress on economic governance and the, and the economic development really depend also on, on a credible, sustainable effort on public administration reform. And this is why we, we have put it uh, so much at, at the center of intervention. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Bernard. Uh, I don't know if you want to stay there or come, or come back, but we have a few minutes for uh, possible questions, uh, particularly to Bernard. I immediately see a hand shooting up. Uh, are there some roaming mics going or? Yeah, OK. So, the lady in the second row. Uh, hello, thank you. My name is Milena Lazaric, and uh, I come from uh, European Policy Center Belgrade, Belgrade-based uh, think tank. Uh, thank you very much for both uh, uh, presentations, quite uh, interesting. And I just wanted to pick up on something that, uh, that Mr. Brunet talked about, uh, which relates to the uh, mainstreaming of uh, evidence-based policymaking and PAR uh, in sectoral policies. I think that this is uh, finally a very, very uh, sensible and, uh, and um, um, st strong and, and proper approach to, uh, to treating governance in, uh, in the overall 
construct of the of the public policy uh, and uh, in the context of the enlargement countries uh, and especially uh, the European Commission's approach not only to the uh, uh, sectoral policies and how the governments uh, um, design their reforms but also in the way that uh, EU, uh, EU assistance through IPA funds uh, is, uh, is provided. Do you think that there is space and possibility to mainstream PAR and evidence-based policy making also in IPA, IPA projects? Uh, we have uh, seen, for example, in Serbia, and I have personally participated and uh, both on the government side and uh, as a consultant, in uh, many projects which actually, through, it, through their methodology, did not uh, support uh, evidence-based policy making and proper policy cycle, uh, which uh, entered into the policy cycle uh, with wrong approaches at the wrong, at, at the wrong uh, periods of the policy cycle. So, uh, for example, if they were supporting the design of strategies, they did not start by evaluating what happened before. Or if they were there to implement, to support implementation, they did not uh, set up proper monitoring instruments. So, uh, is there a possibility uh, to work with the governments uh, in the design of the TORs, in the design of the action uh, documents, to uh, really empower a more uh, mainstreamed approach to uh, evidence-based policy making and PAR in uh, IPA projects, to ensure also, in the end, the best possible use uh, and the best possible impact for EU taxpayers' money. Thank you. Yeah. We Thomas, you have a question? Can yeah. we take two questions and then? Yeah, uh, Thomas Brock from KDZ. Um, just one short question. What, what uh, role play municipalities or local governments, the level of local governments or also regional governments in the planning of, uh, uh, of the Commission concerning public administration reform? Should we take this two? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We yes, this one. Okay. Um, Okay, on the first question, well, it's clearly that uh, it's clear that we want to, uh, let's say, to make sure that uh, in the let's, in the planning of the IPA interventions, uh, there is indeed this evidence-based policy. I mean, this is actually reflected in the IPA two regulation that uh, we should have uh, um, this kind of uh, evidence-based approach, and uh, that the governments uh, should have more and more. Um, well, first, that we should have a sector approach. So se sector approach means that, indeed, there must be uh, a good analysis of what are the, let's say, the challenges in the sector, in, in, including through you know, proper evaluation or impact assessment of what are the, the weaknesses in the sector, and on this basis, to plan for, uh, for EU funds interventions. So, um, and then, indeed, there is in the context of, of the regulation, also the regulation foresees that we have to put in place a specific, a mo a specific monitoring framework and, and a specific also linked to the performance framework that is uh, embedded in the regulation. So all this, with, and that we need to have clear indicators uh, f with a baseline in 2014 and a target in 2020 at the end of the implementation period. So, all the elements for putting in place this uh, framework of evidence-based policy, the monitoring framework, the evaluation uh, framework is here. Now, this is at the, of course, at the, at the very high level of IPA2 intervention, but this is increasingly reflected at the level of each of the interventions. We are doing it uh, pr probably at, at, at this current juncture. We're putting more effort in the cases where we do uh, sector budget uh, interventions because the amount of, of funding that we are putting is, is very high. Uh, we are supporting also strategies, and therefore, uh, it's only in the cases where there is a clear strategy that, you know, we, and we 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 do more we put more focus in this context. But I would say that uh, increasingly, also for small technical assistance program, it is also um, relevant, um, and also in the context of tyx and twinnings. Uh, now, we are increasingly moving towards using them less, um, let's say, on demand without any proper f strategic framework, but rather to put, to use them in the context of uh, clear um, strategic objectives and clear, um, let's say, um, object policy objectives, and no longer on a demand and ad hoc basis. Uh, 
Um, when it comes to, to the issue of local governments, um, well, clearly the, um, the focus of the, this approach is, is on center of governments for the moment. I think that's, it's uh, the, the priority of, of the Commission is, is in the enlargement strategy is really on, on the center of governments. But it doesn't mean that this framework is not relevant for local governments. I think it is. Uh, um, the, the, the same issues are relevant for a large local government like the city of Vienna. Uh, it's, it could be relevant for, for big municipalities in, uh, in, in, in the enlargement countries. Um, but uh, the focus for us at the moment is really on, on, cent on centers of governments because it's also our main interlocutors uh, from the Europe, I mean, at the institutional level. Um. Okay. Uh, in principle, we should break for coffee in a minute, but I th looking at Thomas, I think if there are some <coughs> further requests for the floor at the moment, I think we can take uh, one or two more questions. Yes, sir, the gentleman in the front. Well, I guess there's no time for questions, just one, one small comment. That uh, clearly the focus is uh, on uh, the central government, on public administration reform, and we are feeling it, I'm representing NALAS, the network of local government association, we are feeling it also uh, in the level of uh, uh, our member associations and local governments. Uh, but uh, my, my comment is that these uh, idea of uh, mainstreaming in sectorial, uh, sectorial level. It should be expanded also in terms of uh, <clears throat> uh, service delivery level, which is, um, and I'm relating this also to the uh, results of the barom barometer that we heard uh, from uh, Mr. Svilanovic uh, a moment ago. And these uh, uh, citizen, the barometer is, uh, is measuring the citizen perception and satisfaction from uh, service delivery, from public service delivery, and what a bulk of this public service is done at local level. Citizens are living in cities. And so uh, if we want to, uh, to make an impact, to have better results in citizen satisfaction from public uh, uh, services, but also a businesses satisfaction, in terms of business environment and so on, uh, the public service need to be improved. And if we ignore the services that are delivered in the local government, then it's questionable what will be the impact. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to give you the impression that uh, we are not uh, interested to make sure that uh, this is uh, important at the, lo at the local level. I think it is clear that you know, service delivery is one main uh, one of the main elements of, the, um, of um, the, this approach on, on public administration reform, and it, it clearly the message that we are giving to, to central governments is that this needs to be improved across the board. Now, the fact of the matter is that you know, each of the country has its own uh, specific institutional arrangements and specific repartition of competences, and this is sometimes uh, you know, uh, a highly political issue. Um, but the, the, the policy message remains that you know, they need to, from our side, they need to improve the delivery of services at all level. So there is no intention not to, you know, to, not to, let's say, to discourage centers of government to engage more in this kind of reform with local governments. But um, the fact of the matter is, for the moment, the focus is really on, on, on central governments and the dialogue because there is so much that is lacking in terms of putting in place a strategic framework, putting in place uh, the political commitment to, this, to these complex reforms that the, the, the push needs to be also made at this level. But uh, I, I, I fully agree with you that, you know, one of the main elements of this uh, approach is restoring trust in governments. And trust in governments can start at the local level, that's for sure. Okay, I see. Two quick um, um, uh, requests for the floor. Uh, first from uh, Mr. Schicker, I think I see over there. Mr. Schicker, very like to welcome you to the conference. He's actually the priority area 10 coordinator for the Danube strategy, and he's going to be moderating tomorrow, so he will say more about that. I'll give you the floor, and I see, I think the representative, of, one of the representatives at least of the Council of Europe wishes to take the floor, so I'll give you the floor. We're running a little bit out of time, so be, maybe focus to the question here and we can come back to the discussions obviously later. 
Well, I'll try to focus on the, on the question. Um, uh, Mr. Brunet, uh, in, in our country, for instance, we have a three-level administration uh, and two-level uh, legislative bodies uh, on the national level and the regional level. So if you only look on the national level, you will spare out a lot of uh, administrative subjects. Uh, and uh, when you have a look on a closer look on where uh, on the distribution of people in our countries, then you can see that um, uh, more than 80 percent of of, uh, of the people are living in cities, and cities are, are the most challenging uh, um, uh, authorities uh, for the cooperation between uh, uh, the citizens and administration. Uh, so sparing that uh, uh, the cities administrations out of uh, your concept. Uh, uh, is, is, is very crucial. So you should, I think we should have a very close look on the different levels of administration and how they are interlinked with each other and how we can help the ones closest to the people, and that's our cities and, 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 and communities, uh, to improve uh, uh, their attractiveness in administration and reducing corruption, as was mentioned by Mrs. Vilanovic. Morning. Uh, well, just a small remark rather than question, and which is totally in line with the previous intervention. As a Council of Europe, you must know that we have a large number of very practical tools developed to, uh, which aim bringing services closer to the citizens, improved administration at the local levels, and interaction between central and local governments. I will speak about it tomorrow. At special time, but now uh, I want to make a specific remark that as a Council of Europe, uh, it's not just like that that we're here. We do much work. We do hope for improved interaction with the Commission in this sector of Danube region in particular, similar to what we do with the Eastern Partnership countries where the Commission generously supports the Council of Europe within partnership cooperation framework. So we do see uh, more uh, interaction with NALAS in particular here in the region of Balkans and also probably it's uh, a good thing that we are all here on the same line and talk about the same thing so that we can have a coordinated or better coordinated or more target oriented coordinated strategy to do the same thing. We are, have an interest in all here present. Thanks. Well, no, just to, to reply, I mean, there's no at all the intention not to, to, you know, to give the impression that we are not interested in, in local governments. It's simply that, you know, it's, the focus now is really on central governments. I mean, the, the, princip the framework is applied to, can be applicable to all level of governments, that's for sure. And, and, but the, the focus is on central of government for the moment because the magnitude of the problems and the lack of, let's say, commitments, to be, to be blunt, of many of these countries on public administration reform means that we want more policy attention and more political attention by, this, by, the, govern, by the central governments on this issue. Because it's, it has been, you know, public the Commission has, inter has intervened on public administration reform in the enlargement countries for more than 20 years in, in the Western Balkan regions. And efforts uh, for last, let's say, 20 years have been, as Goran just you know, illustrated through the results of the Euro, uh, Balkan barometers, they've been ineffective. Uh, so the, the clear intention is to put strong political attention at the level of center of governments that the politicians take this reform seriously and commit political capital resources and attention at the center of government. And now, it doesn't mean that the Commission will not support efforts at the local governments, because we are doing it through the Council of Europe in the neighborhood countries and also in the, in the Western Balkan regions, also through the, these, these projects. Um, so I don't think that's, uh, that's an issue. The issue that we are, the reason why we are putting it so much focus in the enlargement strategy is because over 20 years, results have been, in, I mean, policies have been ineffective. And we want to, politicians in the region to seriously commit to public administration reform, precisely because 
there has been so little progress over, over recent years. Okay, I can see other people want to come in, but I think for the moment I'm going to have to cut the discussion at this point as far as this introductory session is concerned. So we didn't want heated discussions, but we're warming up. So I think this is, uh, this is very good. And we've got uh, the rest of today and tomorrow, I think, to uh, take further some of the issues which are, which, which are coming out in this introductory session. So thanks very much, Bernard. We've written down a lot of the things, and I think in the panels we will come back to a lot of these things, and that will give further opportunities to people to... Uh, intervene and make their comments. Um, I'm the moderator, I'm not the practical organizational responsible person, so I'm not sure where the coffee is. Ah, it's over there. So you go out and you go, right, and could we please try to come back for 11 o'clock uh, so that we can start on time for the, for the, uh, for the next session. Thanks very much. Haben, wenn Sie PowerPoint haben, nehmen Sie PowerPoint, sonst nehmen wir das PDF. Genau. Ja. Ah. Aber wo hast du es hingegeben? In welchem Ordner? Ach so. Okay. Ja, äh, da hinten liegt, glaube ich, einer. Auf den. Das ist der letzte, von dem haben wir nichts, Radulovic. Ah, das ist der wahrscheinlich, der ist Ah, ja, da ist er. Okay, das sind alle PowerPoint und einer. Der erste, da haben wir, von Salis dürfte man nur. Gibt es nur das? Das ist ja wurscht. PDF geht genauso. Da tut man Ctrl L. Und dann geht es genauso und vor und zurück weiter oder auch mit dem Presenter und dann wieder Control L. Oder zurück kann man auch wieder mit Escape. Und da das ist ein Klang. I can check here. You are in the second session. Yes, we have it. We also have it on the on the other laptop there, so everything is prepared. So the tables are open. Genau, das heißt, das machst du jetzt, oder? Ja, das ist, ist mir sehr recht. Ja, das war immer Anfang ein bisschen deppert, weil komischerweise die Präsentation vom ersten, die hat er irgendwie, die haben wir nicht gehabt. Und dann haben wir das runter das PDF, das ist aber irgendwie nicht gegangen. Und dann haben wir es auf dem Stick gegeben, und dann habe ich es eine kopiert, und dann habe ich es gestartet, und das PDF, das Bauch bei dem abgestürzt. Ne? Also war ich war relativ froh, dass das überhaupt funktioniert hat, warum auch immer das abgestürzt ist. Passt, aber ist Achso, jetzt, jetzt möchte ich Können Sie es so machen dabei?
But we have three, we have three, they are all three, and we put this away. Yeah, this is a This is maybe his. Okay. That's fine. So that's fine. For sure. I think it's E. Yeah, so just you, you, you. So oh, oh, oh. do you do oh. where you just yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Where can I uh, 
Und die wird Desktop. Here probably ah, all the presentations. Okay, yes, yeah, so session one, so we can go uh -huh. to session one. This is session yeah. one. Yeah, 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 great. So Einfügen is yeah, Einfügen is yeah, okay. Exactly. Okay. okay, that's one. Be sure, you know. Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. Great session. Just close it and then. Yeah. Okay. Next one. just like to try this one because it's a movie. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay it's working. Yes. Okay. That's good. That's good. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So uh, now we are no here PowerPoint, so which yeah it's What do you want to do? No, just go ah. back where where so yeah, okay, no, no, just ah. oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, should be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, and then we will do F five. Yeah, and then we yeah, do this one. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. <laughs>
presentation during the line of my night. Yeah, I will just very briefly introduce everybody because I will, I will keep a little bit more of the time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so. yeah, so I will get to the presentation. I will just say who everybody is and uh, I will introduce everybody and then I will give you the floor. As soon as everybody comes in, I will call you up. Yeah, I mean, uh... So, ladies and gentlemen, could I ask you possibly kindly to take your seats uh, because we'd like to get going with the uh, first of the two panel discussions and I'd like to ask also uh, members of the panel to come and take their seats on the, uh, on the platform. So, he's coming. So, thanks, uh, thanks very much. I think our final speaker for the session is now on the on, on the podium. So we'll we'll get started. We've got uh, four uh, illustrious speakers for this uh, session here, uh, which will take us up to the lunch break. Uh, we have the first three speakers are in fact from. Uh, we'll be doing this, I think, from a sort of um, international perspective. Um, our first speaker will be uh, Santiago Gonzalez from the uh, OECD, who is sitting here on, uh, on my right. After this, we will have uh, Peter Vaji, who is uh, from, uh, from Sigma. Um, Sigma, I think, probably needs very little introduction to you. This is also partially OECD, but also partially the European Union and I think he will explain uh, his, his work. Sitting here next to me on my left, I'm very pleased to have also uh, Margot Pearl, who is Director General from um, um, uh, the European Institute of Public Administration in Maastricht. Yes? That's correct. 
That's right. So uh, you will also be uh, explaining about uh, learning from the best. So that sounds a very interesting topic. And our fourth uh, speaker will be a uh, uh, particular uh, view on the subject from one of the, one of the countries most uh, uh, closely concerned with the, with the uh, subject of our conference today, uh, Mr. Ivan Radulovic, who is from the Regional School of Public Administration, uh, which I think is under the responsibility of the Ministry of Finance in, in Montenegro. So um, each of the speakers will give a presentation about 15 minutes. I'll very diplomatically kindly ask you if you could keep more or less to the schedule and then we will do as we did before the coffee break and we will, we will open up the floor to discussion. So uh, without any further ado from me, uh, I give the floor to Santiago. Huh? Good morning to everybody. I am really happy to be here. And I will present you the Government at a Glance uh, publication. But before starting, I would like to ask you uh, how many of you are familiar with this work and how many of you have actually used the publication? Is this known to some few or this is strange to, to everybody? Can you give me a sense who, who knows it? Okay, a little bit, half of, of the people. So I will tell you a little bit uh, what is this. So this is a biennial publication. This is the flagship publication of the Public Governance uh, Directorate at the OECD. I will present you some results of the fourth edition. This is a data-driven publication. It presents uh, indicators on the whole production chain of governments. Uh, it started in 2007, and it started with indicators on inputs and processes. But increasingly, we have been moving in the direction of uh, including also data on outputs and outcomes. It includes the 34 OECD member countries, but the methodology has uh, also the potential to be expanded to other countries and, and regions. At, and what is new in the 2015 edition is the fact that a chapter on the centers of government was included, a chapter on institution, based on a survey to the centers of government, and also a chapter on the serving citizens. But I will show some results of this later on. So basically, this is our framework. We take into account the institutional context of uh, countries. We present data on the inputs that government use to produce uh, goods and services. What are the processes that they follow to do this? And the outputs and outcomes that they deliver. But uh, how is this important for policy development? Basically, what uh, this publication does is that it, it provides comparative data on government capacity and government performance. It supports policymakers uh, to understand what are the government priorities by providing indicators. And it also helps governments to serve the citizens uh, better. And also for practitioners, it's really useful because in many occasions, this allows practitioners to understand better their practices we are more and more trying to do indicators that are comparable over time, so that allow uh, countries to show their progress over time. Also, this is a benchmarking tool and a learning tool that gives the possibility to learn from countries with uh, similar uh, problems. And also, it, this allows to link performance uh, to practices over time. So these are the, the topics covered in the, in the publication. So we have some uh, core topics, so some topics that appear in every edition. These are basically the public finance, the public employment, public procurement, etc. We have some of our topics, most notably on processes that appear every two, three editions, and this is because many of the practices time, take time to, chi to change. For instance, the survey on budgeting practices and procedures, we do it every four or five years. And we have some special features that are topical to every edition. In 2015, we presented something on health budgeting and something on remunerations and employment reforms due to the financial crisis. 
So now, now I will walk you relatively quickly through some of the results of the, of the publication, some of the data that we display in this edition. So this is to show that the uh, governments are uh, key players in the economy. Here we have uh, government employment as a share of total employment and government, government expenditure as a share of GDP. In OECD countries, around 21% of uh, total employment uh, comes from the government and around 40% uh, of public expenditure. So what happens to government really matters in the economy. But it's not only about how big is the government, but how it is composed. And here I am showing you the, the share of women parliamentarians. And what we see is that uh, on average for OECD countries, is uh, 28%. It has increased uh, since 2002 by a 8 percentage point. And it's close to parity in some countries, uh, Sweden, Finland, Iceland, Scandinavian countries, but it's really far in others such as uh, Turkey, Hungary, or Japan. The countries that are in light blue are those that have legislated gender quotas. Also the composition of public spending. So basically, what is the money spent uh, on? The most important category, uh, social protection. Also health and education really important. General public services that includes the debt service and economic affairs that include the subsidies. But all of this frame and the budgetary process that uh, countries are still experiencing. Here we, we see the structural balances of potential GDP. And we see that the projections uh, tell us that the, by 2017, uh, the, there will be a, an average deficit of 2.4 across OECD member countries. So it's the green, the green line. So all of this to say that still governments are uh, working under tight budgetary pressures. Now I will show you some evidence on government processes and I will uh, explain you about a little bit about the new generation of indicators that we are developing and how we are moving. So basically we start from a, a set of solid frameworks that we have now that are based on recommendations that have been endorsed by the, by the OECD uh, Council. We generate good quality data and we are uh, designing and, and uh, producing narrowly defined composite indicators. So we don't believe in this publication on a kind of uh, big governance composite. We define really narrow composite indicators on specific aspects of public governance. I will show you some examples of that. Uh, so this is the recommendations that have been adopted in the area of public governance by OECD member countries. You see that there is wide variation on the type of uh, topics that discover. It goes from gender in the public life to investment across the level of governments. And there, in what, there is one recommendation that is not OECD, is the, inter, the G8 International Open Data Charter that we use for an index on uh, open data. Just to give you some example of how we are measuring, the, how we are designing these composites. So basically this is from the regulatory quality area. There were three uh, principles, one in stakeholder engagement, one in regulatory impact assessment, and one on exposed evaluation. For each of these, we are taking into account four components. Whether or not this is systematically adopted, whether or not this has a, a met sound methodology, if this is transparent and information is made available to, to, to the public, and whether or not there is an oversight and quality control body. Each a composite goes from zero to four, and the, each of these components has a score from zero to one. So just to show you some of the results, this is the, the composite indicator on regulatory impact assessment. We see that the countries that scored the best are the United Kingdom, uh, Mexico, there, there is also an, an specific score for the European Union. And uh, basically in general terms what we see is that most countries have implemented, have a methodology for regulatory impact assessment, have gone uh, with the systematic adoption of it, but those that score better are those that actually have an oversight and quality control body, and uh, those that are transparent and that this actually disclose this, uh, the results of, of this RIA. Here is the open data composite index that is based on the G8 uh, data charter. 
So basically, it looks at three, comp uh, it looks at three components, whether governments make their data available. If that data is available, whether it is accessible, so it's easy for people to actually get it and manipulate it, and to the extent uh, to which governments actually support the reuse of this data. Countries that score better are uh, Korea and France, and the ones that score uh, not so well are Sweden, uh, Poland, Turkey does not have an uh, open government data portal. But just to tell you, for instance, in the case of Sweden, that is a country that we are not used to see scoring that low in the indicators, this will probably change because they have already started a reform of their open, go open uh, government data portal. And uh, for the next measurement, this is likely to increase uh, substantially. This is another indicator on integrity. Basically, it shows the level of uh, disclosure of private, in private interests for uh, the three branches, the executive, the legislative, the judicial, and what we call at-risk areas. At-risk areas are uh, basically tax and custom officers. <coughs> basically, as a general picture, this indicator tells us that the highest level of disclosure is found on the legislative branch. Uh, and uh, basically, this vary a lot across across uh, across countries. Now, I will show you some of our strategic outcomes that that uh, to complete uh, the framework. One of the first is trust in government. We have heard this morning that trust in government has uh, declined. Declined. Here, I show you some of the evidence. Basically, on the left uh, axis, we have the percentage. Uh, the change in the percentage point, and on the right, I see the, the percentage. We see that those countries that are the, the white dots uh, is the percentage uh, change, and we see that countries that were hit hard by, by the crisis are, are those where trust has declined more substantially. So you see Slovenia, Portugal, Spain, uh, Finland. Why this is important is because, not only because trust is a source of government le legitimacy, but because it's crucial to uh, to mobilize reform and to push uh, reform. So this is one of the aspects where governments are more interested in working and improving this, uh, improving, taking action that could improve uh, this measure. Another one is the, the increase in inequalities. So here we have uh, changes in inequalities in uh, 1985 and 2013. And we see that for most OECD countries, inequalities have increased. And this applies also for countries where traditionally inequalities were really low. So you see Denmark, uh, Sweden, Germany, all of these countries are, uh, experience or have experienced increases in inequality uh, as well. And this is why now we are speaking of uh, inclusive growth or a growth that does not generate uh, or does not perpetuate this, this type of inequalities. And these inequalities, it is true that governments still play a, a, an important role in limiting these inequalities. So this, this is the Gini coefficient before and after taxes and transfer. And you see that the government has an important role uh, uh, kind of mitigating these inequalities, but still the net, so basically the, the after taxes and transfers has increased uh, on average. And as part of this 2015 edition, we have generated what we call our framework for serving citizens. And what we are presenting indicators on three uh, core services that are health, education, and justice. And for this, we have uh, defined some dimensions, access, responsiveness, and reliability, and quality. For access, uh, we mean financial access, geographic access, uh, and accessibility of information. For responsiveness, we mean a citizen-centered approach, much of services to special needs and timeliness. And by reliability, we mean the effective delivery, the consistency in delivery over time, and uh, security. We are not, haven't been able yet to complete this framework, like having indicators for each of those, but we are moving on that di di this direction. This is something that we are doing jointly with the uh, health and uh, education directorates at the OECD. So just to give you some examples about the, these indicators, this is from the health sector. This is the self-reported unmet uh, care needs due to cost. So people that were not able to access the health system because of uh, how expensive it was for two types of population. 
below average income, above, above average income. You see that in uh, countries such as the United States, around 50% of the population report that they were not able to access the health service due to how costly it was. And this is uh, really minor in, in countries such as the U, uh, UK. It depends a lot with the type of health system that countries have. This is the responsiveness of, of services. This is the time that it takes uh, for people to get a, 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 an appointment with a doctor, with a specialist uh, doctor. And uh, basically, this shows us that in countries such as uh, Germany or uh, New Zealand, three quarters of the population could get a, an appointment with the doctor within one day or two. But in other countries, such as the United States and Canada, half of the population takes uh, more than two, four weeks to, to, to have this appointment. And what, it's hap what this causes is that people tend to go much more to the urgency rooms, and, and this could create some inefficiencies in the health, in the health system. And one example of the quality of service from the, from the education, this is the the, percent, the variance of the PISA scores that is ex explained by the socioeconomic background of the parents. So to what extent the results of the test is conditioned by whether parents have a high education levels or whether they own a house. We see that the, on average, 50% of the variance is explained by its socioeconomic background. But in countries such as the Slovak Republic or Chile, this is much higher. And in Scandinavian countries, this tends to be uh, lower. Finally, uh, this is a, a, a slide about the, the satisfaction with the public services. Basically, our argument is that the, all of these dimensions of the, of the public service framework should lead to better satisfaction with services. This provides us somehow a better picture for governments because it shows that the, while uh, countries tend to distrust their national government, they have higher satisfaction with the, the public services that in many occasions are provided at, at the local levels, uh, framing in the discussion that we were having uh, this morning. Uh, just to, to finalize, to tell you that the, I say at the beginning that we have expanded the methodology. This is the fourth edition of Government at a Glance for OECD countries. We have done uh, a regional edition for Latin America of this publication, and also some country focus edition Notably, we do some work with Hungary, where we compare Hungary with other East, Eastern European uh, countries. And uh, also mentioned that all our data set is publicly available, so all the data that is used in the publication could be accessed online and uh, freely, and is available for uh, other uh, public servants, researchers, uh, other institutions. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, thanks very much for that intervention. I just want to um, just relate back to what you've been talking, what we were hearing from uh, Bernard Brunet before the break, because he was talking about the need to have an evidence-based policy. That's, that's the part, the real key thing. Um, I really perked up when I heard this. That's what we're doing actually with our, running our cohesion policy as well. This is also one of the uh, big buzzwords. And what we have there in our policy area is this issue of then getting the right indicators getting the right baselines just to see what it is, what is out there, what is it, uh, what are the problems and what are the problems we have to try to solve and where we want to go. So I think very much what you're doing there, this work on the indicators, this is, ex this is extremely valuable and is very, very much fitting, I think, to this, this evidence-based policy. Hmm? So thanks very much. We now move on to Sigma. Uh, I first came across Sigma in the 1990s, as a matter of fact, because I started then working on uh, financial control issues in pre-accession financing. And uh, so Sigma, I know, has had a very, very long experience, um, particularly in the accession process. So we'd be particularly keen, I think, to hear what the latest state of play and wisdom is of Sigma on this subject. You have the floor. Thank you very much. My name is Peter Vaghi. I am a senior advisor of, of Sigma working mainly on public administration reform strategies, so strategy development and policy development and coordination. Though, as I understand many of you already know Sigma, I would, I would uh, take a little bit of your time for those who don't know or don't know that much about Sigma to explain what Sigma is and what we are actually doing. The second part of my presentation would be 
about our joint work with the Commission on the principles of public administration and giving a little bit further depth to what, what Bernard has already indicated. And finally, at the end of the presentation, I will give a couple of high-level lessons learned or advice mainly related to designing public administration reform, either as a strategy, so the wide, in a wider sense, or any of, the, any of the key topics. So what Sigma is? Actually, Sigma is part of the OECD, so now uh, the floor has, has two of the OECD uh, presenters. It is principally financed by the European Union, and it has quite a long history, quite rightly. Next year, it is going to be 25 years old. It has supported all the accession countries since 1992, and since 2008, Sigma is also working with some of the European neighborhood countries. All in all, we are working with 18 countries at this moment. All the enlargement countries, so the Western Balkan 6 and Turkey, which is also an OECD member state, that is the only OECD member state we are working with, and also both in the EMP South and in the EMP East uh, countries. And the overall objective of, of Sigma is supporting the countries in strengthening their public administration. This is the distribution or disperse of, of the countries we are working with and previously has worked with. Sigma is relatively a small intervention in terms of that we have 18 senior experts working in 18 countries which does not mean that one expert per country because we are working in, in a matrix of everybody is literally working everywhere and, and has some, some engagement with all the countries over the, the experience. What we do? Sigma is a kind of mixture of analysis, conceptual design, and also practical kind of consultancy. So we are supporting, um, supporting the countries on a long-term perspective. We try to be on the level of strategic initiatives and strategic interventions, supporting on designing strategies, designing reforms, supporting on drafting specific high impact legislation with our policy advice, supporting on, on designing additional technical assistance, so helping the countries and also the commission in that sense on designing terms of references for, for longer term technical assistance on spot. We do a loads of awareness raising events, regional conferences on specific topics, and we have a constant dialogue with, uh, with senior officials in all the countries. This is what Sigma has done over the last 25 years constantly. There is one new aspect which, which uh, I would like to highlight, which is not a break in what Sigma is doing. It's more a, a, a um, synthesis of what we have learned over the, over the decades together with the Commission, and, and that is related to the enhanced uh, importance of public administration reform as it was introduced as the third pillar of the uh, Fundamentals First in the fall of 2014. Sigma is supporting and working together with the Commission from two aspects. One is that we were, we were designing, developing together with the Commission the principles of public administration, which I will introduce a little bit in, in more details. And also last year we have done the first what we call baseline measurement on the basis of the principles in all the enlargement countries, so all the Western Balkan countries and Turkey, which is an evidence-based assessment of the current state of the countries vis-a-vis -vis the principles as per our, our uh, indicator design. Why public administration reform is important? Though I don't think that I need to convince the participants here that it is, but there are a couple of specific reasons why it should have an enhanced emphasis. And the specific reason is that it is overarching. It is not one sector, it is not one silo, but it has a huge impact on the design and implementation of all the sector policies and sector interventions, and it is really cross-cutting. The other reason specifically is that public, a good public administration and an effective uh, and efficient public administration is really a kind of precondition for doing the work more cost efficient, efficiently, for having a more efficient governance, for having better quality services, and for having a better chance for having really effective and, and useful policies designed. 
So it is also has a huge impact on, on democratization or the democratic uh, principles of governance and also in terms of the economic governance, which is, which is uh, uh, clearly evidenced throughout loads of data, also throughout the governance at a glance. What are the six key areas as we define public administration reform since the concept or the need emerged uh, uh, quite evidently that when we are talking about public administration reform, probably everybody has a different meaning or different understanding of it. These six areas of the public administration reform also uh, aligns to the six areas where Sigma has expertise. So, and it is also the six areas of the principles of public administration uh, as it was also introduced by Bernard. So it is the strategic framework of public administration reform. It is the policy development and coordination, the public service and human resource management, accountability, service delivery, and public financial management, including external audit and public procurement. I want to specifically emphasize that throughout the enhanced understanding of public administration, this was the first time when the commission actually stated, and we work on that basis, that public financial management is part of public administration reform. For decades, it was really handled separately, and the new understanding is, and, in, and it's, it's, it's quite important for our work as well and for our understanding that public financial management is not independent from the other areas of public administration reform. <clears throat> so what are the principles? The principles are actually guiding countries in the sense that they give a conceptual framework of the, I would say, the minimum requirements of a functioning European member state. Also, uh, it is compiled with an analytical framework, which is applicable for understanding the current state and also analyzing and getting information about the progress in terms of the development of the public administration. It is derived from the EU and OECD requirements, international standards, and good practices of, uh, of both OECD, uh, so a wider range, and, and uh, EU member states. The principles include only key requirements or key standards for the horizontal aspects of, of good administration. It is compiled of 19 key requirements describing the six key areas which I presented a moment ago, and under each key requirement, specific principles are, are uh, designed and developed, which are capturing both implementation and performance of the, of the system in, in, in uh, practice. Under these principles, there are specific sub-principles, which are targeting on the key specificities of all these conceptual, conceptual elements of a good and functioning public administration. And in addition to that, we have developed, and currently we are also reviewing, the monitoring framework for, uh, for, anal for analyzing what is the current state of, of the countries vis-a-vis -vis the principles and for analyzing the progress ahead. So a little bit just really shortly about what are under these key areas, the six key areas. As, as Bernard already introduced, the strategic framework, which is really cross-cutting across all the other areas as well, talks about or speaks about the political commitment to the reforms, which is a critical precondition, and we face a lot of issues with this, not just in the Western Balkan countries, but all across the political leadership, which is matched with a proper technical coordination and also the monitoring of the implementation. Policy development and coordination speaks about the the center of government, the functioning of the center of government in terms of planning, in terms of monitoring, and in terms of the gatekeeping function vis-a-vis -vis the line ministry policy developments. It comprises of, of, of the interministerial or interinstitutional coordination mechanisms, the policy development process, both within the, the line ministries or the policy uh, institutions and across uh, these institutions, and also it has a special emphasis on the financial analysis and evidence-based policy making. Public service and human resource management is dealing with the organization and functioning of the public service, the basic notions of, of uh, a good functioning 
civil service, mainly depolitization and merit-based recruitment and promotion, and also with the training and professionalization as a process uh, of the civil service. Accountability is focusing on the transparency of the administration, the accountability mechanisms, the access to information or right to information for the public, and also the uh, possibility and the whole process of, uh, of legal redress in terms of, of uh, wrongdoing. Service delivery or service modernization from a different aspect is focusing on uh, how to improve uh, the, the state services provided for citizens and businesses, the better administrative procedures and the administrative procedures structure as it is, and also with the e-governance and, and modernization aspects. And public, finan public financial management is dealing with, with uh, better public procurement, the control, so the external audit, also the management, so the public financial management and generally the management structures and also the budgetary processes. As I told you last year, we had a big initiative of analyzing the current state vis-a-vis -vis the principles in all the enlargement countries. There are a couple of lessons learned. I won't go into very much the details of, of these, just to indicate a couple. Generally, what we can say that across the indicators, which is roughly 150 indicators we were, measure, we were measuring the countries against in terms of the, the principles. The general picture is that there is, in a five uh, uh, scale, the, the performance is somewhat below three, which does not have a meaning in itself, but it indicates, if we go into the depth, that the general frameworks are more or less there. There are obvious gaps in some of the countries, and there are obvious gaps in some of the areas in almost all the countries, but generally the legal framework or the institutional setup is somewhat there. The key issues are with proper implementation and proper design of what is behind those legislative frameworks and institutional uh, setups or processes. There are certainly specific areas where the challenges are more numerous and more critical than in other areas. However, we have identified a number of issues to address country by country specifically in the short term and in the medium term, let's say in the next three to five years also in all the areas. But obviously the accountability mechanisms of the administration, which has a direct link to also the perception issues and also the service delivery and how to make sure to have a good policy a unified good policy for, for modernized uh, service provision to citizens and businesses are two key critical areas of, uh, of uh, the countries in their current state. Finally, some general lessons learned, not just on the basis of, of the uh, baseline measurement, but also on the basis of our experience with the countries and working with the countries on a constant day-to-day -day basis related to the design of public administration reform. One which is quite obvious, but you never can stress it enough. There is no one-size-fits-all solution. There are always specificities, country specificities, time specificities of any reform situation, and those needs to be taken into, into account properly. Secondly, par is never a green field, so there is always something before a current state. So when you are designing your interventions, you need to have a proper understanding of what has been done so far, what was successful, what was not successful, and take the design of the public administration reform properly within the policy cycle. And policy cycle never starts only with simply a greenfield uh, design. The third issue, which we cannot emphasize enough, particularly for the countries, is that PAR is not for quick win. You need to take the time for a proper design, and you need to equally manage the expectations. Political expectations, the expectations of the businesses, expectations of the citizens, and expectation of the administration itself. Because if the plan is overambitious, then it is not going to be credible, and we face many of the problems of, of previous public administration reform issues on the credibility side. The goodwill was there, 
probably even the political commitment was there, but the, the whole planning was totally unrealistic, hence the result, results were really mediocre. Um, PAR is also not everything at once. This is the art of prioritization and art of proper policy design. You cannot have everything at once. Uh, you need to have a proper prioritization on the basis of the resources, on the basis of the most pressing issues, on the basis of the political ambitions, on the basis of, of the current state of the whole administration, including also the political sphere. And you need to also sequence properly, which is always, often lacking. Proper sequencing means that if you start certain things at the same time, you will have suboptimal results. So you need to know what comes first and what comes after. And that is a state of art which is not necessarily ensured in all the, all the enlargement countries, not to mention the member states from that perspective either. Also, planning requires time. You cannot have a proper reform plan in two months. Though the political ambition or even the political need might require that, you need to divide proper resources, which requires also proper time for having proper plans. Also, we must need to take it into account, and that is why I think it is critically important that the new financial approach of the Commission is the sector budget support, and not just isolated or separated project-based support as it was previously, that PAR as a whole process and any reform is not cheap. You need to properly plan your, realistically and properly plan and cost what you have, and then it can be in a more comprehensive way supplemented or substituted by external resources. Um, but if you have a bigger intervention pool in terms of, of money, probably you can have a better plan for the interventions as well. But it's also not internal. It is not only about the internal issues of the public administration. If we are talking about civil service, if we are talking about public financial management, we are talking about the management of the whole country. It is not simply the management of the civil service, as it was in many cases understood, and as it is still in some cases understood by, by the political leadership or the political sphere. Also, it is not internal that it cannot be designed simply internal. Consultation is not a nice to have, it's a must. You need to consult to get proper understanding and you need to consult to have a proper credibility for your reforms. If that is missing, whatever is the goodwill, you won't have the results as you want to have them. Also, it's probably new and this requires additional efforts and devotion is that PAR can be actually measured. There are loads of indicators and new and new initiatives of grasping how the public administration is working and also grasping the progress. These are work in progress, so you won't have ever perfect indicators, but you have now a bigger pool of proper indicators. Measuring public administration reform and designing the reform intervention together with the measurements, together with the proper targets and how those targets are going to be measured is a critical part both from management perspective and also from accountability perspective. Finally, and we cannot emphasize it enough, coordination both at the political level which means focus and constant presence of the political level in the implementation of the public administration reform. And proper, strong coordination on the administration is a must. And it pays off. It has a loads of potentials if it is properly designed and ensured. And if it is not, then whatever is the goodwill, again, the results won't happen as you probably hope as a politician. That is it from my, per, um, from my side. Thank you for your attention. These are just a couple of, of uh, our availabilities. If you are interested in more details about the public administration principles or the assessment, the baseline measurement and additional assessments, what we have done last year in the enlargement countries or on the policy papers of Sigma, which were compiled over these 25 years, feel free to have some search. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thanks very, very much. There was a, a lot of meat in that presentation, and you said, in fact, it's 25 years almost you've been working on this, so there's been a lot of experience and probably some heart-aching experience in some of these 25 years which have led to these uh, lessons uh, learned. Uh, and another organization uh, which is very also long established uh, working on uh, public administration is the European Institute of Public Administration. Uh, it's providing vocational training, provides consultancy to public administrations in member states, also in the candidate countries, and it also provides it to the European Commission as well, the European institutions, so we're very grateful for that. I think many of us, including myself, have uh, benefited from your training over the years. We've been learning the lessons from Peter just now, possibly some harsh lessons. You're going to talk about learning from the best, so I'd be interested to see uh, how this will fit into our general uh, perspective that we have here. You have the floor. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Margot Pröhl. I'm German. I'm the director of APA. And now I have a question to you. Who of you have ever uh, heard of the European Institute of Public Administration? Ah, that's, a, <laughs> that's a good result. <laughs> Uh, maybe uh, uh, this is now the time of the anniversaries because also APA is celebrating its uh, anniversary this year. It's uh, the 35th anniversary and uh, some of you might know that we have been built as a kind of complementary institution uh, to the national institutions of public administration to give some information to civil servants of the member states but also to the EU institutions with regard to the EU integration. Maybe that's not the top topic number one these days if one looks around into the political developments and particularly about the, the very special day we have today uh, in, for all of us uh, with the <coughs> developments in the UK. But still, APA is also doing many activities with regard to public administration. Because public administration is something which you can, of course, discuss in your own country, you have to, but it's also an, an issue for uh, the exchange among civil servants in Europe. And this is why I was so happy when uh, Thomas Porok asked me uh, whether I could give some input to your deliberations here today uh, on the European Public Sector Award. We have been very closely working uh, since many years with Austria. Austria was one of the first countries uh, to support APA. And uh, one of my board members is Mrs. Flatz from the Bundeskanzleramt and uh, uh, also Thomas Pappenscheller from the Bundeskanzleramt, who I just see in the audience here, uh, is also in the Board of Governors. So Austria is very closely working with uh, APA. And uh, when I came with a proposal um, to Austria that was immediately taken care of in a positive manner, so Austria has been one of the first supporters of something which I would like to present to you on the European Public Sector Award. Now, what is that? We are talking about public sector reform but public sector reform is, of course, structurally, but when it comes to real reform, where does it take place? It takes place in an office, in the mind of people with civil servants who want to change something. And we thought in APA that it would be wonderful and supportive to the public sector reform if we would know more about what is going on in the European public administrations, where are the innovations, where are the trends, what do public administrations want to achieve, and then to feed that back into public administration and to help the countries, the cities, the regions to do their reform work better. This I would like to bring to your 
attention. It's, a, it's, a, it's based on um, the work of an expert group in a European environment that was set up by DG Innovation and Research uh, last year. And in this expert group, I had the, the honor to take part, and we were discussing a lot about innovation and public administration and how it can be in, uh, fostered. And if you, um, I mean, you, you will get all the charts, I was told by Thomas, uh, and in the bottom there you find also the link, so that you could have a, a look at this report, which has been published by the European Commission as a result of the work on innovation. And there you will find lots of uh, hints of what can be done with regard to uh, fostering innovation. But now, uh, what is this European Public Sector Award? And you can imagine that the purpose of why I'm here is not just to tell you about it, but maybe also raise your appetite and make you interested and make you think of whether you have something interesting in your administrations which would be worthwhile to be called innovative and to be presented to APA next time for EPSA 2017. The target is to find these innovations then to assess the projects and to bring it back to the public administrations. What are the most important criteria? Well, first of all, it should be something new, something innovative. It should also be something where stakeholders have been working together. Uh, a project in splendid isolation these days cannot be a, a real innovative project anymore. And it should, of course, take up something, an, an, a wicked issue, something which is really of importance, of relevance uh, to the citizens, to the administrations. And it should not be just a nice plan. It should be something where there is evidence, where <coughs> there is results. So this will then be uh, put on a short piece of paper, sent to APA, and. Uh, these were the topics we had taken up during the last years. You can see we were starting uh, the process with uh, um, a variety of topics in one year on performance improvement, citizen involvement, etc., etc. But then in the, in the following years we saw it really does not make so much sense to differentiate it because innovation can have um, uh, different um, aspects within one project and then it's so diff uh, diff difficult to put it into one of these categories. So we thought we, we put out a bigger theme like we did in the last year, the public sector as partner for a better society, for example. And for the next EPSA, I personally, and I discussed this already with uh, one of our major supporters, which is, uh, who is also sitting here, uh, Florian Hauser from the uh, Commission, who from the, um, from, since years now is supporting this EPSA not only with uh, uh, the financial basis from the Commission, but also with uh, his very personal support. Thank you very much for that. So we were discussing what is the most striking theme right now everywhere in public administrations in Europe, and uh, we are considering of taking up migration integration as, a, as one of the major topics for next year. I, I would wish to, to get a bit of feedback from you what you think of whether this is really something which is a, a cross-cutting issue, because it touches on so many various issues. You uh, asked, uh, Thomas, of uh, public administration reform. Does it also take place in cities, and do they play a role? Yes, they do. I think uh, we can see the majority of the uh, results we got, the, the, the innovative projects which were presented, were from regions and from local government. It's really a large number. They are at the front. Uh, towards the civil servants. They have to uh, renew their services all the time. So this is why there is a lot of innovation going on at that level. And I'm personally very convinced that the, the uh, local governan governance uh, is, is bringing up much more innovation than uh, we know. And this is also a reason why EPSA is so interesting. We have, uh, meanwhile, more than 1,000 
evaluated cases in our data bank and they are of course a, a wonderful wealth of uh, knowledge which uh, can be utilized also in APOS work for bringing it back to the public administrations. For time reasons I will uh, uh, skip the former one and just show you we are talking here about Western Balkans. Well, the, the majority of the cases which were presented to us was from Spain and it's from, uh, from countries like Lithuania. We got uh, many uh, project proposals also from Austria and, and uh, Italy, etc., etc. But you can see with this list that there are also uh, countries um, um, like Macedonia has, has presented us a case. Um, Kosovo has uh, presented a case. So uh, I would like to see this as a possibility also for um, uh, countries from the, uh, from the Balkan to, to bring their um, projects forward and put them into uh, the visibility with all the other European uh, countries which are participating. In, two, in 2015, we had altogether 266 applications from 36 countries. I think that was really a big success in itself. But it uh, took a lot of talking, <laughs> I tell you. Now, I would like to briefly give you, um, um, because there is not so much time, but I would like to briefly show you the key messages which we learned. One lesson was, big trend in public sector is now the facilitator and enabler role of governments. And I give you an example. Um, this um, project in the municipality of Kolding in, in Denmark is showing this perfectly well of how the public administration in that city brought together all the partners in order to talk about a vision for that municipality for the future and how they did that, how they designed the process, and how they involved the stakeholders, that shows a bit the trend which we see everywhere, that government is not doing everything oneself, but getting more and more into a kind of facilitator, moderator role to bring everybody together who can contribute to solving a problem. The next big trend which we saw is a move towards participatory society and citizen <laughs> empowerment. Citizens are not only seen anymore as the ones leaned back, waiting for the government uh, to provide the good services. And you can see that also very nicely in a, an acute project in Poland, in Lublin, where uh, they have entered into participatory budgeting which uh, in some countries have already been done. In Poland, it's completely new, and they did it in a, in a splendid way and included the, the citizens first time in decisions about uh, the most sensitive part of uh, public administration, which is how to allocate funding. And they did that also for projects in the, at the uh, district level. So where the, the people are really um, uh, personally affected and where they could contribute and participate in, in solving the problems. <coughs> Third big trend, co-creation with staff and external stakeholders. That was one of our uh, prize winners, a project in Amsterdam. And if you uh, read the story of that project, uh, you would be wondering because they were almost bankrupt. Uh, the institution was completely in a mess and they had to reinvent themselves in a completely new way. It's a, it's a masterpiece of change management, so to say, because in, in Amsterdam, they had to uh, start thinking, what are we there for? They were there to help the children in the families, and many other institutions also were looking at the families from various angles, from the social departments. So what they tried to achieve is, to look at the needs of the, the service uh, recipient, the child, the family, and then to coordinate the services around the families, which turned around the complete mindset in the institution, and uh, the staff members had to rethink completely new, uh, which led to a high motivation of the staff, 
believe it or not, when you go through that institution, you can really feel it. The child and the health of the child and the, the uh, well-being of the child, that is now the driving factor, not how to provide the service the best. No, how can you provide the best service for the family and how to coordinate? They saved millions. And at the same time, the satisfaction rate of the staff went up a lot, but they had to cut something. They cut bureaucracy because they had to report, report, report endlessly, and most of the time was in reporting. So they cut that completely and uh, could solve a lot by doing that. Um, ICT is a very important tool. That is what we found out. And uh, I would like to uh, mention also a project which I personally find extremely uh, innovative, an Austrian project done by the Federal Ministry of Finance together with the Ministry of Family and, and Youth, where they changed completely the mindset. I mean, what is an office for a citizen, a place where you go and do a request or something? In Austria, here in this project, you receive the services without even asking. You don't have to uh, request something. They do it automatically. When there is a child born and uh, the child certificate, the, the, the birth certificate is issued, the, the payment of the benefit to that family will be uh, operationally done with the help of modern ICT. But can you imagine to give a service without even being asked? That is really revolutionary in public administration. So I found it uh, fantastic. Um, but ICT is of course a, a very important uh, issue, digital inclusion. Uh, I will just mention this uh, Portuguese project. Uh, you know in cities uh, there is a lot of online services going on, but what they do is going much further. They have a one-stop shop and they provide services not only of the, uh, the national level, of the regional level, of the local level, but also of business. So they include really um, a kind of service provision center for the, for the citizen, which is organizing services from various um, partners. And if you look into this list here below, there you see in the middle the, the projects which we received of these a bit more than 1,000 uh, during the years now, which were enabled with ICT. And there you see it's 422 that we counted. So it's uh, not 100% not, uh, half, but it's a really, really a high number of uh, projects which could only exist and could develop in such a, a perfect way by using ICT. So ICT is a major driver in, in uh, the reform of public administration. We should uh, really see that and make use of it. One version of the truth for data, yeah, there was already trust and reliability mentioned in uh, many of um, the speakers this morning. Um, that is, of course, something uh, extremely important that you can rely on the information given uh, to you as a citizen. Uh, here I have a project which uh, also was a prize winner. It's a cooperation between employers, employer association, ministry, and trade unions. And what they do is something also very revolutionary and maybe also interesting in your countries. In Germany, we have lots of people coming in from uh, countries where we do not know exactly the, um, how the educational system works. And if somebody comes uh, to a German employer and wants to be employed, uh, seeks for a job and comes with a certificate of something, which you don't know, you hesitate to employ that person. So this portal has been installed in order to help employers uh, to understand better the quality of a certificate on qualification which is being presented by a foreign job seeker. And for the job seeker himself, it's of course also very interesting because then you can show of the value of your education. So it's a facilitating instrument 
for uh, the job seekers as well as for the employers. And I personally think uh, in times of migration and uh, the need for integration of many people coming into uh, Europe, we need instruments like this uh, which facilitate the employment. Adaptive innovation versus new solutions. Um, we just had a big conference in Barcelona where the province of Barcelona showed to uh, the world, so to say, to the public administrations from Europe of how it works that one streamlines various municipalities in the district with regard to how to deal with health issues, to coordinate better. So they did training, they did coordination, again acting as a kind of enabler, and the result was uh, very good with regard to financial efficiency, because in all the various departments where they have money for health, they could streamline it now and come to better results. You can even see it if you go through Barcelona, the effect on the parks, on the, on the uh, transport sector, on the parking, on everything, it, uh, it is visible of how uh, it could use, be used for a better coordination. And finally, broadly based political support. I think that is what also was already said several times. Without a real support from the polit uh, political landscape, uh, innovative projects are very, very difficult uh, to be established. And sometimes it's even needed to do it uh, through, uh, via um, uh, various electoral periods, if one can uh, continue. Um, here is a, a, my last project which I would like uh, to represent to you. That is a, a Danish project where a, a region thought for our development, we are a bit at the outskirts of Europe, we have to really analyze what do we need for our economic development, what kind of skills are needed here. And then to sit together, educational institutions, employers, trade unions, uh, etc., and of course the municipalities which are uh, uh, involved in that region, uh, to, to think where are our gaps? What do we need for the future? And uh, then they came to certain conclusions and with the full support of the political uh, leaders, they could implement this. And uh, they are, um, well, they, it's difficult for them to show the real impact of this work, but they, they made kind of judgments and they said that hundreds and hundreds of jobs have been created by doing this uh, activity over a period of time now. It's a bit of visionary thinking, but at the same time taking on board all political parties. It was a, a, a very crucial uh, development. So I'm, I'm not going to uh, tell you much more about all the, the trends. Maybe we have a bit of time uh, during our discussions um, or uh, maybe also uh, during the lunch time. I would be happy to discuss and I hope that I uh, could motivate you a bit uh, of looking into our <coughs> website and feeling inspired to contributing also when the EPSA 2017 will be opened and when we will ask for the most innovative projects from Europe to be presented to APA. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Thanks very much. I think that was a, that was a great presentation. Before I forget, because you're talking about incenting people, incentivizing people to look at websites, all the presentations, by the way, we're getting today and through the rest of the conference are on the website or will be on the website of this conference. So Thomas is reminding me of this. So if you've missed anything, can't write things down, you'll have ample opportunity to go back and see these. Uh, I just want to take up one thing you said because uh, you're very much at the cutting edge here and of course this shows that this is a subject which moves all the time and it's, so it's not a, it's not a static issue. Uh, there was some discussion about mainstreaming earlier and this is relevant for various subjects. And when you were talking about the uh, public administration as facilitator, this really made me sit up because we had a conference in DG Rijo a couple of weeks ago dealing with what we call smart regions where we were talking about 
designing or deciding on what the priorities are for the future of regional innovation. And this was exactly one of the lessons which has come up in this, that the public administration has a facilitator role there. Basically, what we try to do is to get all the stakeholders together. But this can't happen just by itself. Somebody has to be there, and the public administration has to play a role there. So it's not just a passive agent in this, in this process. This, this is something that really came up in our discussions. It's quite new for us. So I was very pleased that you mentioned that, and you've got a lot of other innovative aspects here. So now we will move for our final intervention. I already said that uh, this will give us actually, uh, from Ivan, this will also give uh, one of the national perspectives, uh, which is important. Looking also through your CV, I see you're very uh, much involved in work on dealing with regulatory impact assessment, uh, uh, better regulation, and this was also touched on. So I think this is also another perspective maybe you will, you will give us uh, through your talk. So we're very much looking forward to hearing what you have to say on this. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ivan uh, Radulovic, and I am uh, head of department for regulatory impact assessment in the Ministry of Finance of uh, uh, Montenegro, as well as a member of the regional working group for better, better regulation. Uh, today, uh, on behalf of Ministry of Finance, as well as uh, RESPA, which is a regional school for public uh, administration and an international organization, I will uh, briefly present the findings of the baseline analysis when it comes to the regulatory impact assessment implementation in the countries of the Western Balkans as well as the key recommendations which resulted from the, from the analysis. So from the beginning of the transition process in uh, Western Balkan countries, regulatory reform has been one of the key the regulatory has been one of the key reforms due to the overreaching importance for the efficient functioning of the economy and all other spheres of the uh, society. And it has been driven by the substantial transformation of the socialist legal system into uh, market economies, which would contribute to the creation of the favorable business and uh, investment environment and, uh, and there is a result positively impact the private investments, business start startups, job creation, and efficiency incentives for efficiency among both private and state-owned enterprises. In the early 2000s, regulatory reform was partial and focused on the specific sectors or uh, areas. And due to the necessity of creating a well-functioning uh, legal system, the uh, legislative uh, reform agenda in Western Balkan countries was mostly focused on uh, creating uh, market, market economies. And it resulted in the drafting of a significant number of regulations that fulfilled market economy standards. After a period of ad hoc approach to regu regulatory reform in the early 2000s, governments in the Western Balkan countries began to introduce uh, some segments of the systematic approach to regulatory reform and subsequently initiated systemic regulatory reforms. The main motive for regulatory reform implementation in the countries of the, of the Western Balkan region was to increase the uh, economic competitiveness and, and growth. Systematic approach was one way to, to deal with the uh, regulatory reform process and it, uh, it has been concluded from the, from the analysis that the systematic approach creates much better prospect for the improvement of the quality of laws as well as the uh, implementation of, of laws. Uh, the same goes when it comes to the reduction of administrative barriers and therefore improving the quality of the legal and regulatory uh, framework and environment as a segment of the uh, business and investment environment. And in most of the countries of the Western Balkans, the governmental environments of the importance of regulatory reforms resulted in stronger political support for the implementation of those uh, reforms and the need for a strategic approach in the area in the area was recognized and most countries of the region first of all have adopted regulatory reform strategies 
as a single document or a part of the strategic documents in the in the previous in the previous 10 years so uh, besides the adoption of the regulatory reform strategies uh, there have been uh, other other tools that sh that have been uh, introduced such as introduction of mandatory regulatory impact assessment into the uh, legal system of uh, several western balkan countries as well as the establishment of oversight bodies for regulatory reforms that, that consisted of both representatives of public and uh, private business sectors. Uh, also the implementation of the comprehensive review of uh, regulation, which is also known as the uh, guillotine, and, as, and the improvement of transparency of legislative processes with the introduction of the obligatory public consultation process as well as forward planning of the regulatory activities. Uh, when it comes to the recommendations that uh, analysis uh, provided, uh, we can say that the region should continue to aim to implement and maintain strategic approach to uh, regulatory reform. This approach should be based on OECD guiding principles for regulatory quality and performance which state that an effective regulatory policy should be adopted at the highest political level and contain explicit and measurable regulatory quality standards, as well as to provide the continued regulatory management capacity. It has to be recognized that significant progress has been made in the area of regulatory reform in the Western Balkan countries in the past 10 years. But however, there is still a lot to be done and difficult reforms are in front of us. In order to conduct these reforms, there are following there are a couple of key recommendations for the improvement of regulatory reform in the Venster Balkans, and they are they are put forward. First of all, when it comes to the strategy and policies for better regulation, there is a need for the uh, sustainability of the regulatory reform and its integration into the creation of government policies. Also, there is a need to make regulatory reform a key vehicle for promoting support for economic recovery and growth, as well as reaching better economic uh, competitiveness, uh, as well as the need to improve the level of political attention and, con and commitment to the regulatory reform, reform uh, agenda. agenda. We all know that without uh, a strong political, uh, political support, implementation of those reforms uh, would not be substantial, as well as the need to consider how regulatory reform can be can be more effectively promoted and recognized as one of the key uh, as one of the key government policies. There is also need to integrate better regulation of Western Balkan countries into the EU uh, accession accession process. When it comes to the institutional capacities of, for better regulation, there is a need for further increase of the powers of the regulatory reform units responsible for the regulatory reforms within the uh, state institutions of Western Balkan countries. Uh, there's also need to establish or strengthen the RIA units uh, within, within aligned ministries in order to uh, improve their, uh, their both administrative capacities and an analytical skills to conduct uh, uh, better quality uh, impact uh, analysis. And when it comes to the development of new regulation, there is, a, there is a need to improve the system for forward planning of the primary and uh, secondary secondary uh, regulation. Some of the countries, when they have introduced regulatory impact assessments, uh, they have uh, made it uh, obligatory for impact assessments to be conducted for both primary and secondary secondary regulations. Also, there is a need to consider to, to think if there is a need to, to, in, to, to introduce a mandatory area for secondary regulation and public uh, uh, policies. Uh, from my own experience, uh, speaking on behalf of Montenegro, we can say that uh, uh, most obstacles that come uh, that influence the business environment are those that, are, that lie in secondary, secondary regulations. Uh, in most, in many, in, in many times, the ministries use the opportunity to lay down the detailed procedures in uh, secondary le legislation instead of instead of primary. And uh, there is when uh, when business obstacles actually arise, 
and uh, these is, and these rias do not do not uh, are not of uh, good qualities because it, this this is very obstacles come uh, uh, making it harder for our colleagues from uh, uh, from uh, line ministries to perform uh, economic and uh, uh, analytical uh, analytical uh, uh, analytical uh, Calculations of the of what it would, would would be the influence of the of the proposed proposed regulation on the uh, economies SMEs and uh, as well as state budget and uh, citizens. Uh, when it comes to the uh, transparency, transparency uh, there is a need to enable the accessibility of regulation through the uh, establishment of a publicly available e-registry of regulations as well as to develop a single consultation portal for, for use by the old ministries to enhance, to enhance citizen participation in the uh, legislative process, as well as to strengthen monitoring of implementation of the consultation requirements. Uh, at the end, there is need to improve, there is a need for uh, improved regional uh, cooperation among the countries of the uh, Western Balkan and benchmark first Balkan countries' regulatory reform programs among themselves or with, or with the EU member states in order to see what could be of value in the regional context, in the, in the, in the context of the uh, transfer of the, of the best knowledge, uh, to gain continual political support for further activities in the area of better regulation, as well as to support implementation of the RCC's uh, South Eastern Europe 2020 strategy uh, for pil Pillar 5, which actually relates directly to the uh, better regulation, and to invite representatives of the civil society, organizing think tanks, business associations, and academia to join the efforts on improving regulatory environment in countries of Western Balkans. When it comes to management and rationalization of re existing regulations, there is a need to secure a continued approach to simplification and reduction of administrative burden instead of one-time reforms to ensure that these programs are effic effectively monitored and evaluated, and to secure a continued dialogue between the government and the businesses and citizens on the simplification agenda. When it comes to the regional cooperation in this area uh, within the countries of Western Balkans, the uh, RESPA has established the regional working group on better regulation uh, uh, last year, and members of these groups are senior public uh, officials who are in charge of the uh, introduction and implementation of regulatory impact assessment uh, into their into their uh, respective countries, and they are usually coming from the either ministries or uh, oversight bodies uh, in charge of uh, in charge of uh, controlling the quality of, of RIA. And the plans uh, for the upcoming period uh, include uh, networking meetings to discuss the implementation as well as uh, improvements on the regulatory reform strategies uh, and advanced seminars of better regulation efforts in the context of preparing countries for the, uh, for the EU uh, accession and helping them in the negotiation process. Also, uh, this, would be, this would be all from the presentation, but on the website of the conference, there is the detailed baseline analysis for those of you who are more interested in the findings and uh, how, what tools have, have been used to prepare the analysis. Thank you. Okay. Th thanks very much, Ivan, for, for, uh, for that complimentary perspective. Uh, we've got a few minutes for discussion. I just wanted to start myself just with one question. Uh, I'm going to put it to Peter. It's most directly related to what you were saying, but I'd invite all the other panel members if they want sh wish to comment on this. And again, it's to come back to something that Bernard was mentioning. When he was presenting the six core um, uh, priorities, uh, he put the, the strategic framework separately as, as the cross-cutting one, relating it to uh, the political uh, willingness. Uh, you were giving a sort of overall view on the basis of where the countries are uh, on the basis of a number of indicators. Uh, you were talking about goodwill. I'm not quite sure whether goodwill is the same thing as political will uh, or that's slightly different. But what's, how would you, to sum up, say the state of play is on the buy-in at the political level of having a proper strategic framework for, for all these and also uh, any of the other <coughs> panelists who have an opinion on this would be invited to comment. I would say that um, 
where there is political will, there is also goodwill. So that is one of the one of the lessons we know. So we haven't encountered any of the countries where the political will is actually reversed in terms of what they want to strive for on public administration reform. The political will is not necessarily ensured and consistently ensured in all the countries, that's, that's for sure. Uh, and what is particularly important is that even if it is ensured, it is ensured for the design of the reform but not for the implementation. So we find that the attention, the political attention is substantially, can substantially drop when the implementation issues comes, comes forward. However, I must say that the, the key tools for policy dialogue, mainly the special groups for public administration reform, which is the, one of the highest level or the highest level dialogue between the Commission and, and the countries on public administration reform, anyway gives a huge input into maintaining public administration reform constantly on the fora of the, of the political sphere. <clears throat> Does anybody else from the panel wish to come in on this, comment on this? Yes. Yeah. Well, what, what we saw in, in many projects is uh, that the political will can, of course, be a bit massaged and uh, kept upright by very clever project management. And if the project uh, managers um, who are um, dealing uh, at the border between political level and, uh, and employee level are regularly presenting positive messages which the political level can use, uh, it, it helps in uh, keeping the interest of the political level higher. Okay, that's an important lesson. Okay, so let's move to the floor. Um, questions? Yes. The commission. And the commission. <laughs> Didn't want to Just to, you to stimulate okay. a little bit the, the discussion. Please. Um, I, I liked in the last presentation there was sort of a hint at, you know, when we, that uh, public administration reform has an element of, of sort of permanent improvement. Yeah. And I would like to maybe challenge a little bit sort of the, the, the Sigma approach that first of all uses very much the reform word. I mean, many people, many administrators say shutter when they hear the word reform because it means it's something scary and you don't know the, the outcome. Very often we, we reform and we don't improve. And, and I think also we have to be careful not to become too rigid to say, okay, we have to plan a big reform and design it and then the planning stops and the implementation starts. I think the reality is much more iterative yeah? and I I don't want to say that, you know, this is sometimes you really need a reform. For example, in Spain, they found out they had huge institutional overlaps between the national and regional level, and they sorted it out, and that was a reform. However, I think we should develop a culture of permanent improvement. And this is what I, what I like when we look at, at uh, Marga Broll's presentation, all the cases we had. They were not grand reforms. They were people that had the autonomy to think about their problems, and, and to uh, uh, find solutions to problems. And I think we have to develop a culture in this direction. So I think I, I would sort of advocate, yes, we need sometimes uh, uh, grand reforms because the, the current system is just not fit for purpose, but grand reforms also introduce a lot of instability in the system, which tends to be bad. But let's develop uh, a culture of, you know, of permanent reflection and permanent Okay, I'll give, uh, you want to erect, come in immediately, I can see. Yes. If I can. <laughs> um, we don't disagree on that, that, that's for sure. However, at the current state, and that is, that is quite imminent now, um, because of the scope of the problems, it is not simply, fine, simply time for fine tuning. So there are certain areas on public administration reform on the basis of the, of the lessons learned where, where actually you need to, to be engaged in the Western Balkan countries and in Turkey in grant reforms. On the other hand, 
you are absolutely right on that it, and that was one of my key messages, that it needs to be included into a proper policy cycle. And the proper policy cycle is always including a, a constant reflection. That is why it is also important to set properly the targets of any intervention, be it grand or smaller, measure how you are performing against those targets, and then readjust your policy if that is needed. That is why it is equally important that when you are designing any kind of policy intervention, you parallel design also how you are going to measure and what is going to be the institutional process for, for the adjustment if that is needed. So we don't, don't disagree on that at all. However, my, my, my statement is that in terms of big leaps on public administration reform, Vis -vis within the European uh, context and the European integration context actually requires quite substantial reforms nowadays in the Western Balkan countries and Turkey. Okay. Um, Thomas? Um, maybe I just want to stress what has been said. Um, uh, those working with public administration reform, always here, it's not sexy. And also in the preparation of the conference, I heard this. It's not a sexy topic. Why are you doing that? Um, yeah, it's not sexy and it hurts. Um, but when I see the EPSA cases and also the, um, and we have, we, have, we have not just EPSA, we have also other competitions and good practices. Uh, when I see them, I see, I mean, maybe it's too much to say it's sexy, but I see it's living um, and it's motivating. And, and this motivation gives, in my view, a, a, a kind of uh, sustainability. So, so there is really, in my view, a big need for more integration of the two, of the two uh, approaches. Huh? Because also, what comes after accession, for example, after SIGMA, is then the public administration reform over. Uh, yep. I heard this can happen. Uh, or what is the sustainability? And the sustainability for me lay, lies in these uh, competitions, in, the, in the showing the good, the, the good examples, and in, in motivation. And that's why I like these EPSA approaches, and thank you very much for the, for the cases, uh, very much. All right. Um, any more requests for the floor? I see one in the first row. Please, is anybody else? Because I'd like to group together. If not, please, your question for the panel or your comment. Well, uh, thank you, first of all, for very inspiring presentations. They, they were all very good. Uh, I think uh, there are few elements for effective public administration reform. I will cite one of our former presidents that uh, local governments are like laboratories for innovation. And he was saying, uh, the, the, the ministries, the, the governments cannot uh, afford to experiment because if they fail, that's a disaster for the whole nation. And, but local governments can now and then make some experiments uh, with the trial and error. And uh, that's why we see, as Thomas said, these, uh, these examples were very inspiring because they, they were behind that are courageous politicians, local politicians, who took the step to experiment and to, uh, and to innovate. So innovation is very important, but there are two other elements. Uh, the evidence-based that were stressed, uh, the, the information uh, that, is, uh, that should be produced uh, not only on project basis, uh, but uh, uh, there should be uh, institutions that will uh, produce it regularly, annually. So uh, whether they are NGOs or think tanks or uh, public uh, sector organizations, uh, these should be encouraged. And, uh, and uh, the third element is the, the dialogue. Uh, so when you have innovations, you have also uh, information. Uh, you can then enter into the dialogue. And, and uh, at NALAS, we are promoting all these elements, especially the intergovernmental dialogue, local government associations, and that represent uh, these uh, local politicians uh, uh, that come with innovations, come with, uh, with their specific uh, ideas, and uh, the national government who then should enter into public administration reform 
uh, that will be uh, um, <coughs> implementable. So uh, also all these elements are actually the basis for a bottom-up approach. And uh, the top-down approach is, maybe that's the reason why we are saying 20 years, no results. Maybe that's the reason, because 20 years we have done a, a top-down approach. All right, thanks uh, very much. We, we're seriously running out of time. You would, uh, would you like to react to this? Okay, so I give you the floor for a general roundup discussion. Well, I would like to uh, react to the, the, these two um, um, mentioning of good cases, innovations which we can find, but we have um, a serious uh, issue, I believe. Uh, the issue is that um, innovation needs a lot of courage, and in uh, uh, what, whatever level you look at, national level, regional level, or local level, civil service is not there to uh, experiment or mis make mistakes. So there is a kind of dial dialectic uh, situation between innovation and doing uh, the right thing in, the, in following the law. So for bridging this very difficult situation, we need a kind of uh, awareness and courage of leadership in public administration. And I was, um, uh, I was witness and part of a discussion which recently took place in the UPAN DG meeting in uh, Amsterdam last, last week. And uh, there, this particular issue was discussed. And um, everybody was of the opinion, the director generals who are dealing with uh, civil service and selection and education of leaders for the public administration, everybody was in agreement that we should have more leaders who are selected with regard to helping public administrations to reform from inside, organize reform processes, encourage innovation, start these kind of processes in the small uh, laboratories and make them to bigger um, uh, developments, but it was, uh, there was not really a lot of knowledge yet of how to do that, because we are in this dialectic thing and we are a bit caught in that. So all the innovations and many others I could have shown to you, uh, they are um, developed with particular courage of individual or groups of people in administrations. So we should really be grateful for, to them. Uh, but on the other hand, what uh, I think is really necessary is a broader approach, which is helping the administrations to put the right leaders into the situation and encourage these, um, the, the responsible people to go for more innovation. But that is, uh, we are far from there. Okay, thanks very much. We will probably have to stop now in a minute. I just give the opportunity to other panel members if you wish to make any uh, concluding comments on, on what's been said. Um, yes, Santiago. Yes. I mean, I really like the comment that was made here about the necessity of uh, information and information development. I think you are right and I totally agree that indicators could uh, trigger a reform. And in many occasions, they signal that there is an area of improvement, but that they should also accompany reform, and at the end should be used to measure the, the result of that reform. So I, I fully agree with this idea of uh, incorporating the, the generation of consistent information for, for the, throughout the cycle of the, of the reform. Okay, thanks very much. I think we'll have to break for lunch now. Um, the, and uh, it's, over there, the same place as where the coffee is, I think, from what I understand. Um, and we should be back for 13.45? Yes, we start sharp 13.45 uh, with, the, with the next session. And thanks very, very much to all the panelists for their excellent contributions to our discussions this morning.
Okay, thank you very much for coming back, ladies and gentlemen. We, are, we should uh, start, I think, on our panel discussion this afternoon. Um, we've got another um, panel of four distinguished um, uh, speakers, and we will proceed as we did this morning. Uh, I'll just very briefly present um, our four. I'll start uh, on the gentleman by himself on our sofa over there, Mr. Florian Hauser, who's a colleague of mine from European Commission. Uh, and he works in the Director General for Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion, and he's responsible for coordinating support there for institutional capacity building and public administration reform in EU member states. So there again, we were talking about this uh, this morning. Secondly, big pleasure to welcome um, Mari Evans. I see on the program she's put as Governance Committee of the Congress of Local and Regional Authorities for the Council of Europe. If you look into the speakers list and you see the more details, you will see that uh, uh, she's in fact from Scotland, but she's a member of the, the Scottish Parliament. Uh, very pleased that you could come here today. This is a very interesting situation. I'm here as an Englishman representing the European Commission, and you are here as a, uh, a lady from Scotland representing the Council of Europe, which is um, the UK membership of the Council of Europe is not up for uh, discussion today, I should add. So uh, your, uh, your midterm prospects in this task are, are secure. But thanks very much for coming. And you'll be here tomorrow as well. Yeah, I won't be here tomorrow. There is nothing sinister and symbolic in the fact that I'm not coming tomorrow. Tomorrow I have another uh, uh, obligation uh, elsewhere in Europe which uh, I have to uh, uh, take part in. I would have liked to stay, but it's not uh, absence of hopefully symbolic uh, character. Then on my left here is um, Erhan Tobeda from Regional Cooperation Council, and uh, he has very interesting CV, born in the Kosovo, I see received a bachelor's degree in Ankara, and is a historian, I understand. You've worked on the history of the Balkans, which um, I think if you explain the history of the Balkans this afternoon, we'll be here for a very long time. It's a very complicated subject, but I think this will uh, be a very interesting perspective we'll have on this. And last, but certainly not least, because he's part of the organization of this whole event, uh, Thomas Prorok from KDZ Center for Public Administration Research here in, uh, in Vienna and uh, he's been working on public administration reform for more than 15 years, administration reform, decentralization, and local governments as well as EU integration. So uh, that's our lineup. So I think without any further ado, Florian, you have the floor. Um, and as this morning, 15 minutes. And, put uh, the timer. He's got a I, timer. Uh, okay, yeah, all right, yeah, okay, I, very good. I tend to talk a lot, so. Uh, all right, I noticed. Okay, you get 15 uh, minutes, and as you're a colleague of mine, exactly. I will be brutal. So the, the, the way I organized the presentation, uh, towards the end I have lots of nice examples, but when the time is up I will just stop. So I put on the, the timer now so I see that. Um, good afternoon, so hopefully I'll keep you awake yeah, after lunch. It's not the easiest slot, but I try to make it uh, not, not too boring. And uh, to create some excitement, we'll start with, with, with some money. Um, so basically, you know, this morning we've, we've been listening to, to, to the perspective of the, the candidate countries, potential candidate countries. But my, my main message is that the story of improving public governance and quality of public administration, it does not go away when you are a member of the EU. In, in fact, the, the, the awareness is increasing. It is a very important horizontal topic to achieve the objectives of the EU, whether to complete the single market or, or just to you know, implement EU legislation in, in member states. Now, there are different policy instruments to, to in, encourage member states uh, to improve their public administration. I work with uh, the European Social Fund, and a part of the European Social Fund is also used to invest into the quality of public administration. Not every member state is eligible. You need to be a country with one so-called uh, less developed region, or a, or a beneficiary of the Euro European Cohesion Fund, that means you're slightly poorer than average, and, and on this basis you would be eligible to, to get money from the ESF for, for this uh, topic. Uh, 18 countries are eligible out of the 28 that, that we have, and one country actually uh, uh, courageously said we don't want any money from the EU, that was Spain. And Spain has a very interesting reform, so this is a whole interesting debate, but you see, uh, in total, it's about um, 
it's more than 4 billion euro. Oh, sorry, I was going to go back on that. Um, it's about 4 billion euro. And you see that, uh, in fact, Italy is, is the biggest uh, beneficiary. Uh, I should also be fair uh, to, to Michael. Uh, we uh, also have a contribution from the, from the European Regional Development Fund under the thematic objective of improving quality of public administration. But the, the ERDF mainly focuses on improving the capacity to manage the structural funds, whereas the ESF focuses on you know, running the country, basically. So you cannot just say, OK, I, you know, here's the money, uh, and now what do we do with it? How do we improve public administration? We are always told we're supposed to link policy and funding. You know, if we uh, uh, in, invest in, in improving the environmental situation, we need to see what is actually the EU environmental policy and to, to link that. Now, there we have a problem, because what, in fact, is the EU policy on public administration and there is none. It's not part of the, the key, yeah? or it's extremely uh, limited. However, uh, we know that there are many challenges that member states have in, in this area. And we have um, a process called the European Semester. Does anybody know? Hands up if you know what the European Semester is. OK, well, yeah. So it's sort of an analytical process uh, in, in the context of the, the economic governance where we basically assess the, the systems and the performance in, in member states. And within the context of European semester, we've always assessed also more or less the, the quality of public administration. And over the time, you know, uh, over the last few years, about up to 20 countries received recommendations in this regard. So when you are a country with a recommendation, for example, improve efficiency, effectiveness of public administration, then you're also supposed to link your, your program for improvement and, and the money to, to that area. Again, um, we try to take a strategic approach, and we, in the current funding peer, uh, period, we came up with a, a system, we call it ex ante conditionalities. That means before you get any money, you should show to the Commission that you have an overarching strategy and a strategic approach. Uh, I think the strategic approach was emphasized by the colleagues from the OECD and, and, and others. So, and so we want to really see that uh, a country has an underlying national strategy for reform before we actually release the money. And then, if you know about the EU structural funds, we always work on the basis of so-called operational funding programs. And um, because the policy is not so clear, or the, the line and the op opinion of the, the Commission of what you know, does it mean improving quality of public administration, there was a lot of demand for guidance. People ask us, what shall I focus my strategy on? What shall I do? And I said, OK, we have to do something. We have to actually help the member states to, to, to work with this. Uh, and when we looked at the, the, the kind of you know, topics that most member states were concerned about, so I call it the OP, so in the operational programs, uh, uh, the, the, the type of issues are, are really what was mentioned this morning. So being you know, cut dress tape, uh, being more business friendly, obviously being also, you know, accountable, clean, having, you know, high levels of integrity, also uh, better planning capacity and, and, and so on. Now, uh, the other issue that we were facing or what we learned from previous funding rounds was the focus of, you know, the, the perception of achievement was always OK, uh, we need to spend the money. And if you have a high level of disbursement, quite often we were satisfied. So, oh, you managed to spend the money. But what were actually the results? This was never so, so clear. Or the results were perceived as being the outputs. So somebody said, I have a good result. I trained 1,000 people. I said, OK, well done. But you know, is that a systemic change that improves the service delivery to citizens and business? We're not so sure. So, we are waking up to this. In, in fact, our, our uh, Commissioner for the Budget, uh, Vice President Georgieva, has an initiative called EU Budget for Results. We are also under, under a lot of pressure to really deliver value for money with the money that we have. And so we try to communicate, exactly, we try to communicate, you know, um, let's have a dialogue on results. What is a result? Yeah. So uh, we want real improvements. And real improvements is not just changing laws and systems but also sometimes it needs a bit of a culture change, you know, more service orientation, more integrity, and so on. 
So with, with all that, what we try to do is we try to put all our knowledge together in a guidance document, and this is what we call the uh, Quality of Public Administration Toolbox. Yeah? And you will find it on the internet. There is, um, actually we should have brought some, some of them, but you can, you can order it from the EU bookshop. Very simply, you write a message and you can order 100 copies to share it among your friends and colleagues. There's a short version that is published, and then the full version is quite large, but it's nicely structured. And, uh, and you don't have to read it like a, like a book, yeah? but you go straight in what, what interests you. So I want to tell you a little bit about this. I should also acknowledge that um, we would never have been able to do this alone, so we contracted uh, the European Institute of Public Administration, and they were really great help in, in help us uh, produce this output. The status is just um, a technical report. Yeah? It's not a law, it's not a regulation, it's not an official EU thing, but it's, it's because it has a very low profile status, it's, it's quite a popular product. I will, I will tell you about this. So why is the toolbox good? Now, because public administration is not an EU policy, we don't have a single entity that is in charge of this. I'm not in charge of public administration, you know, or, or, but many services have an interest. So for example, our DG Grow deals with public procurement. Our DG Home deals with anti-corruption. Our DG Justice deals with the rule of law and the quality of, of, of judiciary. And everybody has a lot of experience, but we all work in silos. We work parallel to each other. And what we try to do with the toolbox to bring all the perspectives and the knowledge that we have together in one document. And we didn't, fo we didn't try to develop new things, but just to compile what exists, because so much that we do is out there and nobody knows about it. It's not accessible. And, and very importantly, uh, it's not prescriptive. We don't claim that we know better, but we are a partner, and we try to inspire. So we don't tell you what is in the toolbox, you have to do it this way. Rather, the, when you read it, you will see it's more like discussing. You say, you know, these are some principles, and in one country it might work, in another it, 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 it might not. So it's like a cookbook, you know, you choose what you want from it. And then, uh, we have a lot of um, examples. There's 168 cases that are really inspiring examples where you can see what countries actually practically did. And I should say again that many of the examples actually came from the EPSA. Yeah? So the EPSA is really important for, for, for us to have some real evidence. So it's um, technical guidance, and I said, and more, because it's not just the report that you put on, on your shelf, but it's... Um, it's a living thing, and we use it as a basis for, for dialogue and discussion with member states, how to do. So just to sum up, so the, the purpose of the toolbox, it was really important for our own capacity building that we as a commission learn you know, what, 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 what works, what doesn't work, and that we learn from each other's uh, knowledge, and also that we have an agreed line to take. That means when we go out to discuss with the member states, sometimes you are from one service, for example, you work in economics and finance, you might have a different opinion from somebody from DG Employment. But with the toolbox, we actually we have agreed what we think is, is good together. That's quite important because you avoid conflicting messages. Um, and also because it is an important uh, topic and we do spend a lot of money, we also had to make a statement. You know? We will, as, as Commission, we will never try to compete with the OECD. The OECD is a very important partner for us. We think they are the leaders in this area. But we have many very specific EU aspects of the debate, and this we want to also communicate. And, um, and, and, and so far, this, it, it has been quite a, a popular product. It's, it has been it's sort of the, on the top seller list in terms of downloads on our website, and the member states reacted very positively. So if you look a little bit in, inside, I think if you look at the themes, there would, of course, be nothing new. So it's, it's very much in line with the, the principles of public administration and the priorities outlined by uh, Bernard this morning. Uh, I, I think we emphasize a lot also the, the values, principles, and ethics. So a little bit the, the culture, culture of integrity, the attitude you know, uh, towards uh, services for citizens, and so on and accountability, so there you have it. Now, a little bit looking inside, some, some examples. This I will probably go, go very fast because it's just repeating what the colleagues said. I think we all agree. 
So obviously, if you, if you look at you know, designing policy, avoid being reactive. But as Bernard said this morning, you, know, you have to have an evidence-based have evidence-based policy making. <coughs> Always reflect, does it work? Focus on you know, co-creation, share responsibility. And also, you know, laws and regulations, they're not a rigid thing, but you always need to reflect, is it still adding value or do we need to improve and, and, and change it? In terms of, of delivery, you know, sometimes we, we think we can solve all the problems by putting money at it, but sometimes it's not only about money, but increasingly is also highlighted by, by Marga, working on the basis of networks and partnerships becomes more, more important. Uh, Maybe this I, I, I want to show you because we talked a lot about corruption. I think corruption is very central, yeah? or rather integrity is very central and the absence of integrity is, is very bad. In, in Romania, uh, corruption brought the government down. You know, there were protests, corruption kills. This was after a nightclub uh, burned because they didn't follow the safety regulations. And more recently, there was a case that uh, a company uh, supplied uh, uh, diluted uh, disinfectants to hospitals and because of this many people died. So it's, it's, it's very serious and, and Romanians are very upset and they have a huge anti-corruption program. Uh, the problem with measuring corruption is that it's, it's, it's very difficult and we normally do this through uh, opinion perception based surveys. Yeah? But perception is, is different from reality. So we have invested in, in some research. There's a project called Anticorp. It's, it's, it's very good. It's with the uh, Herti School of Governance. And the leader of this is Alina Munju Pipidi. And she tried to put an index, an assessment of corruption that is actually evidence-based. She works with, um, mainly with procurement data. And she has a very cool uh, uh, assessment. She, can show, she showed, this is a, in an actual country, how um, you know, winning in, in public tenders changed over time as the government changed. So she took two uh, construction companies that are extremely similar, you know, they, they would be very level. So the normal behaviors you would expect that they would uh, win equal amount of contracts, more or less. But she showed that when one government was in power, the orange company won almost all the contracts, and as the government changed, the other one picked up a lot. So these kind of games, um, are interesting and then they, they create an opportunity to then dig further to see um, what, what is going wrong here. Yeah. So we, we really try to also you know, improve uh, evidence base and, and understand uh, problems. Now further on, on corruption, there's the, the sort of famous corruption formula, you know, it's the, the, the opportunity for corruption in terms of the discretionary power and, and the, you know, the control over public resources minus the constraints is sort of the risk of, of corruption. And practically with the toolbox, my time is up, <laughs> but, but I'm sure you want to, you want to uh, hear the rest of the story. Um, we were quite upset when we were programming. So the commission has quite a lot of control over the programs because there's a real dialogue and a negotiation. We were upset because in countries that were supposed to tackle corruption, they said, oh, we do some training, we do anti-corruption training, and then we do a bit of whistleblower, this, and when we, we spend lots of money on, on these anti-corruption agencies. And then we, we looked, we said, okay, anti-corruption agencies, does that make a difference? And for example, Nigeria, which allegedly is quite a corrupt country, they have 16 anti-corruption agencies. So we, we came up in, in the context of the toolbox with sort of a wider framework you know, which, first of all, you start by creating an integrity framework, you know, do you have codes of ethics and, and also then to develop risk-based strategies and so on and, and focus on, you know, you need to rebuild public trust by, by being more open, you know, publish all your data, publish your procurement data and, and create better accountability. So we, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying you shouldn't have anti-corruption agencies, but it's, it's very much about how they work and the quality of the work rather than just having it. So, so these are the kind of uh, uh, debates we, we want to stimulate in the context of the toolbox. I will stop now. Maybe just, just a small bit. Uh, I, I think this is nice, and I, I think you can all identify with this. Um, we tend to, to work a lot in silos. We definitely do in the commission. 
We try to improve now, so we, I put this because I think we're sort of dancing between the silos. We have more and more collaboration. But in the future, I think administrations have to learn to work like a Formula One team, you know, where everybody knows their place, but you still work on the same thing as a partner. And if you want to, to really uh, take this series, I recommend a book by Jillian Ted called The Silo Effect. And it shows how, how, um, how much we kill our efficiency and effectiveness by, by silo mentality. You know? And the silos are not just in the institutions where we work, but the silos are very much in our head. So uh, modern, you know, complex and wicked problems need modern and complex um, approaches to solving them. What is also, just last point, sorry. sorry. Uh, you know, uh, this is not Michael, by the way. Uh, the, 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 I, I think what is very important that if you want, you know, good, competent public administrations, we also need to have, be an attractive employer. So how do you recruit your talent in the future? It's, I think, very important. We focus very much on, on this. And uh, uh, read the toolbox, uh, you, will, you will see about this. I will not talk about service delivery. Um, I will not talk, huh? and I will not talk about uh, rule of law. That's also cool. If you have, you can ask a question. I'll show you this later. And uh, but I'll finish now. Read the toolbox. We'll talk about it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Florian. Just um, you can see that uh, you get to the end of the accession process, and. Uh, uh, that's the, that's not the beginning of the end, it's the end of the beginning. And um, so that's uh, an interesting insight. On the thing of silos, yeah, and uh, inside the commission you were talking about this and the commission is a large public administration, uh, we have this, but this has improved enormously. I've really been impressed, I think, over the last 10 years. Uh, I've never experienced so much interaction, formal, informal, between uh, di different commission services. I, I mean, I think it's a bit of a law of public administration of, of, of the silo effect. We've done a lot, I think, to um, um, uh, uh, remove this uh, phenomenon, but I think obviously for all public administrations, I think it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important topic because a lot of the things we're doing, they're very, very interrelated. I know when I did pre-accession assistance myself, uh, we could we could see this so I want to move on and so I'm going to give the floor now to Mari Evans um, I already said something about her and she's working uh, she's representing Scotland actually at the Congress of local and regional authorities at the Council of Europe and she's working on good governance there capacity building community empowerment and engagement with uh, youth local organizations I see that's also one of your strong points uh, so uh, we're very much uh, looking forward to hear what you're going to say about uh, our topic on uh, good governance. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, and it is a real pleasure to be here today on behalf of the President of the Congress of Local and Regional Authorities, Jean-Claude Fracon. Um, yeah, I know that there was a lot of talk earlier in the day about football. Thankfully, being from Scotland, I don't have to worry too much about that. Um, our team doesn't seem to do very well, but, uh, and hopefully, I'd, but one thing that, is, that we've mentioned earlier today is about the EU referendum, so I hope that I come in here tomorrow uh, with a smile on my face because the UK UK has voted to remain, uh, just in case you were wondering which side of the debate I was on on that. But I really just want to start by sharing with you my conviction of the added value of decentralisation and local democracy for public administration. Local democracy is a fundamental condition for a well-functioning democracy because democracy involves giving a voice and giving a choice to the people and this requires an efficient, transparent an accountable public administration at local level. Local democracy and public administration are interdependent. Without the values of a genuine democracy, no efficient, responsive and accountable public administration is possible and vice versa. An efficient public administration is essential for local and regional governments to be able to respond to the needs of citizens, to provide public services, to prevent corruption and to foster economic growth. Decentralisation can provide answers to many of the challenges that we are currently facing in Europe, such as the, the refugee crisis and the increase of extremist violence. 
because local and regional, regional democracy operate, operates at the grassroots level. Uh, that's the level closest to the citizens and therefore is able to respond quickly uh, and rapidly to new social developments. But in order to do that, local and regional authorities need to have the freedom, the powers and the competences to make decisions for themselves. Part of the mission of the Congress is to provide, through the European Charter of Local Self-Governance, a legal framework in which there is a clear definition of competences for each level of government, with the principle of subsidiarity being firmly entrenched. Local autonomy does not just mean more democracy. Local authorities are also responsible for promoting and stimulating economic growth and development. Local and regional governments can create public-private partnerships for the provision of services, works and supplies. But when we look over the past decade, we've seen some progress in modernising local public administrations in order to comply with good governance standards, such as transparency, accountability, effectiveness, responsibility and participation and human rights, and to improve the efficiency and quality of public services. In order to contribute to public administration reform, new forms of local governance are appearing and redefining the relationships that local and regional authorities have with national governments, civil society groups, businesses and citizens. We're seeing a shift in local and regional authorities from decision-making processes by one central actor in a vertical and institutionalised way to decision-making processes in a more flexible and mixed way. This comprises both vertical relationships with the central government and horizontally with other public authorities and the inclusion of businesses, civil society and voluntary bodies. Local authorities are no longer just seen as another tier of government. Local governments are increasingly fostering dynamic partnerships with civil society and the private sector in order to improve the quality of public service delivery, enhance the social responsibilities and ensure that the broad participation of citizens in decision making. This movement to wider forms of governance, which frequently has local or regional governments at the centre, takes many shapes, forms and degrees of intensity across the Council of Europe member states. It's important that in this shift from government to governance, we do not forget to maintain the values of good governance. Without good standards of openness, responsibility, participation, responsiveness and human rights, without a healthy exchange with the public, our local and regional governments will be quite unable to meet the needs of their citizens. In new local governance structures, such as in metropolitan areas, local and regional authorities are increasingly finding that they do not take all the decisions or provide all public services on their own. Instead, they are creating contracts and partnerships between the national government, other municipalities, civil society, private bodies, and also with other citizens in order to jointly find solutions to solve the social problems that are shared among the several tiers of government. Cooperation between municipalities and other actors can be a useful instrument to avoid a re-centralisation of powers and service provision and to identify efficient solutions to social problems. There are, however, two sides to these new government, governance arrangements. When you look at first glance, taking an optimistic perspective, the involvement of civil society and market interest can increase democratic decision making, with decisions being reached in a deliberative way through negotiation and compromises between participating actors. But others taking a more pessimistic view would argue that the inclusion of unelected representatives and private bodies in the decision making process is endangering and eroding local democracy in our cities and metropolitan areas. Non-state actors in civil society do not have the same democratic accountability and legitimacy. Therefore, in the development of new and wider forms of governance, it's essential that local authorities continue to guarantee the values of good governance and take into account the consequences of these developments for the democratic health of their towns and cities. Technology can help us here. Developments in e-democracy and e-governance are flagging up exciting new ways for citizens to participate actively in deliberation processes and to be able to hold public authorities to account. 
Another development in local governance is the introduction of performance management at the local level, which has been progressively expanding across Europe. Performance management challenges local authorities to demonstrate how they are improving services in terms of efficiency and productivity and the impact of the services upon the lives of citizens. It is a tool to improve the quality of public services, to help improve decisions and to be more accountable to citizens for the delivery of better local public services. In order to achieve efficient and high quality of services, Local and regional governments are increasingly outsourcing their services to private bodies to establish access to better expertise and resources. Now, the benefit of public procurement, the purchase of works, goods and services from private bodies by local and regional authorities, is that it can generate business opportunities, drive economic growth and create more jobs in the local community. Public procurement accounts for a large and growing share of public spending across Europe. And although public procurement is a great opportunity for local governments to serve and stimulate economic growth and development, I'd like to point out the risk of corruption in this sphere. Decentralisation may restrain the risk of corruption by making elected representatives more accountable to the citizens that they serve. However, there can be greater opportunities and fewer obstacles to the prevention of corruption at the local level, especially where public administrations are weak. Local authorities often have less developed independent auditing functions and lack contracting expertise. Outsourcing of public services also has an impact on accountability. Usually when local authorities outsource their services, they remain responsible for monitoring the contractors. However, in practice, local government doesn't always have the capacity or the expertise to fulfill this function effectively. Outsourcing can also be less of a choice for local authorities because some are forced down this road because of budget pressures. Transparency is a key mechanism in combating corruption in public procurement and enhancing the integrity of stakeholders. Therefore, the Congress recommends that local and regional authorities create transparent procurement policies and regulation in order to minimise the risk of corruption and maximise the chance that the economic, social and environmental political benefits of regional and local, local public procurement are realised. Citizens do not only have a right to, to good public administration, they also need to have the right to be involved in the decision-making process. The participation of citizens is not just about improving public services, citizens can also find a role as partners in the delivery of services. Technology can help us here. We are seeing some exciting developments in e-governance applications that can increase the participation of citizens through providing information, consultation and deliberation in the decision-making process. These are really changing the relationship between local government and their citizen and civic groups from a one-way to a two-way conversation. Unfortunately, we do still have some countries where this communication is very much one-sided and a monologue rather than a conversation with only some information about the local authority, with varying degrees of scope and detail being made available to the public. The Congress of Local and Regional Authorities is promoting the benefits of e-governance and encouraging local and regional authorities to go beyond the information stage by the release of public open data. The release of local open data can be an essential component in enabling good governance in local democracy. Open data offers greater transparency, accountability and possibilities to empower citizens to contribute to the decision-making process. It can also be a preventative tool in the fight of corruption by providing data on governmental expenditures and performances. As I said before, the local level requires an efficient, responsive, transparent and accountable public administration in order to respond quickly and adequately to the needs of the citizen and public administrations need to adapt the values of local democracy in order to be responsive to their citizens. Different forms of governance are developing to provide local uh, democracies with strong and accountable public administration. However, significant challenges such as centralisation, recentralisation, corruption and fraudulent practices remain in some of the Council of Europe member states. The Congress wishes to counteract these risks and is working to improve local self-governance 
strengthen the capacities of local authorities, ethical and transparent decision making through regularly monitoring the implementation of the ratified articles of the European Charter of Local Self-Government by Member States, the actual situations at the local and regional level and the organisation of cooperation activities. As well as its monitoring and observation activities, the Congress is also involved in cooper cooperation activities. It organises activities in specific member states with a view to enhancing the institutional capacities of local authorities, also looking to foster dialogue between central, local and regional authorities, increasing the dialogue with citizens and assisting in the implementation of its standards. Our focus today is on creating a virtuous circle monitoring of monitoring, post-monitoring and cooperation activities. Currently, we have cooperation activities ongoing in Albania, Armenia and the Ukraine, where we are running a range of seminars and workshops to promote ethical governance and strengthen the institutional and leadership capacities of local elected authorities. And I was fortunate enough to be able to take part in a number of these workshops across the Ukraine. Last year, we carried out a monitoring visit in Mon Montenegro. This year, we carried out a monitoring visit in Croatia and a fact-finding mission in Albania. In April, a delegation of the Congress observed the local and provincial elections in Serbia. Kosovo has also expressed an interest in cooperating with the Congress, notably in the field of election observation and awareness raising of the principles of the European Charter of Local Self-Government. We see these activities as a contribution to helping the Western Balkans implement the European standards of local democracy, which both the European Union and the Council of Europe share. We're pleased to see that most national governments are taking into account and following our recommendations. I would just say to conclude that the new developments in local governance do bring with them their own challenges. The increasing involvement of unelected private actors and civil society in the decision-making process raises important issues of accountability. Some local authorities question whether these developments are beneficial for effective decentralised democracy and accountability or whether they constitute a threat to it. Many intermunicipal cooperation programmes and other forms of cooperation between local government and other actors in delivering services increasingly involve non-elected members who are not accountable to citizens. This can increase the risk of corruption and creates a lack of transparency. Local elected representatives need to seize the opportunities and challenges that these developments represent for local governance, while ensuring that the democratic base of their towns and cities is not eroded. The Congress is convinced that these changes in local governance have great potential to improve local and regional democracy. If implemented with due respect for the principles and conditions of the European Charter for Local Self-Governance, they will serve to strengthen local and regional democracy. By using a variety of new innovative forms of governance and increasing the involvement of citizens, the local and regional level can contribute positively to public administration reform. The new movements in the field of governance are bringing many opportunities for local and regional governments to offer better public services and more tailored and respons uh, responsive policies to the developments in our society. And that, I hope you'll agree, is what we should be, all be aiming for. Thank you. Well, thanks very much. I think that was, uh, I think at the same time, a very inspiring but also a sanguine and realistic uh, overview of the situation. I was very impressed you were talking at the beginning about the, the links between decentralization and economic development, which of course is something we're very keen on in, in, in regional policy, that's at the heart of what we do. And also this partnership principle, which is also a very key partnership uh, principle we have of the way we do things, bringing in, it's not only the public administration, of course we're focusing on here, but civil society, business, social partners, etc., etc. That's That's the inspiring part, but you're presenting the realistic part also, I think, with the risks and the opportunities which are, which are attached to this. So I think this is, I'm sure, will be an inspiration for our discussion um, a little later. But we'll now move to uh, our third speaker. Um, so, Aaron Tubida, um, you have a pre PowerPoint presentation? Yeah, yeah. okay. So, um, I mentioned that um, um, he's been working on uh, basically economic transformation processes in Southeast Europe um, and uh, he's been in 
involved in very many um, think tanks in Turkey. He's been working as a senior political advisor also at the Regional Cooperation Council recently. So uh, I think he will have some inspiring thoughts from his geographical area as well. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm really happy to be here with you today. It's not my topic that I understand, but I understand the importance of the topic. Uh, here, uh, what I'm going to do is to present some findings of uh, Balkan Barometer 2016, which are related to the uh, topic of today's discussion. First of all, allow me to introduce uh, the concept of Balkan bar Barometer. Why do we need it? Why we started it, producing it? Uh, as many of you already know, in November 2013, <coughs> seven ministries of economy of Western Balkans uh, adopted the strategy C2020 strategy for jobs and prosperity in European perspective. We are in third year of its implementation. Of course, we're not only implementing it, but we are also trying to monitor the implementation of process of C2020 strategy. As part of the monitoring system, we started with, uh, pro, pro, with uh, a Balkan Barometer uh, NL tool for, uh, for monitoring of implementation. What we are trying to do, it's only one of the tools for monitoring of implementation of strategy. And what we are trying to do is to uh, see how uh, people, uh, what, what, uh, what are attitudes and sentiments towards many of issues covered by C2020 strategy or how the results of implementation of C2020 strategy are felt on the ground somehow. Uh, I would encourage you to see, to go to RCC website where you can find both reports, also the previous issue from the previous year. Uh, Balkan Barometer has two components because it's, it rounds up uh, views uh, of two groups. It is uh, general public plus business people. So we have a business opinion survey and public opinion survey, both of reports and their data sets are reachable from a uh, uh, website of the RCC. Uh, of course, there are a lot of things uh, for introducing this. I do not have time for that. For a methodological note, you can see from the uh, annex of the reports. Uh, here I would like to say only that uh, same methodology used by barometer is also implied in a Balkan barometer, by Eurobarometer. It's same here in the Balkan barometer. Um, it is also important to note that uh, we had uh, that public opinion survey was conducted among uh, 1,000 uh, uh, respondents in each economy. We are avoiding using terms country. Instead of it in RC, we are using term economy because of status of Kosovo. So when I say economy, I'm thinking on uh, countries in the region. Uh, and for business opinion survey, this survey has been conducted on uh, 20 companies for each economy again. What is new in this barometer was that we have included Moldova in uh, other than Western Balkan countries uh, in both uh, components of Balkan barometer and Slovenia only in the business uh, component. Our intention is to check for the similarities and uh, differences among these economies and bring eventually their markets closer to each other and uh, our SG already uh, announced two days before when we had a launch event of Balkan Barometer 2016 in Sarajevo, so it is totally new still. Uh, he announced that next year we will include also Turkey uh, within uh, research of Balkan Barometer. Uh, I will be short. I, I tried to keep slides uh, as short as possible, as simple as possible. I, I tried to combine some slides uh, in order to have uh, uh, to use to my time in the best way, but still I would like to start with this uh, graph. Uh, what do you think are the two most important problems facing your economy? Uh, RCC Secretary General Goran Svilanovic already uh, cited uh, the, an the answers of this question this morning in his introductory remarks. And what you can see from this graph is uh, that I found it very interesting, by the way, is that um, people from Southeast Europe, uh, for them the biggest issue is uh, unemployment and economic situation. 68% uh, of uh, respondents cited unemployment as the bi first biggest issue of the region and 55% uh, 
uh, said that economic situation is the f uh, second biggest issue in the region. What was interesting here is that corruption uh, has uh, became uh, perceived as big, biggest uh, third issue in the region. Uh, it is 27 percent of those who opted for this uh, respond, and uh, last year it was only 14 percent, and it is an increase of 15 points uh, or 13 points in this regard. Uh, what you can see from this graph also, it's very interesting that issues like security, uh, climate change, problems with minorities, border issues, and refugees are not perceived as big issues of Southeast Europe. Uh, for example, uh, in EU, what Eurobarometer shows to us, uh, migration issues is one of the most important, most challenging issues. In the Balkan barometer, uh, we saw that only 4% of Southeast European population perceives uh, migrations as a big issue. Of course, uh, when we say them, when we ask them, uh, would you like for migrants to come and work in your place of living? Situation is totally different. Uh, only 11% uh, see something good for migrants to come and live in their uh, countries, in their economies. So. Uh, what the Balkan Barometer says is that migrants are welcome to, to uh, pass by through the region, but not to stay. So, as I said, these big issues that are constantly on media, uh, security issues, border issues, migration issues, are not actually issues uh, for our citizens. Here I, I've tried to combine a few graphs, and it's about uh, the satisfaction with public services. As you can see, the options are transparency of public services, treatment of citizens in public se sector, time uh, needed for obtaining public services, again, time needed for getting information in public sector, and price of public services. Unfor unfortunately, satisfaction uh, with public services is very low, and compared to previous uh, survey, we have a small increase in ratings, as you can see in 2016 in, in the... Uh, uh, new barometer, there is some uh, improvement. The only price of public services remain to change, but still, if you take into consideration that these uh, scores are on the scale of one to five, where one means very poor and five excellent, this indicates that uh, uh, Southeast European citizens are below the average when it comes to satisfaction with public services. Here again, I have combined four questions in order to use my time in the best way. Uh, and uh, it's about, do you agree that the administrative procedures in public institutions are efficient? And other uh, uh, three questions which are actually related to uh, <coughs> rule of law. And what we see here from this graph is that 83% disagree with the statement that the law is applied to everyone equally. 78% disagree with the statement that the judicial system is independent from political influence, and 75% disagree with the statement that the law is applied and enforced effectively. The best score in this graph goes to the administrative procedures in the public institutions, uh, where 37% of C population believes that administrative procedures in public institutions are efficient. Uh, when we asked our citizens, do you have confidence in the courts and judiciary? As you can see from the graph, uh, the worst situation is in Albania and best in Montenegro. But still, uh, if you look to the uh, average for Southeast Europe, then you will see that only 25% have confidence but among them, only 3% have full confidence in the judiciary and the legal system. And previous year, uh, in previous survey, 27% uh, had uh, this confidence. Now it is 25. That means that in this parameter, we have slightly worse situation related to this question. By the way, I forgot to say that the small letter P at the beginning of questions indicates to public opinion survey. Later, I will start with B, business opinion survey. Uh, do you have confidence, oh, what is the, what's the next one? 
Do you think that giving and taking of bribes and abuse of position and power for personal gain are widespread among any of the following? And we are now mentioning, listing here, you can see many institutions uh, uh, which can be somehow uh, related to giving and taking of bribes, abusing of po uh, position. And what uh, citizens told to us is that giving and or taking of bribes and the abuse of power is the most widespread among politicians at national level. 32% of uh, population gave this answer. At local level, again, politi politicians at local level, 22%. And among people working in health sector, 26%. Here we, we were asking them to give to us two answers. And this is the result. So uh, politicians, both national and local level, plus health sector are worse considered when it comes to giving and taking the bribes. And they are followed by 18% by police and people working in judicial services. Do you agree that your government fights effectively against corruption? Uh, the majority of the sea population do not consider that their government effectively fights corruption. It is 73% of them that uh, do not agree with this statement. Uh, this is really a bad indicator, but uh, I try to, I've tried to compare this with the situation in the EU. In the EU, uh, 28 EU, countries, we have a situation that 64% of population, 64% of population yes, do not consider that their government effectively fights corruption. So this is not something specific to Southeast Europe. It is worse in Southeast Europe, but still one of the common uh, European problems. Uh, we, have tr we have tried to ask also uh, South East European citizens to check whether they are doing something that could affect the government decisions. And what we saw is that uh, there is a big lack of active involvement. As you can see from this graph, 26% of entire population do not even discuss the government decisions, while 33% discuss only with people they know, not publicly. Only 6% of them protested, 4% of them commented the government's decision on social networks and 3% participated in a public debate. And when we ask them why you are not uh, actively involved, involved in the government decision, uh, those who are not involved, 50% uh, of them uh, shares the opinion that an individual cannot influence government decision. 22% of them uh, didn't want to be publicly exposed and 21% of them do not care about government decisions. Now, a few questions from Business Barometer, and I will be, be shortly uh, uh, over. Uh, the question, how much do you feel that government takes into account the concerns of businesses? Here we can see that half of population in Southeast European level, again pictured, is li little bit relatively different and you look uh, by economists, by, but uh, on the sea level, uh, almost half of sea uh, companies agree that government take, takes care of businesses uh, to some degree. Uh, but 38% uh, thinks that government pays no attention at all to their businesses. We have a lot of similar questions or sub-questions related to this topic. I couldn't bring everything here. Uh, but if you look to that, then uh, you will come to conclusion that uh, business people consider that governments are not enough uh, supportive for their businesses. Two agreements with the statement that I would like to s share with you, three of them. The first one is, uh, do you agree that information on laws and regulations affecting my firm is easy to, uh, is your firm is easy to obtain? Again, uh, scores are on the scale of one to five, where one means completely disagree and five strongly agree. Business leaders in Southeast Europe region can get information on laws and regulations relevant for their company more easily than they did last year. This year, the average is 3.6, still far away of uh, 
strongly agree of uh, uh, best score, uh, but uh, better than last year when uh, the uh, score was 3.4. So we have uh, a slight improvement related to this indicator. Uh, again, uh, agreement with the statement. Uh, do we agree that interpretations of laws and regulations affecting your firm are consistent and predictable? Compared with the previous survey, the average score was 2.9 in previous survey. Business people in the region are more satisfied with the predictability and consistency of interpretations of relevant laws and regulations. The average score in this business barometer is 3.1. So these are some uh, surprising sides of uh, Balkan Barometer 2006, at least uh, when it comes to the questions related to good governance at business part, we have still very uh, depressed situation, but uh, somehow a uh, small improvement uh, compared to the last year. And the last slide that I would like to share with you is that uh, agreement with the statement, it is common for firms in my line of business to have to pay some irregular or additional payments gifts to get things done. Uh, for this question, uh, compared to last year again, a significantly greater number of business people in Southeast Europe region is certain of existence of regular additional payments or gifts to get things done. The average score is 2.6 for Southeast Europe compared to 2003, 2.3 uh, in previous surveys. So uh, in this case, uh, uh, we do not have a good situation. So these are some indicators that I wanted to share with you. As I said uh, in uh, reports that you can download, uh, including their data sets from RCC website, you can find more detailed information related to all these questions. You can compare uh, all economies uh, to see uh, how they stand in these uh, questions. Uh, but if you take these questions only into consideration, I think it's very easy to conclude, as RC Secretary General Mr. Svilanovic uh, sta already stated this morning, that credibility of public institution is low, corruption is seen to be quite widespread, and the business environment is not enough uh, uh, supportive. So this is uh, some concluding remarks for this part uh, of Balkan Barometer. Thank you. Thanks very much. I said the previous speaker was pointing to some of the risk and the, uh, and the opportunities. And you're, I think and we're, this morning we were talking about the need for empirical evidence um, indicators. So I think you've really brought together, I think, quantifying a little bit uh, more than a little bit, I think, the, the things that we were just hearing about. Uh, so thank you, thank you very, very much for this. So Thomas, you're now the last speaker in, the, um, um, in this panel. Um, and um, Thomas has been working for many years, as I said earlier, in public administration reform, decentralization, and local governments. And he's going to talk, I think, about the, the Danube Government Hub and Common Assessment Framework. So Thomas, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I also take my mobile phone, but I, I don't have a timer. I'm not able to do that, <laughs> but I'll try to be uh, on time. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I want to link to Florian's uh, presentation uh, because I have uh, one tool which I would like to present, which is the Common Assessment Framework, um, which is part also of the toolbox of, um, of um, uh, the public administration in public administration reform, um, because I think it's a good tool um, yeah, for public administration uh, development, and uh, it's a European tool, and furthermore, I am from the Austrian CAF Center, so Katie said my office is also the Austrian CAF Center, which is Common Assessment Framework, and that's why I would present it and, and have some ideas about, about it. I think my vision is that CAF could be used more for public administration reform issues in the European Union and also in uh, the uh, in the candidate in the candidate uh, countries, it's a European guideline for public uh, for public governance. Um, it stands CAF stands for Common Assessment Framework. It's the quality management system uh, for the public sector in the European Union. It is existing. It is here. 
it is well developed, it is a common work of uh, experts and, and civil servants of uh, um, uh, European countries, member states, non-member states, together also with, uh, with, uh, with the European Institute of, um, of Public Administration. Um, so it's a European model for public administration reform. Simply, it's a questionnaire. Um, it's a questionnaire based on standards which have been developed by uh, the member states and or the, 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 the European, selected European states, not all the member states are participating, um, uh, of how a good public administration or how a good public sector organization should function. That's it. Um, and so it combines many things which have already been, uh, been said, leadership, uh, public, uh, public finances, uh, accountability. Um, you have it in there and you have it as a kind of questionnaire, questionnaire which can be used by each public sector organization. Of course, it's not the big strategy uh, approach because it is a, it is a, it is a tool. Uh, it is a tool used by a ministry, by a local government, by, by a regional government, by a department, whatever. Um, uh, to further develop, uh, to further improve uh, the own organization. So it's a European model, it's an overall check of the organization, it leads to improvements, um, it's, it's kind of self-assessment with this questionnaire, um, and in my view one strength beside the European standards is that it is also involving the staff. So it has also a kind of, which has been discussed or mentioned before, the question of how do we get good leaders, uh, how do we good how do we get good leadership uh, are the right people are the right persons in the right places um, in many cases you can say no but with this tool you can try to get to enable the the staff to, to enable the leadership uh, to be a good leadership and to work in the direction of um, of good uh, of good governance so our understanding of the system is that it is the european guideline for excellent public management uh, and excellent public organizations. So there is a, there is a system, there is a tool already, um, already existing. Uh, it is public sector reform, that's, or public administration, uh, public, administri uh, uh, public administration reform. And as I said, it is already existing and it is a model which has been, which has been improved. It is existing since the year 2000, around the year 2000, the last version, it is also under development um, because I'm talking about European standards and the European standard in the year 2000, for example, on participation, um, on citizen involvement, uh, or also on transparency, uh, open data has been mentioned, uh, was not the big issue in the year 2000, but meanwhile it is the big issue. So it is also a system which is an instrument which is, uh, which is always further developed together with the with the experts from the public administration, um, so those who are working on the uh, on the field, those who really have to implement then uh, administration reforms, yes, and it is the initiator of change in the sense of initiating improvement uh, process. Uh, just quickly to the to the model, as I said, it's a questionnaire. It's to about 200, 200 questions. Within these questions, you have the European standards. I would, I would like to mention, I would like to call them like that. I mean, officially they are not called like that. They are not called European standards or European values. But when you read it very intensively, then you see that they are inside. Transparency, a good, a good leadership, uh, open budget uh, and, and, uh, and, and sustainable and sustainable budget, human resource management based on, on, uh, on development. Uh, and what is it about? It is all about getting better results achieving excellence results. And these results have to be measured. Um, and then we are again, at, then we link to what we have been uh, explained or discussed before, evidence-based management. Indicators, this is, 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 is of course inside uh, this, uh, this instrument because when you have to want, because when you want to have good results, for example, key performance results, how fast is in permission being done, then you have to measure this result. And when you measure this result, you're in, on the way to evidence-based evidence -based management. So this is, this is inside, this is inside, but it is a kind of guideline how to get, uh, how to get there. 
So it's about achieving results in the, the key performance results and the human resources or the people results, the citizen and customer results, and also on the social uh, responsibility. Uh, how it gets to these results in uh, having an overview of what the organization does and how the organization uh, works. It's first the leadership, very important one, how to get the good, the good, the good stuff. It's again the human resources. It's a strategy, planning, we heard it already, of course. It's the resources, the budget, also partnerships, and it's the processes. So it's a model, it's an existing model, it's a model of quality management, including, um, including the, uh, the values. Just, uh, just briefly, in countries, in the European countries, uh, 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 contributing or participating in, in, in CAF, the, we, have a, we, have a, we have a structure. This structure is, of course, connected to the European Union via the IPSG group, the Innovative Public uh, Service uh, Service Group, working together, of course, also with the with IPER, and then in the single countries, for example, in Austria, it's the Federal Chancery. There is a so-called national correspondent responsible for the strategy, and in the best case, there is also a CAF center, a national CAF center, uh, which in our case is um, is the KDZ Center for Public Administration Research for implementing. Uh, implementing the strategy. So, so that's how it is connected to the, uh, to the European level. And from top down or bottom up, you always have the discussions, you always have the further developments, the discussion of what has changed maybe in the approach of public administration, what is the new, um, what are the new standards which have been, which have to be uh, implemented. The Austrian CAF Center is founded in the year 2000 and when we talk so when we talk about it has been mentioned before that from from the, the uh, from the city councillor um, of Vienna to to get into the direction of a Danube governance hub we see for example one instrument for this Danube governance hub where uh, Vienna and the uh, and the city of Vienna uh, wants to support or network more intensively on public administration and good governance, uh, then CAF as one instrument is for us a very, uh, very important one. Why using, just read it quickly, you get better services. We know that from many, from questionnaires, we, we know that from measurements, from evidence-based, uh, evidence based We get improvement of the organizations. We have, uh, we have a recent, uh, recent uh, survey done in, in Austria where we see that 70% of those who are using it have better services afterwards, the organization, not the country, of course. Uh, it has better communication skills internally and knowledge management, up to 70%. Uh, and um, better processes and services, that's what we want, that's what we need in the end uh, from public administration, uh, public administration reforms. We have a European lab labor, uh, which uh, comes with the, with the CAF, so you can get the stamp and the sign for being an excellent uh, European organization uh, based on uh, the, the CAF and based on the uh, on excellence criteria. It's tailor-made for the public sector and it's, a, as I already mentioned, a quick check of the, uh, of, the, of the organization. In Austria, we have 220 CAF users. Uh, I'm not so happy with it because there could be more. We have much more organization, public sector organizations using, uh, in Austria, so could be uh, a, higher, a higher number, but nevertheless, we are compared to other European countries quite far. In total, this is in the database from IPA, uh, we have about 4,000 CAF, uh, CAF organizations in Europe, which is, which is quite a number. I mean, not all of them are really intensively working on it, but they are interested and uh, have registered and, 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 and deal, with the, deal with the topic. So it's a power already. It's a power from the Spanish municipality to the Austrian uh, uh, Austrian, um, Austrian ministry, and I'm not sure, but I have seen already in the, in the morning the national correspondent of uh, Slovakia. Um, we will have in, uh, in, in Bratislava in November also a European uh, CAF uh, conference done by our friends from, from Slovakia. Uh, we tried to set up a cooperation with uh, RESPA. We did it uh, already. We had some. Uh, we had some first workshops about uh, about this topic. We know that CAF is not something which is just going on in uh, European Union countries. There are activities in in, in, in Macedonia 
uh, also first in, in, in Bosnia, Herzegovina, also in, in Serbia. Maybe more, I don't, I heard now Albania, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm not so aware of it, but it's not, uh, there, is, uh, there is already, many countries see the added value, and I think it should be connected more to public administration reform as efforts in, uh, in the region. We want to use it as basis for the, for the Danube Governance Hub, just to give you a short impression on the, let's see, as, as, uh, as, as a result of the conference, we want to go together with the PA10 uh, from, the, from the Danube strategy. Um, the, the governance, let's say the governance part of the Danube, uh, the Danube strategy run by Vienna and, and, and Slovenia. Uh, we want to foster increase our, our work with, uh, on, on, uh, uh, in, uh, in the sense of public administration reform, starting with these CAF ideas, for example, with the Danube uh, Danube Governance Hub, more networking, more being open for uh, for um, for discussions, for further developments, contributing to the efforts in public administration reforms, promoting the knowledge, uh, the knowledge exchange, uh, achieving achieving synergies, and uh, draw attention to the importance what we had already also today that there is also not just the national level concerned by public administration reform, but also. Uh, the local level and also the, and the regional level, and we want to foster European standards in this discussion. That's what we really want, and we see, uh, based on the principles of public administration reform, based on the toolbox which is already existing, also with CAF, that's my, my, my heart, that there are already these standards and we have to bring them uh, furthermore into the discussion. It's also, the, when I see the, the, the cases of EPSA, I also see them as a, stand, as, a, as a kind of standard already uh, for good public uh, administration reform. In total, we want to contribute to the European integration process with this um, in the Danube region because we think that this is uh, really uh, worth to do. So, thank you very much. This was my short introduction. Thanks very much, Thomas. That's a, that's a very interesting and promising uh, tool. Uh, promising, you say 4,000 users Europe-wide, this, 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 this sounds encouraging. And uh, I think you also brought the discussion back to the starting point we were this morning with the Danube, the Danube strategy, and that's a possibility, I think, for, for linkage up here. So anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've had four excellent uh, uh, presentations here the, the, this afternoon in this session. So now I'd like to open up the time for, remaining time for discussion from the floor. Uh, and indeed, I had to cut you off just before lunch, so uh, the lady in the second row has the, uh, has the chance to come in first. There we are. Thank you. Yeah, it's a different question, but uh, yeah, of course. Uh, I was just uh, uh, curious, uh, uh, and this is a question for Florian. Um, what are the possibilities, and uh, is there already some thinking in how the principles of public administration, which are the framework for the candidate countries, can be linked up and somehow how continuity can be created towards the toolbox for quality public administration, which is sort of the toolbox and the framework which is being developed for the EU member states. I understand that there is quite some complementarity there, but the, the, the approaches are somehow different. So I'm wondering if, uh, if uh, there is some thinking already going on as to how, for example, Serbia is, is a, uh, an aspiring EU member state which is now striving to and will be striving in the coming years to uh, comply with all the principles of public administration. Um, how that links up with the, the, with the use of the, of the toolbox and is there space already for the, for the candidate states to apply the toolbox in their national contexts, informing their national uh, strategies of public administration reform or in any other way. So how do you see and where do you see the use of the toolbox already for the candidate states, for the candidate countries? Yes, thank you for, for this good question. Uh, we work very closely with uh, Bernard and, and colleagues and uh, I, you know, because as I said, the, the toolbox is not a prescriptive thing, it's good practices, you know, we refrain from calling it best practice because the practice is not necessarily transferable. Just to give you an example, uh, one of the, the rising stars in public administration is Estonia. Yeah, they're very strong, especially on the government. 
And uh, we always quote it as an example. Uh, for example, they implemented something called the once-only principle. I don't know whether you're familiar with the concept. It means if you as a private individual or as a business give your, your personal data to the government, you never have to give it again if you need another service because the, the government will exchange the data within different services. This is very popular, but in, we cannot say you know, we cannot recommend that everybody should do this because, for example, in Germany, this would be against the Constitution because they have a lot of you know, limitations on, on data exchange. So even though this is very good and it's saved a lot of money, it's, it's difficult to, to transfer things. So we always respect the different cultures and traditions. On the other hand, the principles and recommendations, they are fairly universal, you know, uh, and I think they were repeated many times. And it's, it's up to you to to, to look at the toolbox, what you can use from it. I always say the toolbox is like a cookbook. You check which, which recipe suits you, and you can just be inspired by that and, and follow that. And uh, if you want, we can discuss with, uh, with uh, Bernard and, and colleagues to discuss it in, in a workshop with, with uh, colleagues from the Serbian government, what is suitable and, and, and so on. So in, in, in this sense, the toolbox is really for everybody, yeah? and if, if something is whatever, maybe it's too advanced for you, doesn't fit, you leave it aside and you choose what, what suits you. Yeah. Uh, and and on, the, on the principles of, of public administration, as I said, we, uh, we treat this topic very carefully because our, our mandate is limited. If you don't have a legal basis, we cannot push very much. But uh, if there is, I, I think there's now in increasing awareness and increasing support also from the member states. In fact, I have in the drawer uh, uh, something that would align the approach to principles of public administration also in the member states. But we have to see whether uh, the colleagues and the hierarchies in the, in the commission agree with this and indeed whether they, the member states accept it. However, we note that in the European semester the topic is becoming more prominent and it also has been agreed that we want to have a, a more rigorous and more systematic assessment of the topic in the European semester. And what, you know, the approach of the, of the Sigma assessment on the basis of the principles is in fact the, the more or less the equivalent we have it in the European semester. Only in the European semester it's more about the economic governance but we also cover the public administration. So, but I, I fully agree that uh, such an alignment is necessary also to pass the message to candidate countries, potential candidate countries that, you know, don't think that once you join the EU, you, you can relax on this. It's important and, you know, don't do it for the EU, but do it for yourself to foster development in your countries. Okay. Any other questions, comments? lady at the back, and then I'll take the gentleman in front of the camera there. Yeah, okay. EFCA Heather Southeast European Center for Entrepreneurial Learning, actually CSEL. So we are working with the eight countries in creating entrepreneurial ecosystem, including Croatia as the youngest member state and uh, the, the neighborhood uh, as a pre-accession country and preparing for EU. So just following all, all the presentations, excellent presentations today, and thank you very much for that, and very interesting, no matter are we are talking about public administration, which can be boring, but you made it very interesting, so thank you very much for that. From our work, what are the lessons, what we learned? In all EU policy documents, entrepreneurship as a key competence is a priority, but we find it out. It's not just a priority for the educational system, it's a priority for the public servant that they are able to think entrepreneurially that they are shifting from money spent to money invested. This is the first thing. The second thing, what we learned, actually talking about the leaders in the process, you know, in Southeast Europe, we, we are actually giving all the efforts and, and we are trying to establish the system. So we are tired from the leaders. Thank you God for the system, that the system is functioning and the every work and the public administration is sharing the common value and operate in the same way, in entrepreneurial way, to help entrepreneurs to go further. Uh, also, in our part of the world, we are struggling with the, with the surveys where the public opinion survey among the young people is saying that the most desirable employment is the public service. So we are looking forward to shift from the public to be employed 
to make the employments, to create jobs. And also what we learned from our work that actually we are tired in our part of the world of, of the reforms because I'm 50 and already uh, 25 years I'm reforming myself. I finished in the reform of the reform of the reform. But I'm looking forward that I'm developing and evaluating. So then I'm not 50 years old and I'm 50 years experienced. Thank you very much. Okay, um, my name is Jan Meyer Saling from the University of Nottingham. I've got uh, two questions, one for Mr. Prorock and one for Mr. Turbidar. Uh, Mr. Prorock, I was very intrigued and interested in your presentation. I was wondering, since you have 220 um, organizations that apply the CAF from framework in Austria, I suppose not all of them have benefited in the same way and not all of them uh, perform in the same way afterwards. Have you found something about the different conditions under which they become more or less successful, because this might be very interesting for the other countries as well. Um, and for Mr. Tobeda, I was wondering uh, about your corruption uh, indicator that you presented, and I was quite impressed when you said um, that there has been a major increase in the uh, importance that has been attached to the issue of corruption over the last few years. Um, and I was not totally sure whether this is really an increase in corruption, is there more bribery in the region, or is it an increase in something else? Is it an increase in distrust in the government? Is it an increase in um, dissatisfaction with government? Does it correlate with unemployment very strongly? So um, I was wondering, essentially, do you have also some evidence of actual experience <coughs> with corruption, which links back a little bit to, to Florian Hauser's uh, presentation earlier? Maybe, maybe the survey covers those issues. OK, there's two direct questions. You want to start? Well, I do not have evidence directly through the questions, but uh, I have opinion about this. We do not have increase in the region. I, in my opinion, we have increase of awareness of corruption as a negative issue affecting their daily lives. And why this emerged in the last one year, we saw that many leaders who were told that they're untouchable are now in jail in many uh, economies of Southeast Europe, we have an in issue in Croatia that they left without government. So these things are happening. Governments have this issue and at least fight against corruption is in, declaratively is in their agenda. Something is happening and the media is covering all this. And I think that this also indicates to the power of media. They are bringing this to, to attention of the ordinary citizens. Thanks. Okay. Thomas. Yes, so this, there are, we have this. We have this knowledge. We have it in in, in some in some service, but all, it's more based on, uh, on, uh, on 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 our experiences. We have to say that there are success factors, and of course, not all of the organizations uh, are successful and fulfill then in the end the criteria. Uh, honestly, I can say we have uh, uh, we have uh, two thirds, which uh, implement the CAF in a, in a good way, in a proper way. They have also afterwards results, and we have one third uh, of organizations which, uh, where we have problems uh, in, a different, in a different level. And it always is a question of, have they been aware that it is a big change proce process, and has it been prepared properly? Has the management supported it properly? Was the management convinced? And that's also the problem of leadership. Huh? That's why I mentioned leadership. I mean, if you have a bad management, not the best management, then you can use uh, tools as ever you want, you will not succeed. So it's a management, it's a management issue, I wrote it down. And uh, some didn't understand the, the, the model properly, so this is also what, what, what you expect from the model and what is the, uh, what is the outcome, outcome. And then yes, it also needs a kind of, a kind of uh, culture which says, okay, we are open for this, uh, for this change, we are open for include uh, uh, or involve also the, 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 the staff and, and the citizens. So these are the success factors in, in, in short. And yes, we, do not, we are not successful with all of them, but at least meanwhile with two thirds. Okay, thank you, Thomas. I think we can take uh, one more question if there's anybody, I don't see any hands. So if not, then what I will do in the remaining two or three minutes, I'll give the opportunity to each of the panel members if there's anything they wish to add, uh, react to, that they've heard in the, in the course of the discussion, but they would like to say. Any final comment? Please. 
I would like just to share one information. I couldn't, first of all, comment minutes to underline this thing. You, you will remember that I mentioned that this area is, that uh, barometer show, indicates to us is that this area remains to stay, actually not this, so I'm thinking on Southeast Europe, remains to be traditionally migrant area. Every second person is thinking of leaving its country, going abroad for job and working. And this is, for, for me, this was the most tragic indicator. Next year, I will try to include this uh, question for more young people. And I'm sure that if we focus on the young people, the picture of leaving their countries will be uh, really, really worse. And uh, for me, it was really important what people of uh, Western Balkans are looking for. And they clearly said for them it's economy important, for them jobs are important, and for them good governance is important. And uh, if politicians take this into consideration, this would be good for the daily life of the people. And, I would like to use this opportunity to declare that we as Regional Cooperation Council are ready to assist governments until they want to go in reforming their societies and give the answers to their needs, of, uh, to citizens' needs. At least what we have to do together is to try to transform this negative picture that I have shared to you. And I'm, I was very sad because I couldn't uh, give something positive. I like to speak on positive side, not on negative, but topic was really negative and I couldn't share something positive. And I hope that together we can act and at least for upcoming uh, barometers, Balkan barometers, this uh, transform this negative picture into less negative, if not too positive. Thanks. Okay, but we've, at least we've got the tool to track the progress and, and we wait for the progress. Okay, that's wrap up now I think uh, we have uh, now running out of time so I think all it remains for me to do is thank all our participants in our session uh, this afternoon for their uh, outstanding contributions we've had another very interesting debate I can see that you're going to actually uh, split up into work sessions uh, at half past three after the coffee break so I give the floor to Thomas I think for some practical arrangements Okay. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Thank you for, for moderating it, uh, our, <laughs> our, our sessions, our first session now. It was very great. Thank you very much. You, you are the umbrella for, for us. Uh, you, you, that was, it was great. Thank you very much. So uh, just technical details, we make now 20 minutes, uh, 20 minutes break, and then we split in two groups. One group, the first group is here in this, in this room. It's, uh, it's uh, the group of the Center of uh, Excellence in Finance. Uh, it's uh, Strengthening Public Finance Governance in Southeastern Europe. It will be here. And the second group is uh, in, the, in the room right from my side. Uh, it's better services uh, through strong cities. So please, we start in 20 minutes with the, se with the practice session. Okay, Thank so thanks to the participants and the, and the panel discussion. Thank you.
I didn't touch you. <laughs> yeah, I made that mistake, but I don't know why. Because I told you this is a parliament. So I, and then in the parliament, they almost directed me to a conference. So they said, hey, come find me. <laughs> Which is also interesting, but it's not where I was going. So from the parliament here, But you should. Yes, we have a, a very nice, interesting conference on, uh, on uh, something we do in the uh, economic history and so on. We are interested in Would you like to? Yes, it takes very much. That's very much. And uh, the Department of History here in Vienna has a Nein, man, die Präsentation. Ich weiß nicht. Also, da ist keine. Ja, man dachte, da kann er vielleicht auch was haben, wenn er Introduction macht. Dann haben wir alles.
To je radio, znaš ko je to radio? Erhan. Ne, zato ti kažem da znaš, a onda da ne vidim. Gdje ćeš pa do ti? Ja mogu li ovdje sad da... Ajde, sjedaj, gdje je dosiš. Evo, tu sam ja kao. Tu imaš, ja mislim da imaš tu. Mi to na engleskom, jel' tako? Ja. Does it work? Okay. Thank you for coming. We are here having two presentations. The presenters will essentially tell you something about themselves and then go on with the presentation. I am a moderator. My name is Vladimir Gligorov. I work here at the Vienna Institute for International Economic Studies. And uh, I was thinking, I was talking to Moimir, and I was thinking about what perhaps I could say at, at the very beginning uh, on these uh, public governance uh, issues. And I thought maybe I could uh, say a few words on uh, how Governance uh, is uh, perceived uh, in the in the Balkan region, basically uh, in the Western, so-called Western Balkan region, and uh, prob probably you could uh, generalize that on Southeast Europe. Uh, but what I wanted to refer to is, uh, and I understand that uh, there has been a presentation already, but I have been involved in something called Balkan Barometer. The, the new survey came out uh, like two days ago. And uh, it, among other things, it uh, asks business people and uh, uh, the general public about uh, the perception of uh, a number of governance issues. Uh, of course, corruption is uh, one of those, but it goes beyond that. Uh, 
generally uh, about uh, uh, economic policies, uh, about what should these economic policies be, but also more generally I would say, and this is the point I actually want to make, is that in a way a series of questions are there that should answer to the question of, a, to, to the uh, query, how helpful, so to speak, or how supportive uh, various aspects of governments, governance are for the public uh, and for the business people. And I would just main, uh, mention two overall uh, impressions one gets from answers to all these questions. One is that both the, the, the general public and the business people essentially uh, look uh, to themselves and to social relations and to various connections, or, so they invest in social relations, because they don't think that the public governance or that the, the states they live in will be of any help to them. So there is a big disconnect between the govern governments and the, the ordinary people, or business people also. So that's one point that you see. One indicator of, uh, one, uh, indicator of, uh, of uh, dissatisfaction is that on average, having all these countries put together, close to 50% of people would actually, uh, would, if they could, uh, leave, uh, leave the region and, and uh, live or work uh, somewhere else. This is a, a rather unprecedented number. So that's one observation. The other observation is that more or less uh, you get the impression that the people are thinking that or seeing their governments mostly as uh, a burden rather than uh, uh, as, a, as a solution to their problems. The only thing in which uh, people have interest is government, uh, a job in the private sector, in the public sector. The jobs in the public sector are actually sought after. If you, if you know the, the situation in the, in, the, in the labor market, that would not, be sur not surprise you. But in terms of, of uh, the government being helpful in on, on all the other issues, security, uh, justice issues, issues of uh, whatever governments do, education and all of health and stuff like that, these are not really good numbers in terms of uh, judging as to how supportive the governments in this region, region are. So, in overall, you have a feeling that people trust themselves for what they can accomplish, but they think that the governments are uh, standing in their way. So that's sort of my introduction to that. <laughs> now. Uh, who wants to talk first? Uh, so, uh, Moimir will uh, take the floor first and then... Yes. Well, good. No, no, but uh -huh. I will cast this way. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Moimir Mrak. Uh, I am a senior policy advisor at CEF. Uh, so I am assisting the Center of Excellence in Finance on this, uh, I would say, projects policy side. Uh, otherwise, I, I teach uh, international finance and economic policies in Ljubljana and also a little bit here in Vienna. Uh, I will present you briefly. I am a uh, little bit, uh, uh, you know, now we see that the audience has gone down quite, uh, I would say, dramatically, but still to those one most interested uh, to try to give you a short presentation of the center. Uh, first thing, uh, I will present you a brief film about the center, very brief one, then few basic facts, who we are, what we are doing, 
And then, of course, uh, because the subject was the public administration reforms, uh, we also wanted to see, to show you one of the specific projects, what we are doing on one, on one of the segments, so that you will see that we are pretty much uh, uh, integrated in what we are talking, we are to what we are talking here. Well, thank you very much. This was just, you know, brief. Uh, I will try to give you now a little bit more detailed explanation of uh, who we are, what we are doing, and uh, how we are doing, uh, because I think that's important. Uh, Center of Excellence in Finance was established in 2001, so we are 15 years old institution. But in these 15 years, uh, quite a bit of uh, development has been done. We started as a purely, I would say, Slovenian institution trying to support uh, the public finance reforms in the region that was done at that time under the kind of the umbrella of the Growth and uh, Pact, uh, Pact for the Southeastern Europe. Uh, as you see, there are now a few activities, uh, very limited stuff. Uh, if you look uh, today, uh, the institution has been transformed from a purely, let's say, Slovenian institution to the full-fledged uh, now international organization, having now uh, seven members. So we have now, let's say, uh, uh, members from seven countries of the region, and there are some others where the process is in the, in the pipeline for the, for the ratification. Uh, the main objective is the same as it was, or similar as it was, support capacity development for finance officials in South Eastern Europe through learning. So we had discussed quite a lot uh, before having on the technical assistance, on the research. The focus uh, of CF is on uh, learning. You will see what kind of activities uh, we have. Um, we have different kind of uh, courses, some of them also certification courses, so basically the people get 
uh, get kind of degrees uh, on the, in the area of auditing, in the area of uh, some other, some other, of course, everything, financial areas. There are seminars, e-learnings, so very, I would say, on the learning side, we have really tried to make a significant uh, uh, difference than it was. Uh, also, with uh, already now quite a substantial staff from it's an international staff because we are now becoming, not becoming, we are now an international organization. And the organization is basically, the governance of the organization is, I would say, three elements I would mention here. One is the governing board, and this governing board is basically established by the ministers of finance and governors of central banks of the member states. And then, of course, also, uh, we have then cooperation with, uh, with uh, those countries which are in the pipeline to, to become members. Uh, here you have also which countries are members uh, already. Uh, they are at least two of them for which we expect to become member very soon because the processes are in the final stage. But this does not mean that the cooperation is limited to these countries. So we do have also cooperation and also uh, very active cooperation with some countries is here in the neighboring in the neighboring area. So just you know a few words about this is a governance board. You see this is what I mentioned. Now the governing board is led by the by the uh, Minister of Finance from Bulgaria from last from last week because we just had the last meeting. Uh, staff of the center is already gone up for two from three to twenty five so it's a quite a substantial staff. We also host uh, uh, several uh, IMF uh, staff members who then work in the region, particularly on the public finance, public finance area taxation. Uh, and uh, the third institution, the third framework here is, uh, of course, the advisory board. So these are, you have kind of an overview of the institutions which participated in the last advisory board. This can also give you a sense of who are our partners in terms of financing, uh, financing uh, the, the programs, the activities. Uh, the center is uh, located uh, in Ljubljana from the beginning and uh, of course it also has a permanent contact with all the, well, the members. Focus, Central and Eastern Europe. And then of course you have here a brief overview of the countries, how they participated, uh, participation from all the countries and also the moderators, lecturers, facilitators comes from, from all over. What we would like basically to underline is that this uh, you know, knowledge hub of the character of the center, but in this area of finances, public finances, and what was added over the last few years is uh, there was a strong interest also on the central banks to join this program, so that's why I said that we have in the governing board not only ministers of finance, which was the practice before, but we have now also the governors of central banks. Uh, three thematic focus, three, three focuses uh, uh, in terms of um, uh, thematic. One is the public finance management. I think I don't have to go back what we were talking uh, in the morning. Uh, I think it's very clear uh, this relationship with the topic of the conference, public administration reforms. Uh, if you remember, public finance management was one of them, but I must underline, public finance management is subject of our work from the early beginning. Eh? So we are happy in a way that this is becoming part of uh, broadly recognized, uh, recognized issue. Uh, we have here all these issues related to the, to the budget preparation, uh, not, not just annual budget, but medium, medium term fiscal programming. Then you have the second area which is the tax policy and administration. Yeah, of course, somebody can also say that this is one part of the public uh, financial management, but we treat it as a separate thematic topic. And then, as I said, we added up a few years ago the central banking pillar. When we talk about the central banking, I think it's more or less the issues which have come out after the crisis related to the financial stability issues uh, and these kind of things are now very much under the focus of, of this. So these are the three thematic topics and then we have kind of across the board leadership program because it has become clear that when we talk about the reforms very much is how the reforms are done and I think what we heard today has been uh, very broadly, broadly, broadly introduced. Mm -hmm. 
uh, I said that we are basically the learning institution, the institution to provide uh, uh, learning, uh, I would not say solutions, but basically a platform through different kind of learning possibilities. Uh, we have on the one side uh, so-called structural learning, which is basically the issues for the, for the degrees. Uh, we run, I think, programs in uh, at least three countries. Uh, it's in Macedonia, in Montenegro, uh, in Slovenia, and there I know that someone is, uh, one is also star is starting in, in Albania. Uh, then you have the, I would say, classical type of the export-based uh, learning on the basis uh, of the seminars, uh, experts' uh, visits, and so on. Uh, what is an increasingly, um, not, not just popular, increasing in the demand is the e-learning uh, initiatives. Uh, we have just finished one initiative of this kind with a lot of success, so it's clear that there is a demand for these new, new forms of uh, learning opportunities. Uh, I will just make here the, who are the partners are, you know, just as a graphical, you see a number of uh, bilateral development institutions, uh, a number of course international from the IMF, OECD, European Central Bank, so these are the partners which are in various forms involved in this our, our our activity. So that's are the more or less the, the institutions we, we work. And this is the overview of what we have done just last year, just to have a sense. Uh, those one who are more interested, you have quite a number of publications uh, which are outside from the annual reports uh, to the review of the main features of the center in general, so you can get it. And as you see, uh, they are basically, again, the public finance management issues, the taxation issues, and uh, uh, this last column, then we have the certification certification uh, program. Uh, you can contact us on this uh, on these uh, addresses. Uh, we are also two colleagues of uh, mine are here. So if uh, there are some some need for further information, we would be very glad uh, to 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 provide. Uh, just briefly about one of the projects which I mentioned, which uh, somehow fits to this uh, activity, what is the subject of today. Uh, it's a project which we have completed. It's a project, yeah, it's a project of activities. It was a program on strategic planning and budgeting. So it was basically a program which was done in cooperation with the, and with the financing of the European Commission through the multi-beneficiary multi, uh, uh, EPA. Uh, it is, of course, part of this public finance management, uh, and I think one of the big advantages of this program was that it was, uh, the, it, it, at least in our case, it was a platform where we can really introduce, in addition to the financial people from the ministries of finance, uh, very much also the financial people from the line ministries. And you cannot imagine, you know, how a uh, big uh, gap is very often when you start discussing the programming, when you start discussing the, the strategic uh, planning uh, among these, uh, these uh, two, two groups. Uh, well, yeah, of course, why this project was done? I think it was done more or less in the context of this crisis. Uh, I remember when we started with it, uh, it was uh, basically the need that the countries is have to uh, go much more precisely, much more uh, straightforwardly into the, into the uh, macro fiscal consolidation on one side and on the other side into structural reforms. Uh, when I talk about the structural reforms, I am always confused because I don't know precisely what we are talking about. Because if you look at the terminology, the definition of structural reforms, you will not find one. For me, I would say structural reforms are all those reforms which contribute to higher uh, economic growth, and of course, uh, this management is uh, one of them. Um, it was designed in the context with the, with the Commission, with the IMF, and of course, primarily with the, with the, with the, governing, with the governing board. Three objectives, four objectives, I would say three plus one. One was, of course, this strengthening the medium-term macroeconomic framework. I'm not saying that this uh, is a new thing. There is, was a lot has been done on this already before, and this part has been done also within this project with a strong cooperation with the IMF. 
uh, and uh, also on this first and second issue also the Vienna uh, International Center, the Vienna, the joint Vienna, uh, uh, sorry, something to put it here, the joint Vienna Institute was, uh, was uh, continuously a partner. Um, the beneficiaries, candidate countries, uh, because that was, uh, and I'm talking about the candidate, I'm talking about the candidates and potential candidate countries. Uh, while as institutions, as I mentioned already, not only ministries of finance, but also the institutions at the lower level, uh, uh, and of course the line ministries. Uh, so that's basically that you had this uh, exchange of views, uh, and I think this uh, integration of uh, line ministries into the fiscal programming, into the planning, will also in future be one of the important elements for our further further work. Here we have some other uh, uh, data about the projects. Uh, here you have, I think what is interesting on the left, you see these major, uh, major, major features of the program, how they were, how they were uh, identified, so the issues of capital budgeting, program budgeting, then evaluation of spending reviews, uh, and these are the events, uh, a lot of events was, there was 25 uh, different kind of the workshop uh, uh, with more than 400 uh, participants and, uh, as I said, with the people from the region and outside uh, the region. What is interesting is, based on this project, there is quite a number of new projects which are being, through different ways, either suggested, and some of them are already ongoing. One is in cooperation with the IMF and uh, based on EU funding, is the strengthening economic governance in public financial management. And there are some in preparation. So uh, it's obvious that this is an area which the center will continue to work uh, because of the beneficiaries, beneficiaries uh, requests. Uh, so that's from my side. Uh, I'm leaving now the floor to the colleague for the other institution. Good afternoon and thank you for your interest in this topic and for your patience. Thank you for staying. I'm the last speaker. I hope I will not bore you <laughs> out of the room. Um, my name is Natasha Atsevska. I'm a program officer at NALAS, uh, the network of associations of local authorities of uh, Southeast Europe. Throughout the day, we mentioned uh, there were questions, uh, discussions about the participation of the national and subnational and local level in uh, policy making and public administration reform. And in the next minutes, I will try uh, to go a little bit deeper uh, to take the, the discussion more about the local level, what uh, local governments in Southeast Europe uh, do and how they get financed and how they manage doing their job. Uh, but first, allow me to say a few words about NALAS. We are a regional organization uh, formed in 2001 as well under the auspices of uh, the Stability Pact. We have uh, 15 member associations of local governments uh, from 12 um, countries, entities from Southeast Europe. And uh, although this number is changing all the time, but uh, now it's a bit less than 9,000 uh, first uh, tire local governments are represented through their associations. And um, what is NALAS about? What are our priorities? The decentralization process to take place and to roll out in Southeast Europe so that um, the principles set by the European Charter on Local Self-Government, which is adopted, ratified by all our countries, is uh, seen in practice. So we want stronger local democracy and autonomy and services. Uh, we see this uh, as an important uh, element of the reconciliation and stabilization of the Southeast Europe. And um, also, uh, one step towards 
getting uh, good governance to the citizens and getting services close to the citizens, uh, which in fact is the subsidiarity principle as described in the Councils of Europe uh, Charter for Local Self-Government. Um, many would argue what are local governments uh, doing in the European perspective, but we as NALAS promote EU integration and we think that the potential for, of local governments for contributing to the European integration is underestimated and uh, there is room for their participation under new rules and uh, under maybe new ways of funding. Uh, we are uh, strongly committed to building the capacities of our members, the associations of local governments, as uh, we see them counterparts uh, to the ministries of finance and uh, ministries of public administration. And we do this through promotion of partnerships and uh, knowledge sharing. Uh, NALAS Knowledge Center is a unique very useful tool for the administration on local level to get access to regional and global knowledge. Uh, the topics that we work on are fiscal decentralization, urban planning, energy efficiency, water and waste management, uh, lately sustainable uh, tourism, and we do it within the NALAS Knowledge Center. Uh, so the topic of my uh, overall presentation was financing the local uh, services, but firstly I, I'd like to, uh, to make a short overview of what local governments do in Southeast Europe. After 10 uh, years or, and more of uh, decentralization process, by law they do a lot of things, not m much different than the rest of Europe and the world. Uh, one big part are the communal uh, services and infrastructure where we have building of local roads, waste, uh, water, sewage, etc. These are important services for the everyday life, for the quality of life to all citizens. Uh, all citizens, uh, every citizen has an address and it belongs to one municipality. Uh, it, this is a very important perspective to have. But in the past uh, 10 years, new competencies have been added to the local level as um, solely responsible of local governance or shared competencies, and these are mostly in the social ser sector services. Um, preschool education, primary, secondary education, social protection, and even health, health care. Uh, so in... From the experience so far, it has happened that once you decentralize the competence, then it's considered a local, local worry. So, uh, okay, we don't have to think about it anymore from other uh, positions of the public administration and the governance structure. Uh, but uh, the experience or the quality, the current quality of delivery of services, the European barometer sh showed, uh, it's not uh, something we, to be proud of, showed that uh, this is not a good approach. And actually, that's why we want to promote this, hey, uh, the quality of life is still a joint responsibility. And we can't just, um, uh, uh, divide local and central level and we do, uh, we sing our song, we have to work together. Uh, but how do we do it? <laughs> it's, uh, it's not easy because of many reasons. And in this sense, there are a few important questions uh, that arise for the local governments. First um, is how big is the fiscal weight of all these services that were devolved on a local level? Uh, there were attempts to make some calculations, but we don't know. The transfers uh, of money uh, follows historical patterns, and um, historical patterns sometimes don't follow functional equity uh, for service delivery, so uh, some uh, citizens and local governments don't really receive for kindergarten anything because they simply didn't have kindergarten in 2003. Uh, so their kids go to the next uh, big city and uh, eventually uh, they, the families move around. Uh, 
then another very important issue in terms of finances is uh, implementation of EU standards at local level. Uh, our Bulgarian members had very uh, quite bitter experience in this sense because local governments were not able to foresee how uh, European standards for services, once agreed by, at the national level, are being implemented on the lo local level, and then the municipalities need to budget, to design projects, to uh, make the public procurement to implement, but the results sometimes were missing and were actually disastrous. Um, not always by corruption, but also because of that. So the next question is, uh, we have to rethink, is the capacity of the sec uh, local sector adequate to all competencies received? And um, is support needed by the central uh, level? Um, I always say it's like sending, giving a new responsibility to a child, but then uh, you have to take care to teach the child how to do the new, uh, the, the new job, let's say. Um, and then something that especially the ministries are uh, not happy about, citizens, so and so, then how financial resources are actually being managed at local level and uh, what's the accountability at local level. Um, it's something we need to think about and to improve. Then I would say what about the sustainability principles uh, in investment, in planning of services, in development of local uh, strategies, and is this coordinated uh, central local level? I don't think so, and I think the floods in the past few years showed exactly that our investments, both at local and national level, are not always aligned or planned with sustainability principles in mind, and then it provokes a need for new money, new investments, uh, reallocation of resources, and complicates uh, things. And, uh, Last but not really, at least it's uh, the most important thing. What about uh, uh, citizens and collaboration, uh, participation of uh, many actors in, uh, in the processes of, uh, the, the, uh, of um, provision of public services and their financing? It could be improved. There are many good examples, uh, like uh, in Macedonia with uh, uh, community forums, but then there are very bad examples which overshadow the, the good efforts. Um, so at NALAS, our task force on fiscal decentralization tries to get at least some of the answers to these questions and at least to monitor what's going on with the municipal finances and if um, uh, so each year we produce uh, a monitoring report, fiscal decentralization indicators for Southeast Europe. It has one uh, general part for the region, trends, and then uh, country, uh, country chapters. And uh, with a special focus, uh, the focus of uh, the 2016 report is uh, actually property tax. And uh, one novelty uh, that's uh, with the assistance of UN women, we try to, to, uh, to monitor uh, gender mainstreaming in municipal finances. Uh, I will start with the main conclusions and then I will quickly show some graphs because uh, we need to, um, uh, to be economic in time. So uh, this is uh, actually a snap of what does our report say? Uh, what are the finances of the local governments? And uh, what about the decentralization? Well, it's a, a work in progress and it needs refueling because it's stalled for the f at least five uh, years, especially after the, uh, the financial and economic uh, crisis. Um, the local governments receive a lot of funds from the central level and they are, have their own revenues, but uh, there are a few questions here. Uh, first is uh, how the money that is transferred from central to local level 
do we have autonomy in its spending? Can we decide how do we want to uh, spend it? And um, even the money, uh, the block grants, uh, which uh, are supposed to be freely uh, disposable to local governments, are not really that because of uh, the teacher's salaries. I will talk about it a bit later. The own source revenues of the municipalities are not significant. And they come usually uh, from some instruments, uh, fees, which are imposed on real estate transactions, investments, and they are not also stable. Um, more uh, scarily, they are concentrating, uh, concentrated around the capital cities. So uh, very little efforts for equalization is, um, uh, is put in the region. And at least in Macedonia, uh, we looked uh, in education decentralization as something very positive, but uh, it has limited uh, results. It proved over these 10 years because it's underfunded the way it is now. And uh, our report uh, provides some evidence about these uh, statements. So I will click quickly illustrate uh, some of these first about the size of the local government sector. Uh, the competencies I said are very similar to the European, uh, but if you see the average of the Southeast Europe, uh, it's 6.1% uh, of GDP compared to 11.3% of GDP that goes to local governments in the European Union. Uh, the least uh, decentralized country in terms of the funds received is uh, definitely Albania and they are reforming uh, now. And um, even in the countries where we see a decent percent, I'm not sure if you, if you can read, but uh, I hope you do. It's also available online. Uh, the question is that in Kosovo, Macedonia, Bulgaria, um, these funds are used to um, finance teachers' wages, and then the percents go uh, if we take out that because the wages are uh, agreed on a national level with the unions, uh, so not changeable, then very little money stays for actual education funding. Um, over the years, we see some changes. For example, this is comparison between 2013 and 14. Uh, and reflects the policy changes made, especially in Bulgaria and the uh, Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And it's because uh, they changed the type of revenue, the public, the personal income tax uh, from shared is uh, made a municipal tax and it strengthens uh, the local uh, fiscal capacities. Um, after 10 years, we are asking ourselves, has decentralization brought uh, more own revenues, more uh, freely disposable money for the local governments in Southeast Europe? The answer is yes and no. Here you, you see the comparison between 2006 and 2014. Uh, yes, because uh, block grants were introduced, categorical earmark grants, all kinds of new uh, revenues for the local governments. But again, they are tied with salaries or with uh, obligatory standards, uh, which doesn't really increase uh, the local fiscal autonomy. So the next question is, is uh, the revenue spending then predetermined? Uh, the budget may be similar each year because we don't have freedom uh, to, uh, to, uh, to allocate by ourselves big part of it. It's again mixed uh, picture. And uh, here uh, you can see in uh, yellow are the own revenues in Montenegro. They are the highest because of uh, the way property tax is, uh, is regulated. And in it, Montenegro is example how the local tax uh, can uh, support uh, the local communities. 
Um, but the blue color is still uh, prevails, that's the conditional uh, grants uh, of, from the uh, central government. As I mentioned, also the block grants are not uh, really block in Southeast Europe. Uh, let's see a bit how local governments ha uh, spend their money. Um, the blue color is investments. We'd like to see more of that and um, maybe uh, less of yellow, which is wages. But also here, let's not um, you know, uh, fool ourselves. Uh, the, the teachers' wages and municipal administration wages in Macedonia are, are not that high to represent 50% of uh, their expenditures. It's uh, because uh, investments at local level are low and uh, because the number of teachers is pretty high and the local governments don't have a say at it. So they just transfer the money. A little bit about local investments and uh, how they um, moved uh, through the year. Again, Slovenia is uh, the leader in the region, while Albania and Macedonia and Moldova are on the other, uh, on the other end. Uh, it doesn't mean that in these municipalities there are no investments. Own, uh, so own revenues are used for local investments, but mostly the central government goes to schools and makes reconstructions or intervenes in, uh, in various uh, competencies which are in fact uh, local ones. Instead, we would like to see more capital grants given to local level and then decisions uh, about investments are made at local level. Uh, these slides illustrate how much of the total investments in the country are spent at uh, national and local level. The local is the red color. And uh, here the, uh, we see that the strongest um, are the Kosovo uh, municipalities. They have uh, many investments for which uh, they are initiating and responsible for. And this is just an illustration, more uh, geography maybe, because it's, um, it's in total, uh, it's in absolute numbers, uh, the amount of investment spending, and here we see Turkey and Romania are actually um, the strongest, but in Slovenia it's also, uh, per capita, it's still the highest uh, investments level. And then the debt, consequently to the investments, we see very little uh, municipal uh, debt. It's uh, because of very restrictive um, regulations. The ministries of finance, uh, they usually give approval for local debts. So some takeaway points is um, first, um, if we want to see quality, uh, high quality services at local level, uh, we need to have adequate fiscal decentralization. Uh, and here I don't think only more, give more money to the municipalities, but also raise the capacities of the local governments to manage uh, their money, to, bring, uh, to make decisions, to have transparent processes, etc. It's, it's not easy, it's a complex process. Uh, uh, strong political will is needed, and in the time of crisis it's very difficult to find it. And I think even in developed countries like Slovenia, this was, um, we saw this in the past years um, when the decentralization actually was, uh, or the local, uh, uh, the local autonomy was questioned and uh, attempts for redesign were made. Uh, we need strategic approach and permanent institutionalized dialogue between various levels of government. This is something that is missing in all our countries. I, I'm uh, free to say this. Uh, then evidence-based arguments. It was talked about today several times. We support this and this is why we undertake this monitoring to provide our associations with uh, arguments, with uh, evidence for their arguments. 
And then uh, a painful uh, thing for our, all our countries, or at least for the Western Balkans uh, ones, open data. Policy analysis based on data again, uh, and, policies and policy analysis in general, it's uh, quite modest. And um, then once agreements between institutions or cent uh, levels of government are made, they need to be respected, right? Otherwise, it's, uh, it's uh, just uh, a formal thing. And uh, then coordinated public internal financial control. We at NALAS and our members, we made a survey about this, uh, believe that we can work on this and uh, that the local governments actually can, uh, can, have, uh, can play it better. Uh, the public internal financial control is uh, something that is set at the European level. It's in chapter 32 of the Aki and under the DG budget. It's about how money, are, uh, money is spent at all levels. And a system is put in place in uh, our, all our countries. Uh, all municipalities have internal auditors. They have systems of uh, financial control, public procurement. But in fact, it doesn't work, and we see it, uh, unfortunately. So uh, that's why we, uh, we are thinking, uh, can we make something about it? And this is actually an, an idea, a concept for something, uh, something that we'd like to propose uh, from NALA's side that, um, uh, we, uh, that we design an activity, a project if you want, or initiative uh, that would uh, have uh, European, regional, national, and local level. Uh, we have the standards at the European uh, level and the experience of uh, our uh, colleagues from the member countries. Uh, then with uh, the work, uh, coordinated work of regional networks like NALAS for local level and CEF RCC for central level, uh, we can have maybe some joint result, especially in the way the coordination between the countries and so central local level is made. Then at national level, ministries and associations of local gov authorities need to work coordination, capacity building, initiatives. They do it separately. They invite each other as guests to their events, but it's not enough. And at local level, capacity building in uh, financial management, municipal finance management, control, auditing, risk uh, management, public procurement, and something very important, Cooperation with, uh, co 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 cooperation with the civil sector and awareness raising about what public funds is and how do we spend them. So this was all. I hope it was not too long. And um, uh, this is uh, NALA's uh, website. You can find the report there and everything else that we do. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. Okay, let's open it up for uh, uh, questions or comments. Uh, uh. <laughs> I can ask because I have microphone. <laughs> microphone because no one. Is. Yes. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask, uh, Natasha, do you have the overview of indicators for uh, somehow summarized per uh, NALAS EU from members from EU countries and non-EU countries? Is there in some indicators clear difference between these two groups or it's uh, still mixed? Thanks. Oh, it's working. Thank you, Maria. Well, no, not yet, but this is a great idea. We can do it next year. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. Thank you. FK Heder, Southeast European Center for Entrepreneurial Learning. Natasha, thank you very much for the excellent presentation. We would just like to share with you wh what we learned from our work with the local authorities and schools. Actually, all the countries are now preparing for the operational preparation for operational program for IPA 2, which has the big amount of money 
So it's very understandable incentive dedicated to human capital development, which then is linking us to the schools and their capacities to absorb this kind of big envelopes. Then this is links, linked with the local authorities, which are in charge for the budgets. And what we find out that there is still really low capacities and great need for competence training, how actually to manage this kind of funds with the dedicated budget line that the money which are coming from this kind of envelopes are not spent for some other things and other issues. Actually, it's a great risk what we find out through our work to enable the capacities to absorb significant amount dedicated to human capital development through EPA 2 operational programs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you want to comment or? No. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'm Jan Meyer-Zaling, University of Nottingham. Um, I found the presentation really interesting just now, and um, it made me think about a presentation that I uh, attended on Tuesday, so just a couple of days ago actually, at the University of Nottingham by a colleague of mine from Columbia University in New York. Um, and she was looking at um, uh, local governments in Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria, and what she found is that often local mayors, elected mayors, we're using uh, local resources in order to mobilize support for political parties. Um, and she found quite systematically that independent mayors um, were actually not relying on this kind of um, clientelist uh, patronage type practices, while mayors that were supported by a national government party were very actively doing that. Um, and this raises some concerns because, I mean, I thought it was very interesting how you presented it, and I wonder um, whether you can, you have any observation in this respect. I mean, whether this form of biased favoritism at the local level actually exists, um, or whether there are mechanisms in place for accountability and monitoring to prevent this from happening. Thank you very actually much. It connects a little bit to your point as well. Um, yes, I, uh, yeah. Let's uh, collect the questions and then. Natasha, I have a question for you regarding the um, local government budgetary uh, data. And um, actually my question is what can NALAS do in order to, uh, let's say, put a pressure on uh, national governments in order to publicize the budgetary revenues and expenditures of local governments because this data is not transparent whatsoever, at least not in several countries in the region. And it's not accessible. I mean, although it exists, the databases exist uh, in the ministries of finance and treasury departments. So um, it's interesting, like um, one of the uh, major issues that really I found very striking, for example, in Serbia, that the draft law on local government finance, um, that the, the law, the latest version of the law on local government finance which was drafted uh, by the working group of the Ministry of Finance was basically drafted without any financial data. So the Ministry of Finance itself didn't want to give any financial data to the working group. So <laughs> this is how the legislation is created. So my question is what can analysis do in order to put the policy pressure on governments to publicize the data so we can have really evidence-based policy-making process in, in local government financing. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, if not, uh, you had uh, yes. two questions. Well, um, the first one about the, we call it, uh, yes, the parties are becoming stronger and stronger, and also not uh, only in these countries that you mentioned, in the others, Western Balkans, too. And in the last years, um, five, I would say maybe more, it's, uh, it's becoming uh, more, uh, more visible, more and more visible. And um, so uh, whether the mayor is a, uh, and the councillors are decision makers or the decisions are made elsewhere and they just uh, follow, um, yes. It's, uh, it's, like, um, it's like a cancer. <laughs> and it's, uh, fighting it is part of a bigger battle that is going on now in uh, Western Balkans. And uh, I think the civil movement is getting stronger. 
uh, but uh, so one of the solutions is in the associations. We have good and not so good examples. For example, in Albania, the situation got so, uh, uh, so bad that the association split, so we have socialist and democrat associations of local governments. And for years, the mayors were not even talking to each other about uh, joint problems, about advocacy. And uh, so we are trying now to consolidate the two, uh, as NALAS. In, um, uh, let's say, Macedonia, the association um, is taking care, they are working very carefully to make decisions, to involve in the decision making all political parties and somehow keep everything in order. But uh, other than that, we haven't uh, really seen other uh, examples because it's also an issue of the level of democracy in general in the countries. And uh, Sanya, <laughs> thank you for mentioning uh, this. Uh, the first and the second edition of the report were extremely difficult to produce because of this. E not even the associations of local governments could have the data about municipal finances. And uh, the data about the local debt is like a top secret. Uh, but each year it's more and more easy. And it gives uh, some hope because this is public data. And uh, again, here I would uh, put the associations of local governments as actors that needs to be, need to be uh, strengthened to to do this. Uh, I know the Serbian Association developed a beautiful database, but it's still not put in in action because the ministry doesn't feed it regularly doesn't feed it to the association. Similar thing is going on in Macedonia. So uh, we are thinking about, uh, let's say, a it's a bridging solution. Um, what we have as a database of 10 years of municipal financing in NALAS, we are going to make it uh, web-based public, um, uh, public data for all countries. And uh, we call it municipal finance dashboard. From that big database, uh, we plan to develop a uh, website for each association. And uh, that website would have more or less the same indicators as the regional uh, database, and they would be public. And um, we hope this will contribute, at, uh, at least for uh, the advocacy purposes of the associations, then for uh, understanding the associations have finance committees and they discuss just anecdotal, just everyday problems because they don't have uh, analysis and trends. Uh, so, and for you researchers, we hope this will be a small contribution and will show example that it's not such a terrible thing to have the data public and uh, maybe set a good example. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Natasha. I have an impression, at least when it comes to, uh, for, for example, I got the whole data set for uh, Montenegro and all um, data was um, completely transparent and available, unlike the uh, situation in Serbia, unlike the database in Serbia, which I really had a strong impression that uh, the reason behind was basically, let's put it straightforward, hiding the expenditure data. Because in the past six to seven years, at least after the onset of the economic crisis, there was a huge centralization of revenues and, on the other hand, decentralization of expenditures. So the central government was basically downloaded, downloading certain costs and expenditures at the local level without providing compensation, without providing adequate funds. But at the same time, it was cutting revenues of the local government. So we, there's a serious, I think, vertical imbalance created. Um, and we can see that both in Serbia and in Montenegro, but in Serbia is much more striking and visible. So, and uh, this, as you mentioned, um, at the peak of decentralization, I think the ratio was something like 7.1% of GDP when it comes to share of local government revenues in consolidated revenues. And 
it's now 5.6, so which means that we have like tw somewhat 20% lower decentralization when it comes to both to revenues and expenditures. And I think it's a similar pattern throughout the Western Balkans after 2008, 2009. Thank you. That was mostly a comment, yes. Any other questions? Uh, if not, uh, uh, do you want to say something at the end, uh, maybe final words? Or? Well, there was no questions for me, né? so I don't know whether this was completely un un so unclear. Yeah, no, 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 so well, I would just like to thank you for, for, for your, um, for your uh, participation here. Probably Natasha has maybe still some comments, but I don't. Well, thank you for the patience, and I think through the questions we we opened the burning or painful uh, spots. My idea was not to say that the local level is perfect, so they should do everything, but we need partnership and rethinking uh, maybe many things in our countries and how the governance is uh, set. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very nice. So, thank you for uh, presentations and thank you for the discussion. Uh, and that's it. Sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry. I have to say at the end for the uh, reception tonight. Oh, excellent. So tonight at which time? At seven. <laughs> there is a reception uh, by the city of Vienna, the, the, the mayor, in the Rathaus, but the entrance is on the other side. Can you help the, how to explain? It's in the restaurant Rathaus Keller, which is uh, in, in, the city, in the city hall, when you're in front of the city hall, so when you are at the public viewing, when you're in the front of the city hall, it's on the right side, the right corner, there's the entrance to this, uh, uh, to this restaurant, it's called Rathaus Keller, which is the cellar of the, of the city hall, and there's the reception at 7 p.m. And tomorrow? <laughs> we start at 8.30. No, I wanted to say if someone doesn't have the invitation because there's an invitation at the reception, please, and you want to come, please take it at the reception. Tomorrow, 8.30, with kind in mind to request uh, uh, to be on time because we have the uh, Commissioner Han uh, and he has very, very limited time, so we will not be able to be, to be late with, with, the, with the second session. Thanks a lot from my side. Sorry. <laughs>